Chapter 14 Nadine The day of my induction ceremony had arrived, and my nerves were in overdrive. I wasn't sure whether to feel excited or anxious. It was definitely a mix of both. I woke on Halloween to find three shadows standing above my bed. I startled until my eyes adjusted to the light. I'd slept in late to prepare for a long night tonight, so it was already late morning. Talia, Amy, and Mandy smiled down at me. Isa stirred from where she slept at my feet. Goddess! I gasped. What are you guys doing? Talia bounced on her toes, and I noticed she held a small box wrapped in pink foil. We couldn't wait. Wait for what? I asked. Your presents! Mandy cried in excitement. I furrowed my brow. It's not my birthday. But it's your induction day, Amy reminded me. This is better than your birthday. My heart melted. You guys didn't have to. But we did, Talia stated with a smile. Open mine first. My body ached as I shifted to prop myself up higher on my pillow. I'd made sure to take it easy over the last week so that I'd have the energy to make it through my priestess induction, but it still took some time to wake up. I took the pink box from Talia and tore off the paper. Issa startled awake at the sound, but she relaxed when she spotted Gus and Stormy playing with a ball of yarn across the room. She yawned, then jumped off the bed to go play with them. I opened the box and smiled. Inside sat six miniature muffins. Berry's enchanted muffins? I asked. Talia beamed. Only your favorite. You know me too well. I unwrapped a chocolate chip muffin and popped it in my mouth. A serene calmness swept over me, and it felt as if I was melting into the bed. It feels... good. Relaxing, right? Talia asked. Hmm, I could sit here for hours, I replied, enjoying the calmness. It lasted a minute before my body seemed to solidify again. Open mine next! Mandy handed me a small box wrapped in black paper. I tore the paper off and opened the lid. Inside sat a crescent-shaped rainbow moonstone necklace. My chest warmed. You made this? She smiled proudly. I sure did. I told you your tattoo was an inspiration. I thought you could wear it for your ceremony, unless you had something else in mind. No, this is perfect, I told her. Thank you so much. And finally... Amy lifted a basket, showing it off from various angles. It hadn't been wrapped, but it was filled with all types of pampering products, like bath bombs, Epsom salts, and lotion. We thought you could use a nice long bath before your ceremony. Tears sprang to my eyes, and I pressed my hand to my mouth. The three of them looked between each other, but they had no idea how much this meant to me. Sometimes, all I wanted was for people to treat me like I was normal. I didn't want people to think I was incapable because of my lupus. But I wanted my needs and limits to be respected, too. For my friends to acknowledge my lupus, and how I managed with Epsom salt baths every morning, meant the world. If I had any reservations about becoming a priestess before, they all melted away. I knew then that I'd made the right choice staying in Octavia Falls, if not for everyone else, then for my three best friends. What's wrong? Talia asked gently. I can't believe you did this for me, I sniffled. It wasn't a big deal, Mandy said. But you cared enough to do it, I pointed out. Thank you so much. I reached out, and each of them leaned in for a hug in turn. None of us rushed to get ready, because we had plenty of time. My friends played with our cats, and Talia tinkered on the piano, until I finally dragged myself out of bed and ran myself a bath. I melted into the hot tub, enjoying the lavender-scented bath bombs and salts Amy had gifted me. By the time I finished, I was feeling really good. My friend's gifts this morning had made me feel like I could tackle anything today. 
I took my meds and threw on some sweatpants and a t-shirt before returning to the room. Mandy looked up from the mirror where she was applying her Halloween makeup. Her face was pale, with dark shadows all over it, made to look like a skeleton. It was incredibly intricate and realistic. Talia had changed into a green and blue dress that shimmered in the light. Her costume came complete with peacock tail feathers. Amy wore a black dress with a layer of fabric attached to her arms in the shape of bat wings. You guys look so good, I told them. I haven't decided what I'm going to wear yet. I was thinking the Cheshire cat, but I don't want to wear makeup for my ceremony. I thought Sherlock Holmes would be neat, but I don't have everything for the costume. Don't worry, Talia said. We have the perfect thing for you. I eyed her curiously. You do? It should be here any minute, she started to say, but she was cut off by a knock at the door. The girl shared a knowing glance. I narrowed my eyes suspiciously. What do you have up your sleeve? Nothing, Amy said innocently. Mandy smirked. You'll just have to open the door and find out. My curiosity peaked. I turned to the door and was shocked to find Grammy standing behind it. She held a white box in her hands, and Cornelius followed beside her. Grammy! I exclaimed, excited to see her. I thought I wouldn't see you until tonight. Nonsense, she said, waving her hand. I had to drop this off. She handed me the box. What is it? She winked. You'll have to open it and find out. I gestured Grammy into the room, and she walked over to sit on the couch. Cornelius immediately ran to play with the other cats. I stared down at the box, thinking about what Talia had said. Did you get me a costume? Grammy smirked. Nope. They were being all cryptic, and this was a puzzle I couldn't quite figure out. I set the box on the bed and opened it. My friends all stood and gathered next to each other, eyeing me eagerly. Inside sat a thick piece of fabric with crescent moon shapes subtly embroidered all over it. Curiously, I lifted the fabric, and my breath caught as it unfurled. In my hands I held a long black cloak with cutouts for my arms and a hood to keep me warm. I laid the cloak out on the bed and fingered the designs. Each crescent moon was connected by a string of stars. The threads matched the fabric, so it was hard to see the design unless you looked closely. I turned to Grammy with tears in my eyes. This looks like the cloaks the priestesses wear. She nodded, her eyes glimmering. It's a tradition for a priestess's caste to design her cloak and gift it to her the morning of her induction. Talia stepped forward sheepishly. But you don't have any cast members, so we thought. She looked to Amy, who smiled. Who better to gift you your cloak than your family? Amy finished. If I thought their gifts this morning meant something, it was nothing compared to this. I couldn't help it when my voice cracked. You... you all made this for me? They exchanged a glance, but it was Mandy who spoke. I designed it, but Talia picked out the fabric, and Amy treated it with a blessing while she brewed herself. Your grandma embroidered the moons and stars, and I sewed the layers together. My shoulders began to shake as tears welled in my eyes. Nate Dean, it's all right, Grammy said gently. She stood and pulled me into a hug. I broke into sobs, shaking against her as I held her in my arms. I know, it's perfect. Thank you all so much. I could hardly see past the tears, but I gestured my friends forward, and they wrapped me into a group hug. I didn't know how long we stood there like that, but I didn't want to pull away. This moment was so beautifully perfect. It was everything I could ask for the morning of my induction. Finally, we all drew away from each other, and I wiped my nose. Becoming a priestess has been so nerve-wracking and stressful, and this just makes me feel like... like it's something I can actually do. Your support means everything. Mandy beamed. 
Do you want to try it on? Yes, I cried. Mandy draped the cloak over my shoulders and tied it shut. When I turned to the mirror, my breath caught. The cloak was the perfect length, and the black looked really good on me. I thought for certain I'd feel like a fraud wearing one of these, but certainty settled in my heart when I saw myself in it. It didn't just feel like this cloak was made for me. It was as if the position of priestess was meant for me. Maybe I didn't fit in with the other priestesses. I wasn't as wise or experienced as they were. But one thing was for certain. I belonged in this cloak. At that moment, I didn't think about the other priestesses. I didn't worry about how they would treat me or if I'd fit in. All I knew was that this felt right. No matter who else was serving on the council, I belonged there too. Shock riveted through me as I stared at myself in the mirror. I never thought I'd go into my induction ceremony wanting this. I thought for sure I'd be dragged into it by obligation alone. But when I put on that cloak, everything changed. I didn't just look like a priestess. I embodied one. Grammy admired me in the mirror. I'm so proud of you, Nadine. Thank you all, I said. I don't know if I could do this without you. Grammy took my hand. You don't have to. Check out the inside of the cloak, Mandy whispered. I got excited when she said that, so I quickly opened the cloak and peeked inside. There were all kinds of zippers and pockets. I designed the cloak with inside pockets, in case you don't want to conjure things, Mandy said. Look, you can keep your wand right here. She pointed to a long, skinny pocket that was just the right size. Excited, I conjured my wand and slipped it inside. It was perfect. I love it, I told her. Well, I need to get going, Grammy announced. I'm helping with a pumpkin painting booth down at the festival. You girls have lots of fun today. I'll see you at your ceremony tonight, Nadine. I smiled brightly. I'll save you a front row seat. Grammy placed a kiss on my head, then left with Cornelius. I was still running my fingers over the soft fabric of my cloak long after she left. I changed into a long black dress and comfortable shoes, though no one would notice what I was wearing under my cloak. I just wanted to look nice for my ceremony. Mandy twisted my hair into a pretty bun. While Mandy worked on my hair, Amy announced, Tate said she wanted to hang out today. I'm going to see if she's ready. Amy left the room, leaving the door open behind her. Mandy scowled, and I caught it in the mirror. You don't like Tate? I asked. Mandy relaxed her features quickly, like she realized she'd been caught. It's not that. It's just, they've been spending so much time together. Amy's all my sister can talk about, Talia confirmed. I get it. You miss her. Mandy dropped her gaze. Yeah, I miss her. I'm surprised they aren't dating yet, I added. They obviously like each other. Mandy frowned. Tate wants to keep her options open. She's stringing Amy along, and it's unfair if you ask me. We heard Amy and Tate's exchange from next door. Tate, are you okay? Amy asked, sounding worried. I'm fine, she replied, though her voice sounded groggy, like she'd just woken up. You don't look fine, Amy pointed out. I thought you'd be dressed and ready by now. I'm not coming, Tate sighed. I'm sorry, I'm just not feeling well. Is it the waning? Amy asked. No, it's... Tate trailed off. She didn't sound anything like her upbeat self. It's something else. I just need to sleep it off. You have fun. Amy sounded disappointed. I'm sorry you won't be able to make it. Let me bring you soup or something. I'm not hungry, Tate said. Really, it's fine. Okay. 
If you need anything, call me. I'll come back as soon as I can. Mandy made a face in the mirror and muttered something under her breath. I heard the rustle of fabric, like Amy and Tate had hugged. The two had gotten really close over the last few months. Amy returned a few moments later. She's not feeling well. Talia started for the door. I'll go check on her. Mandy continued doing my hair, and the three of us sat in silence, waiting. Talia had gone into Tate's room, so we couldn't hear them, even though we tried. After several minutes, Talia returned. That was... weird. She's okay, though, Amy asked hopefully. She will be, Talia responded. She's not acting like herself. It's like she's... depressed. She says nothing's wrong, though. I wish there was something we could do to help, Mandy said. Even though she seemed to have a problem with Tate, she seemed worried for her. We just have to give her space, Talia said. Maybe she'll feel better by tonight, I suggested. Mandy applied a light layer of makeup so I didn't have to expend any of my magic. It wasn't long before we were ready to go. I was practically bouncing in my seat as we left the school. It was a beautiful day out, a little chilly, but the perfect temperature beneath my thick cloak. The sky was overcast, so I didn't have to worry too much about hiding from the sun. Curfew was waived tonight, so we could stay out as long as we wanted. My ceremony would take place under the full moon, so we had all day to enjoy the festivities. We walked to the edge of campus and passed the main gate, where a line had formed at the edge of the forest. A horse-drawn wagon stood there, and over a dozen students piled on for the hayride. We figured parking near the festival would be packed already, so we might as well hitch a ride into town. Your costume is wicked, Talia told Mandy, eyeing the bones printed onto her black shirt. Just wait until tonight, Mandy replied. They glow in the dark. I stopped in my tracks as we came to the back of the line. Ahead of us stood three guys. I didn't recognize them at first, until one dressed in a red and white striped shirt turned to us. My breath caught at the sight of Lucas. He wore a matching red and white hat with round glasses. Beside him, Grant wore a white mask that only covered half of his face, the Phantom of the Opera. Miles was dressed as a police officer, but he wore shorts instead of long slacks. He looked more like a stripper than anything. Issa stopped playing with Gus, and her eyes locked on Oliver. The two cats had turned to statues. Hey, chicas! Grant exclaimed. Perfect timing! You want to share a ride? Sure, Mandy said brightly, before anyone else could object. And why would they? We were all friends, but the sight of Lucas standing there turned my insides to mush. Awesome costume, Talia told Grant. You too, he said, eyeing her peacock feathers. Lucas looked at me. Your cloak looks nice. Thanks, Grammy made it with the girls. I gestured to them. It's not really a costume, though. It's better than mine, he chuckled. I'm... Waldo, I finished for him. My cheeks flushed. I loved the Where's Waldo books as a kid. Lucas yanked the beanie off his head and fiddled with those strands. Yeah, uh, Eric and I used to spend hours looking at those books. It, um, looks good on you, I said. Talia must have noticed the awkwardness in the air, because she quickly cut in. Hey, Lucas! How'd it go with Professor Richards and Professor Blackbird? Lucas sighed and situated his beanie back on his head. It was a bust. I followed Professor Richards, but I didn't find anything. He left the supply closet open when he was in there, and I took as many photos as I could. Even looking at them afterward, I didn't find anything out of the ordinary. No cauldrons? Amy asked. Lucas shook his head. Not even unicorn hair. Damn it, Talia muttered under her breath. Grant straightened. 
I'm happy to report that Mandy is as resourceful as she claims. She got me the supplies we needed, and Amy and I are back on track. Mandy smiled proudly. Grant couldn't say nightshade out loud because there were other students ahead of us in line. At least we're making progress there, I said. Progress is good, so let's not worry about it right now, Mandy suggested. It's Halloween! Let's have some fun! Plus, it's Nadine's induction, Lucas added. That's reason enough to celebrate. No point in worrying about things we can't change today. There was something in his voice that suggested he was worried. I could tell. But he was right. There wasn't anything we could do right now. Not until the priestesses found out more, or Grant broke the nightshade formula. This was one of the biggest days of my life. I should enjoy it. Another wagon arrived, and we piled in. Somehow, I ended up seated next to Lucas. We were so crammed onto the long benches lining the perimeter of the wagon that his knee touched mine. "'What should we do first? Mandy asked, bouncing in her seat. "'Tour the apple orchard? Visit a haunted house? Pumpkin bowling? Cider tasting?' "'The apple orchard sounds fun,' Lucas said. "'We can start there,' I agreed. "'I was thinking we could go to the festival first. Grant suggested. Miles nudged him. Gotta be the first to get all the candy? Grant blushed. Well, that's not the only reason. We don't all have to go together to everything, Amy added. True, Talia said. I was hoping to go shopping before all the clearance items are sold out. Everyone kept suggesting things to do that I couldn't keep track of the plan, if there was one. I thought we had decided to tour the orchards and go from there, but when the wagon stopped at a haunted mansion, Amy and Miles hopped off. Several strangers joined us on the wagon, until I was squished so close to Lucas I could hardly move. My head spun at his proximity, but I avoided his gaze and kept my eyes on the beautiful orange tones of the landscape. The wagon stopped in the heart of town. Talia gasped and pointed at a shop window. Mandy, look at that dress on clearance. Mandy squealed. You have to get it. Screw the orchards. A huge group of people shuffled off the hayride, and another group piled on. It wasn't until we were drawing away that I realized my friends had disappeared into the crowd. Grant must have followed the girls, because Lucas and I were the last ones left. I glanced around the wagon. Um... Did they just ditch us? I think they did. Lucas shrugged. But hey, if they want to miss out on the best apples in the world, that's their problem. We sat in silence for a few minutes until I saw the apple orchard ahead of us. Are the apples infused with magic, like the coven's cider and maple syrup? I asked. Lucas nodded. The fertilizer is made by alchemists. You've never had the coven's apples in season, have you? Not yet, I admitted. He clicked his tongue. You've been missing out. No kidding, I said. I've been here over a year, and I haven't been to the apple orchards yet. Lucas smirked as the wagon came to a stop. He held out his hand. Allow me to be your guide. I stared at his hand for a moment, unsure if I should take it but when I looked up into his inviting green eyes, I couldn't refuse. I took his hand, and we hopped off the wagon. Our cats followed closely behind. The orchard was packed with people. Children bobbed for apples and ate caramel squares, while adults stood in long lines to purchase freshly picked apples and large pumpkins. Lucas walked over to a stack of baskets and grabbed one. How many do you want? All of them. I teased with a smile. I can grab more baskets, he said, playing along. But I suggest starting with one. One is perfect. Where do we start? Lucas guided me behind the building, where a tractor pulling a wagon was driving up to take people to the far corner of the orchards. We climbed on. Lucas pointed out the apple varieties as the wagon wove through the trees. See the difference between the bright red ones and those apples over there? He asked. 
I nodded. You might think those bright red ones are the best, but I'll beg to differ, he said. The best apples are the Honeycrisp. They're smaller and not quite as bright, but they taste like heaven. Then I want to try the Honeycrisp, I replied. The tractor dropped us off, and Lucas led me to a row of trees growing yellowish-red apples. Isa sniffed at the apples on the ground, and Oliver tried to eat one. Most of the low-hanging fruit had been picked, but Lucas reached up and plucked one off the branches that I couldn't reach. He handed it to me. Try this. My heart fluttered when our fingers touched. I bit into the apple, and sweet juice filled my mouth. The apple was crisp, with the perfect amount of crunch. Mmm, that is so good! I told you. Lucas crunched into his own apple. How many do you want to pick? Let's fill the whole basket, I replied enthusiastically. Lucas started picking apples. I stood on my toes, but they were all just out of reach. Try this, Lucas offered. I turned to see him holding a long stick with a small wire basket twisted onto the end. I took it, then lifted it into the tree. The wire cupped the apple, and I tugged. The apple fell perfectly into the picker. That's handy, I said. Thanks. We continued until our basket was full, then hitched a ride back to the main building on the tractor. We paid for our apples and subconjured them. What's next? I asked eagerly. The apples had been so good that I was excited to try more things. Lucas smirked like he had so much more up his sleeve. I hope you like apple cider. I drew a deep breath, and the scent of cinnamon and nutmeg filled my nose. I can already smell it. Follow me, he invited. Lucas led me inside the building. We entered a dining room with endless rows of cider lined along tables. My jaw dropped. There are so many! I don't even know where to start! Start here and work your way down he suggested. I grabbed a tiny disposable cup and poured myself the smallest bit of cider. The label read Honey Cider. I downed it in one gulp, the warmth permeating my bones. It was so sweet that my taste buds sang. Hmm, I don't know if I need to try the others. That one might be my favorite, I said. Lucas smirked, like he knew something I didn't. You're going to want to try them all. Trust me. I went down the row, and each flavor was better than the last. There was lemon cider, pumpkin spice, lavender, ginger, rose, pear, and even pineapple. The only one I didn't like was the cinnamon, which was too spicy. What do you think? Lucas asked as we neared the end. It's a tough call, I replied thoughtfully. I'm leaning toward the pumpkin spice or pear. Nah, the lavender is the best, he argued. No way, your taste buds are broken. Try it again, he insisted, shoving a cup my way. I sipped it slowly, letting the cider sit on my tongue. You might be right. We'll have to try them all twice, just to be sure. Lucas and I argued for at least a half an hour about which cider was the best. We narrowed it down through the process of elimination, until we decided that the pumpkin spice won. My phone buzzed, and I checked it to see I had a message from Talia. Where'd you end up? I'm with Lucas at Blossom Orchards, I texted back. Do you need us to rescue you? We're still shopping, but we can head over. I hesitated. Normally, I would be begging her to get me out of this, but I hadn't realized until then that I didn't want to leave. I was actually having a good time with Lucas, and I didn't mind hanging out with him. It's fine. We'll meet up when you're done. I put my phone away and turned to Lucas. What's the next best thing in town? He pressed his lips together. How do you feel about mazes? A smile instantly touched my lips. I love them. Come on. 
Lucas led me across the road, to a cornfield that had trails cut through it. We paid the admission and entered into the maze. "'What's our strategy?' he asked as we wound around the cornfield. "'Let's explore a bit, and we can—' My heart leapt into my throat when we turned a corner and came face to face with a real human skeleton. It reached out for me, and I screamed. Lucas instinctually grabbed me and yanked me backward, but he tripped, and I toppled to the ground on top of him. He landed on Oliver, and the cat hissed. I looked up to see the skeleton lowering its hand. I couldn't help it when I burst into laughter. The skeleton was harmless, just a prank set up by a necromancer. Lucas clutched his stomach while he laughed. Did I forget to tell you it's a haunted corn maze? Yes, you jerk, I cried, punching him lightly in the shoulder. I dusted myself off as I stood. Your warning came a little too late. Looks like this is a dead end, so we should try that way. Lucas pointed. I followed him. My pulse was still working on slowing even long after the skeleton disappeared from view. We turned another corner. Even though I was prepared this time, I jumped when someone dressed in zombie makeup lunged at us. I reacted without thinking, and a battle orb shot out of my palms. Luckily, Lucas grabbed my wrist at that exact moment, and the orb went spinning off into the cornfield, knocking down stalks along the way. The zombie guy didn't seem to care, as if he'd been dodging battle orbs all day. He reached out for me again and groaned. This way. Lucas yanked me along behind him. We started running, but the zombie picked up speed. My heart hammered in exhilaration. Even though I knew the maze was harmless, I was having fun. I thought zombies were supposed to be slow, I cried. Only the real ones, Lucas replied. I don't run fast, I protested. Lucas yanked me around a corner. Get on my back. I didn't have to think about it. I just jumped on his back, and he sprinted through the maze faster than I could run on my own. Our cats raced beside us. People dressed as ghosts and ghouls jumped out at us, and I buried my face into Lucas's shoulder. I laughed out loud. This was so much fun. When we finally came to an empty trail, he set me down. It should be safe now. I peeked around the corner, but the zombie guy had abandoned us. I really thought he was going to get us. Nah, I threw up a shield back there. Lucas chuckled. He wasn't coming close. I placed a hand on my hip and wrinkled my nose. I think that's cheating. I wasn't aware there were rules, he stated. Sometimes you have to think outside the box. I pointed to the end of the trail, which opened into a wide parking lot. Apparently it pays off, because we're already at the end. Lucas frowned. That was too easy. Want to go again? I smiled brightly. Absolutely. Lucas and I went through the maze two more times, exploring every trail until we had the whole thing mapped out in our heads and could get to the exit with ease. Every actor that jumped out at us made my heartbeat pound faster and faster. If you like the haunted corn maze, wait until you tour the haunted houses, Lucas said. I bounced on my toes. Yes, please! I would like the scariest one in town. Lucas smiled. I know the perfect one. We rode one of the wagons through the forest and to a house on the edge of town. Out front, fake tombstones stood crooked in the yard, and cobwebs hung from trees. Spiders crawled around, along with animal skeletons that moved with necromancer magic. Someone had stuffed a pair of trousers into some boots and half buried them, so it looked like a dead body was being uncovered. An alchemist must have brewed fog potion, because a light layer of fog drifted across the lawn. Paint peeled off the siding of the house, and the windows appeared crooked. To anyone else, this might give them the chills, but I was more excited than I'd been in a long time. 
Welcome, welcome! A woman in a nurse's costume greeted us when we entered. She had fake blood all over her face and hair. You must be here about the murder. Please help us find who did this to Mr. Floyd. I knew instantly that Lucas had brought me to the right haunted house. The actress led us into the living room, which was set up like a crime scene, with tape outlining the shape of a man and everything. She gave us a sob story about how her client had been murdered just earlier today. I was upstairs organizing Mr. Floyd's medication when I heard him scream, she said. I came down to find him lying here with his neck slashed. I did everything I could to save him. That's how I got the blood all over my uniform. You must go to each room. Interview everybody. Find out who did this. The head detective will be waiting for you on the back porch. Lucas and I exchanged a confident smirk. We'll have your murderer arrested before dinner, I told her. She looked skeptical. Many detectives have tried to solve this murder. Good luck. She handed us a clipboard, which listed all the suspects we were supposed to talk to. We headed down the hall and passed by someone dressed in ghostly makeup. She had a vacant look in her eyes and muttered something incomprehensible under her breath. We made our way through the rooms, playing along with the actors as we interviewed them. There was a butler, a cook a maid, and the daughter of the deceased. Each of them had their own sob story to tell, and they all pointed at one another as the culprit. Lucas and I looked down at our notes after we interviewed them all. Who has motive? Lucas thought aloud. The daughter said she thought the maid had been stealing things. Maybe he caught her, and she killed him before he could call the authorities. Possible, but look at the daughter, I said. She stands to gain quite the inheritance. Lucas pressed his lips together. The butler and the cook were having an affair, so maybe he walked in on them. It's possible, I said thoughtfully, but I'm almost certain it wasn't them. Why not? Well, the maid saw them heading to the kitchen together right before they heard the screams, I pointed out. And the butler said he'd just taken tea up to the daughter's room, Lucas added. The daughter saw the nurse upstairs right before that, but I narrowed my eyes at the paper. We need to talk to the ghost we saw downstairs. Lucas eyed the clipboard. She's not on the list. I stabbed the list with my pen. This is the box. Remember, we need to think outside of it. He smirked proudly. You're on to something, aren't you? I didn't say anything, just gave him a knowing smile. We made our way down the hall until we found the actress in ghostly makeup pacing. Excuse me, I said, approaching her. She didn't look at me, but her muttering got louder. We have a few questions, I said. Did you happen to see anyone come through here earlier today? Again, she didn't respond. It must have been part of her script. She was only allowed to say one thing to us, so I listened closely. Go back to your room, Minerva, the actress muttered. I'll take care of this. Go back to your room, Minerva. I'll take care of this. I smirked proudly, then circled two names on my clipboard. That was the plot twist. Everyone was looking for one culprit, but there'd been two. Lucas eyed my choices curiously. Why them? You'll see. We headed to the back porch, where we were supposed to turn in our suspect list with an actor dressed as a detective. Case closed, I said proudly, handing my clipboard over to him. He looked down at it with a raised eyebrow. Interesting choices, junior detective. How did you decide that the daughter and the nurse were to blame? The first thing I noticed was the blood pattern on the nurse's uniform, I said. She said she got blood on her uniform from trying to save Mr. Floyd, but the splatter pattern wasn't right. I thought it was just bad makeup, but then I saw the pill organizer in the bathroom was empty. 
She was lying about being upstairs organizing her pills. But the thing that didn't add up was that the daughter, Minerva, said she saw the nurse upstairs just before Mr. Floyd screamed. Then the butler heard the footsteps on the stairs. It's implied that that was the nurse running downstairs to be the first on the scene, but the ghost gave it away. It was Minerva running upstairs. She was covering for the nurse. But the butler said he'd just taken Minerva her tea, Lucas pointed out. Didn't you notice, though? Her teacup was full. She hadn't touched it. Realization dawned on Lucas's face. So she had time to go downstairs, kill her father, and return upstairs? I nodded. The nurse was there, too. The maid said Mr. Floyd was sick, and she worried the cook was poisoning him. And the cook said she witnessed Minerva give the nurse a lot of money. The cook wasn't poisoning him. The nurse was. Minerva was paying her to kill her father, and she was sharing the inheritance money. But she must have gotten impatient with the poison and killed him herself. The detective looked impressed. Very well done. We worried we'd made the mystery too difficult this year. You're the first to figure it out. I smiled proudly. I kind of have a thing for murder mysteries. Congratulations. Enjoy your prize. The man handed us a gift certificate to one of six different restaurants downtown. I waved the paper at Lucas. I hope you're hungry. What are our options? He asked, eyeing the gift certificate. I spotted Wasabi Lounge on the list of logos. We could do sushi. You said you've never had it. Sushi? Lucas balked. Nade, we have to go to the pie shack. It's a Halloween tradition. But sushi's delicious, I argued. So is pie, he pointed out. I said I'd be your guide for the day, and it wouldn't be Halloween without the pie shack. Come on. Lucas grabbed my hand, and I got hot all over. I couldn't even protest, because it was fucking hot when Lucas took the lead. We rode back into town. The pie shack was packed, but we managed to get the last open table. Isa curled up at my feet, and we ordered right away. Lucas adjusted his thick-rimmed glasses, and I heard something clink onto the table. Crap, he mumbled. He set the glasses on the table, and I noticed that the hinge had broken on one side. I lost a screw. I knew you had a few loose screws, I teased. He chuckled as he struggled to put the tiny screw back into the hinge. More than a couple, I'm sure. I watched him a few moments longer. Do you need help with that? He frowned. This screw is so small. Hold on, I know this one. I pulled my wand from my cloak and pointed it at the glasses. I muttered a fake incantation. Nothing happened, and Lucas pressed his palm to his forehead. Tell me you didn't just use a spell from Harry Potter. I shrugged. It was worth a try. It's useless, he laughed. It did what I intended, I argued. He eyed the glasses, which were still broken. No, it didn't. Sure it did. It made you laugh, I pointed out. Lucas tried to hide his laugh, but he smiled and shook his head. You're ridiculous. It's a natural talent. I reached across the table and took his glasses, then worked the screw back into the hinge before handing them back. Thanks, he said, placing them back on his nose. Our pie arrived. Lucas and I cut our pieces in half and traded so we could each get a taste of the different flavors. The apple pie was incredible, and the pumpkin melted in my mouth. The seasonings changed with every bite, and I never knew what I was going to get. We sat in silence a while longer, savoring our food. As we reached the end, Lucas broke the silence. The murder mystery was impressive, by the way. You looked so in your element. I love murder mysteries. I said, but my stomach twisted. 
I mean, the fake ones. Real murders are... Sad. Lucas finished, dropping his gaze. But you still want to be a homicide detective. I nodded. It is sad, but what's worse is never catching the murderer. I want to give the deceased and their families some sort of closure, you know? No one deserves to die that way. It hurt to say that out loud, after what I'd done to those witches. I didn't think I'd ever get over the guilt, even though I'd done the right thing by saving my friends. I felt like I'd be spending the rest of my life making up for it. Lucas fiddled with his straw. You're going to be really good at it. His words caught me off guard. You think I can do it? Of course. Why wouldn't I? I thought about what Grant had said the night of our date. He didn't think I could possibly be a detective, because I had to be a priestess instead. Well, I'm going to be a priestess. You can be both, Lucas said. I believe in you. Everything I had thought about Lucas over the last several months seemed to vanish in that moment. All the anger and betrayal I felt didn't seem to matter. When he said he believed in me, my head began to spin, and I forgot why I'd broken up with him in the first place. Shock must have shown on my face, because Lucas asked, Are you okay? I cleared my throat. Yeah, I just... Slowly, all the reasons we'd broken up came back to me, but they didn't seem quite as intense as before. I nudged them aside, because I didn't want to think about the past right now. I just wanted to be in the moment. I had a really good time with you today, I admitted. I had a good time with you, too. Silence stretched between us then, because neither of us knew what to say. The air felt thick, and emotions shifted through me so quickly that I couldn't place them. It terrified me a little. We should probably find everyone else, I suggested. Yeah, probably. Lucas agreed. I couldn't read his tone. We didn't have to go far to find our friends. As we left the pie shack, we spotted them entering a candy shop across the street. Lucas shook his head. Of course they're at the candy shop. Grant's going to end up sick. We'd better rescue him then, I joked. We caught up with our friends in the candy shop where Grant already had his shopping basket half full. Miles had popped a piece of prank taffy in his mouth from one of the samples nearby. It was so sticky that he couldn't get it off his teeth. Amy tried a cleansing spell, but the taffy didn't budge. There you are, Talia cried. You missed the dress sale at Winifred's. They sold out. Only because we practically bought the whole store, Mandy added. I shrugged. I can shop any time. How was the haunted house, Amy? Wicked, she said, her eyes lighting up. Miles screamed like a little girl. I think he almost wet his pants. I did not, he protested, but his cheeks flamed. Okay, I might have. Just a little bit. We went to the murder mystery house, Lucas said, sounding proud. Nadine was the first junior detective of the day to crack the case. Really? Grant asked. I hear those mysteries get harder every year. It wasn't that hard, I said. Did you make it to the park yet? Not yet, Talia replied. We were headed there next. We browsed the candy shop for a while until Miles ate a gummy bear and green goo oozed out of his nose. He got sick of the prank candy and insisted we leave. We made it to the park, where all kinds of vendors had been set up in rows. We spent the rest of the day playing games like pumpkin bowling, giant chess, and a ring toss that used tiny pointed witch hats instead of bottles. I ate skull-shaped cookies and biscuits made to look like mummies. We stopped at a palm-reading booth, then had a seer predict our final grades. 
I was going to get a solid B average, according to the seer. He must have been nuts, because I didn't know how I was going to manage that with how much class I'd missed. I laughed with my friends more than I had in ages. I wished every day could be Halloween. When night fell, we danced around the bonfire, waving our stems of yarrow and St. John's wort to ward off the fairies. I couldn't help but notice that Lucas was twirling along with us. Last year, he sat out of the ritual, because he said he didn't like to dance. I didn't think he noticed what a difference it was to see him dancing around the bonfire, smiling and laughing with everyone else. I had a hard time taking my eyes off him all night. The full moon climbed higher in the sky, and I knew the time was coming for my induction ceremony. "'Are you ready for this?' Talia asked. I sat on a bench near the bonfire, sipping another cup of hot cider. Isa purred beside me. "'I am, honestly. I thought I'd be scared, but I'm not. It helps being with all of you today. I feel like this is where I'm meant to be. I don't question that anymore.' "'Good,' Talia said. "'Because I think you're meant to be here, too.' I'm really excited to see you become a priestess. You're going to be really good at it. That means a lot. Thank you. I leaned over to give her a hug. Nadine! I turned to see Grammy waving at me. She wore a black dress with cat ears, which matched Cornelius perfectly. The priestesses are ready for you. I stood. Thanks for letting me know. I finished my cider and tossed the cup in the trash. Grammy walked with me to the main stage, where a band played a beautiful tune in a minor key. The priestesses were waiting for me behind the stage. Nadine, Priestess Margaret greeted. Your ceremony will begin in half an hour. I wanted to go over the procedure before we start. Your cloak looks beautiful, Priestess Stella remarked. Thanks, I told her. I didn't miss Lillian crinkle up her nose like she didn't think it was anything special. But it was to me, so screw her. We've discussed the ceremony, but there's one part I want to make sure we don't get wrong, Priestess Margaret said. Traditionally, the members of a caste will be asked to accept the priestess as their governor. Seeing as you are the only member of your caste, you will have to stand up and accept yourself. Can you do that? The priestesses eyed me intently, like they weren't quite sure I was cut out for this. I glanced to Grammy, who offered a kind smile. I straightened my shoulders. Yes, I can do that. Margaret nodded. Very well. We will begin shortly. Grammy squeezed my hand. I'll be in the front row. I love you, and I'm so proud of you. Thank you, Grammy. Your support means everything. I hugged her, but she was gone far too soon. My nerves returned momentarily, but Issa was with me, and that was enough support for now. I could hear the crowd gathering on the other side of the stage. It wasn't the whole coven. There simply wasn't enough room in the park for that many people. But judging by the sound of voices carrying across the park, there were a lot of people who had come to watch my ceremony. I stole a glance at the stage and saw my friends sitting in the front row next to Grammy. My heart swelled. Nadine, it's time, Priestess Stella said. I drew a deep breath and dropped my shoulders as she guided me up the steps and onto the stage. The band had finished playing and moved their equipment. The only item on the stage was a single chair. The crowd had gone so quiet that I heard nothing but the sound of my own footsteps as I crossed the stage. Issa followed me, and the priestesses came on stage after us. Boo! Someone shouted. My heart lurched, and my confidence faltered. The priestesses had promised the ceremony would be safe, but it was clear some of the coven members objected. "'She's no priestess,' someone started to say. Silentium. 
the priestesses muttered. Their voices were so low that no one in the crowd could hear them, but all objections ceased in that moment. The priestesses weren't going to stand for interruptions. My knees shook, and I suddenly felt like running off the stage. Then I saw Lucas in the front row. He smiled brightly and shot me an encouraging thumbs up. All my remaining anxiety melted away. My pulse remained calm and steady as I sat in the chair and gazed over the audience. The crowd was huge, lit only by the silvery light from the moon. The four priestesses surrounded me. In unison, they each conjured a candle in their hands and lit it. A shiver traveled down my spine when the candles ignited, but in a good way. I felt powerful, like anything was possible. The priestesses began to circle me. I closed my eyes, taking in every sound, every sensation. This was where I was meant to be. This was who I was meant to be. This was who I wanted to be. The priestesses spoke an incantation. Tonight we call this priestess to serve her caste and all the coven, to uphold our Miriamic laws, to protect our people, and to govern. Through good and bad, through light and dark, through peacefulness and strife, Mother Miriam's blessing will be laid upon her, and she'll serve as a priestess all her life. The priestesses came to a stop. I opened my eyes and stared out at the crowd. My eyes connected with Grammy's, then Talia's, before moving over all of my friends. Nadine Evers, Priestess Margaret said, her voice projecting over the crowd. You have been selected by the Mariamic people to preside over and protect the coven from now until your death as a high priestess. The priestesses confirm you a fit as the curse-breaker high priestess. May we offer you our wisdom and blessings to guide you along the journey you embark on tonight. I bowed my head to her, and Margaret placed her hand upon it. Nadine, she said. I bless you with the gift of bravery, to face your responsibilities with courage. As a priestess, it is not the power over your people that makes you strong. It is your willingness to fulfill your duties and responsibilities. The coven is relying on you, and you must exercise the courage to protect them at all costs, even when you face the most difficult of choices. I will be brave, priestess, I told her, as was part of the ritual. So shall it be. So shall it be, she repeated. The priestesses shifted in a circle again, until Priestess Charlotte stood in front of me. She placed her hand on my head. Nadine, I bless you with the gift of cooperation, that you may work with the members of the Council as one unit and listen to the people whom you serve. It is our duty to celebrate with the Coven when times are good, and to serve and protect them when times are bad. I nodded. I will listen, priestess. So shall it be. So shall it be, she replied. They circled me again, until Priestess Lillian placed her hand on my head. Nadine, I bless you with confidence that even in the midst of difficult decisions, you may stand certain and strong in your choices. The moment a priestess loses confidence in herself, she loses confidence in her people. I will be confident, priestess, I stated. So shall it be. So shall it be. Finally, Priestess Stella touched my head. Nadine, I bless you with the gift of wisdom and intelligence, that you may seek to learn and understand your people. May you uncover creative solutions to all problems that arise in your position. As leaders, we must explore all possibilities to make the best decisions for the coven. I will embrace my wisdom and intelligence, priestess, I said. So shall it be. So shall it be. 
Priestess Margaret stepped in front of me again. Becoming a priestess is a lifelong commitment. Once you are named a priestess, your communication channel to Mother Miriam will be opened. Your intuition will grow. You will become more susceptible to signs so that you may gain a better understanding of what is best for the coven. Are you prepared to take on this role from now until the day you die? I am, I stated firmly. Priestess Margaret turned to the crowd, who watched the ceremony eagerly. Grammy wiped her eyes from the front row. The curse breakers of the coven may now stand and accept Nadine Evers as their priestess, Priestess Margaret announced. Should any member of the curse breaker cast object to this ceremony, they may speak now. She turned and gave me a subtle nod. There were no other curse breakers to speak for me. I had to be the one to accept myself. I stood from my chair and gazed over the crowd, the people I would govern for the rest of my life. For a moment, I hesitated, but Mother Miriam's words came back to me. You are not supposed to be here because I said so, or because the coven demanded it. You are meant to be here because you want to be because you chose to be. Now was the time to make my final decision. I opened my mouth, unsure of what would come out. But when Issa brushed her tail against my leg, confidence swelled within me. By the name of Mother Miriam, I accept myself as the curse-breaker priestess, I said. Nobody in the crowd spoke but it wouldn't matter if they did. I accepted myself, and that was the only validation I needed to embark on this journey. Priestess Margaret conjured a large vial filled with a clear liquid. Take these blessings with you into your priesthood. Solidify them now in your soul by drinking the herb of the heart. I didn't know what the herb of the heart was exactly, but Margaret had explained it to me as the extract of a magical plant grown only by the Miriamic coven. It was used in the coven's most sacred ceremonies. I pulled the cork off the vial and drank the liquid inside. It was sweet and slid over my tongue with ease. Warmth settled into my belly. Tingles spread through my extremities like the light of Mother Miriam herself was permeating every single cell in my body. I felt courageous, powerful, and confident. A light began to glow from on stage. I looked down to see that it was coming from somewhere beneath my cloak. I gasped when I pulled back the fabric to see that the bright light shone through my dress in the shape of a crescent moon. My tattoo was glowing. The priestesses had told me this would happen. It was a sign from Mother Miriam that the ceremony was complete. I was a priestess now. But knowing what was going to happen and actually witnessing it were two very different things. When my tattoo glowed a bright white, all I could do was stare. Tears pricked at my eyes. It was so beautiful. Come, Priestess Margaret said, taking my hand. There is one final part of the ritual. You must complete your first act as a priestess and help us reinforce the protection spell around Octavia Falls. You will gain control over the spell alongside us as a literal and symbolic protector of the coven. We stood in the center of the stage in a circle. Margaret held her hand out, and Lillian placed hers on top. We all joined in until our hands were stacked atop one another. Margaret began the protection incantation. Magic in our hearts and all around. Go forth tonight and protect this town. We repeated the incantation in unison. Energy swelled within me as our magic came together. The magic built until we couldn't contain it anymore. 
A bright ball of light shot out of our hands, straight up to the sky like a firework. The crowd gasped, and my eyes followed the magic upward. It slammed into an invisible barrier high above our heads and exploded. White light as bright as the full moon shone down on us from the area of impact. For several seconds, the protection spell around the town became visible, appearing as a shimmering dome around our entire population. The light spread over the dome until it reached the horizon and faded. Priestess Margaret dropped her hand and turned to me. She took my hand and led me back to the front of the stage, facing the crowd. Her voice was strong as she announced, I present to you... Priestess Nadine. People in the crowd began to cheer. It wasn't everyone. In fact, most of the crowd looked less than pleased. Surely the rumors about me going around school had spread around town. But all I could seem to notice was my friends in the front row, cheering and hollering for me. Grammy sobbed, and Talia and Mandy leapt out of their chairs to give me a standing ovation. Lucas beamed up at me, and my heart swelled with joy. I may not have the entire coven's approval just yet, but I would prove myself to them one way or another. I was their priestess now. And it was my duty to protect the coven. For now and forever. Chapter 15 Lucas Halloween used to be my favorite day of the year when I was a kid. Eric and I would dress in the creepiest costumes we could find and stay up all night pigging out on Halloween candy. But I didn't think I'd ever had as much fun on Halloween than I had with Nadine. Laughing with her was like being with a whole different person. Hell, I felt like a different person myself. And watching her priestess ceremony made my heart full. I was so proud of her. I was feeling pretty good after my session with Dr. Mack on Monday, which I'd scheduled between classes. We talked about Halloween, and she pointed out how much progress I'd made. I must have been beaming by the time I made it to intercast magic, because Grant noticed. He was already sitting in the back, next to an empty seat, waiting for me. Oliver jumped onto our table when I sat. I scratched him behind the ears, and he lay down. You look happy today. Grant remarked. I shrugged. I'm feeling good. Excellent, because rumor has it there's a pop quiz today, Grant said. The spell will work better if you're in a good mood. What kind of spell? I asked. Grant didn't have a chance to respond before Professor Perez entered the room. He was a middle-aged Mortana who always seemed a bit disorganized. His hair was a mess, and he carried a stack of papers that slipped from his hands when he walked. He fumbled with the papers before giving up and subconjuring them. He straightened his suit and stood at the front of the room. Welcome back, students, he said. I trust you all had a wonderful Halloween. If you'll get into groups of three, separate casts, please, we'll be placing a ward on these locks today. He conjured a small box shaped like a treasure chest. He pointed to the lock on it. You and your teammates will be securing the lock so that it can't be unlocked with a simple spell. With at least three casts together, your power should be enough to secure what's inside. You'll find the spell on page 72 of your spell books. I'll come around at the end of class and test your ward. You'll be graded on the strength of your spell. You may begin. Professor Perez began walking around the room, handing out the small boxes. Grant looked to the seer next to us, a girl named Kenna Farlan. Want to join us? He offered. She looked nervous. Kenna was shy, and she seemed even more reluctant to talk in class ever since the cast started dividing. In fact, everyone in this class seemed a bit on edge. Um, I guess, she said timidly, before moving her chair over to join us. Kenna ducked her head and buried her face into her spellbook. It sucked that everyone was acting like the other castes were their enemies. This wasn't right. 
I also knew the spell wouldn't take if we didn't work together, and Kenna seemed apprehensive. I wanted to talk to her, but I didn't know what to say. My eyes caught sight of a charm bracelet on her wrist. I noticed the cupcake charm first. Do you like to cook? I asked her. She eyed me curiously, but I didn't say anything. I gestured to her bracelet. I saw your cupcake charm. I thought you might like to cook. Grant's crazy about the cupcakes at the Cat Fay. He's tried every flavor. A light sparked in Kenna's eyes. Really? I'm working an internship at the Cat Fay. I decorate the cupcakes. No way, Grant said. That's wicked. How do you get the frosting so fluffy? Kenna smirked. It was good to see her loosening up. It's a secret recipe. I'll actually be presenting it at a baking competition in Paris next semester. That's incredible! Grant exclaimed. You must be really good. She blushed. My parents are alchemists and they own a bakery. They taught me everything I know. Grant's eyebrows shot up. And you get that flavor without alchemy magic? I'm impressed. She smiled. I feel like a cupcake decoration is an art form. That's part of my power. I see it in my mind before it's finished. Grant asked her a bunch of questions about cake decorating before Professor Perez finally reached our table and handed us our box. Kenna had loosened up by then, and I felt like we might actually ace this assignment. Here's the spell, she said, turning her spellbook toward us. It was a little more complicated than normal, but that was the point of intercast magic. To perform the spell, we had to meditate together, then confess one secret to each other before the spell could be cast. It was symbolic of locking our secrets inside, or something. I wasn't really sure. I don't want to share a secret, Grant said. It doesn't have to be your deepest secret, I told him. Grant blushed. Yeah, but there's nothing you don't know. There has to be something, I pressed. Grant bit his lower lip. Okay, sometimes I pee in the shower. I scowled. That's a groundbreaking secret, I said sarcastically. But it'll work. My secret is that when I was in kindergarten, I used to sneak gum into class and stick it to the bottom of Miss Leanne's desk. Kenna chuckled. I remember when she found that. I thought for sure it was Gregory. I smirked. She never caught me. Kenna smiled. My secret is buttermilk. I tilted my head. Buttermilk? The secret ingredient in the frosting. It's buttermilk she said. I think we can do the incantation now. We joined hands surrounding the box on our table. Our secrets have been shared and we've set aside our pride. Fasten this lock and secure what we've put inside. Magic swept through us and the lock clicked shut. We dropped our hands and Grant picked up the box to inspect it. He muttered a quick unlocking incantation, but the box remained locked. I think we did it, he announced. All finished? Professor Perez asked. He came over to our table and tried to unlock the box, but nothing happened. Very well done. You've all passed. You should be proud of yourselves. Kenna sank in her seat a little. Thank you. Perez excused us from class early. Grant and I were passing through the main foyer when we caught sight of Talia and Nadine. Talia stood next to a short, plump professor, chatting enthusiastically with him. She clutched a stack of papers to her chest. Thank you so much, Professor Warbright, she said. I can't wait to start practicing. Professor Warbright smiled. It was no problem, really. Whenever you need sheet music, all you have to do is ask. I can't wait to hear what you come up with for the talent show. Nadine lifted her gaze and caught sight of us passing through the foyer. She waved us down. Grant! We made our way over to them. Professor Warbright gave us a kind nod, then left. What's up? 
Grant asked. I got the supplies, Nadine said. You can stop by my dorm whenever you're ready. Supplies? I asked, glancing between them. Grant smirked. Nadine offered to help me with my act for the talent show. My eyebrows shot up. And? And it's a surprise, he replied. It's going to be great, I promise, Nadine said. I'm really excited to see it, Talia added. I'm working on something myself. Professor Warbright is helping me with the arrangement. Nadine winced, though she tried to hide it. You okay? I asked her. She forced a smile. It's nothing, just a bad flare-up. My back is killing me, but I'll be fine. Get your hands off of me! Someone shouted. The main foyer went silent as everyone turned to look. My stomach twisted. Two Miriamic police officers dragged Professor Daniels down the hall. Three others followed, their hands on their wands like they expected they might have to use them. Professor Daniels struggled against their hold, but they were a lot bigger and stronger than she was. Her brown hair flew in all directions, and her Bengal cat yowled wildly as it followed behind her. Tears streamed down Professor Daniels' face. I'm telling you, I didn't do anything, she cried. Why are you? Ow! Talia's voice shook. What's going on? Nadine's face had gone paper white. I have no idea. Let's find out, I said. I walked straight up to the police officers and stepped in front of them. They both frowned when they noticed my approach. This is unnecessary. Can't you see you're hurting her? Out of the way, kid. The one with the dark beard growled. I noticed his uniform said Officer Baker. This doesn't concern you. I crossed my arms. She's my journalism professor. I think her students deserve to know what's happening. Lucas, please stay out of this, Professor Daniels begged. I said it's none of your business, Officer Baker snapped. Get out of the way or you'll be arrested next. Nadine stepped up beside me. I demand to know what's going on. Officer Baker smirked. You'll want to bring that up with the priestesses then, my dear. Don't call me that, Nadine snapped. I am a priestess. Tell me what's going on. You want to know what's going on, sweetheart? Officer Baker taunted. Leela Daniels here has been found guilty of murder. She'll be hanged tonight in the square at dusk. All the blood in my body drained to my toes, and a gasp traveled around the main foyer. This wasn't possible. Murder? I gaped. Who did she supposedly murder? Her own colleague. Officer Baker sneered. She killed Archibald Damon, and she'll be rightfully hanged for her treason. Professor Daniels began to wail. How could they possibly think she had anything to do with this? She didn't kill Professor Damon, Nadine protested. Who on earth would find her guilty of that? As a priestess, I demand you let her go. No can do, Officer Baker said. We have orders from the Imperium Council to bring her in immediately. I'm on the Imperium Council, Nadine shouted. Then you'll have to take this up with the other Imperium members, he said. Step aside before she gets hurt for real. It was a threat. He'd do whatever he had to arrest Professor Daniels, and we couldn't stand in his way. The officers began dragging her away. It's okay, Lucas. You have to let me go, Professor Daniels said. Don't worry about your assignment. It's in my desk, top right-hand drawer. Your substitute teacher will help you finish it. All we could do was stare as the officers dragged her out of the school. After a full minute, whispers began to rise within the main foyer. Grant turned to us. What are we going to do? Professor Daniels is innocent. 
Nadine's hands curled into fists. I'm going to talk to the Imperium Council now. I need to go to Professor Daniel's office, I said in a hushed whisper. I didn't hand in any assignment. There's something in there she wants me to find. Any idea what? Talia asked. She told me she was writing a piece on Nightshade, I said. It might be her research. Grant's face paled. You think someone could have targeted her because she was asking too many questions? We're going to find out, I promised. There must be something there that will prove her innocence. Otherwise, why would she want me to have it? We don't have much time. While Nadine took off toward Octavia Hall to talk to the priestesses, I made my way to Professor Daniel's office. People whispered in the hall. News had already spread about what happened. When I reached her classroom, the lights were still on, but her office at the back was shut. I tried the door, but it was locked. I muttered an incantation, but that didn't work. Whatever she was hiding in there must be important. I checked the table at the front of the room and found some paper clips, then used those to pick the lock the way Nadine had taught me. The door swung open and I hurried inside. I yanked open the top right-hand drawer. On top sat a voice recorder, and beneath that a thick file. It wasn't marked, but when I flipped it open I saw that it was filled with endless notes, interviews, news clippings, and more, all tying back to Nightshade. I subconjured the recorder and the file, then left the room, locking the door behind me. I just barely shut the door when I heard the sound of footsteps approaching. I quickly ducked behind one of the tables in the back of the room. Heels clicked on the floor, and I peeked beneath the chairs to see three pairs of feet. I don't know what you think you'll find, Headmistress Verla said. Layla Daniels was one of our best professors. Surely she can't be involved. We're unable to discuss specifics, a deep voice replied. All we can tell you is that we have a warrant to confiscate all her belongings. I dared to peek over the table. Headmistress Verla led two officers across the room. They were different from the ones who dragged Professor Daniels away, but they had the same bulky build. Verla conjured a set of keys and unlocked the door. Very well, Verla said, though she didn't sound happy about it. Let me know if there's anything else I can do to help your investigation. The three of them entered the office, and I scurried out of the classroom as fast as I could. I returned to my dorm room, my heart racing. I immediately conjured the file and began shuffling through her notes. I pored over them the rest of the afternoon, looking for anything that could prove her innocence. Professor Daniels had learned a lot about Nightshade, but there wasn't much here I didn't already know. I listened to her interviews, and it became clear that she was close to exposing Magnus Knight, though I didn't think she'd figured out the depth of his involvement. None of her notes pointed to him as the man behind Professor Damon's murder. If they had, I could present the evidence to the council and exonerate her. My phone buzzed. I hadn't realized how much time had passed. I was so engrossed in finding answers that when I looked up, I noticed the sun was already dipping toward the trees. When I saw the name on the screen, my heart leapt. Nadine? I answered. The priestesses have outvoted me on everything, she fumed. They're refusing her a trial. They won't even let me see her. There has to be something we can do, I cried. There's nothing. Grant and Talia are trying to plead for more time with the judge, but the priestesses are above him. They've already made the call. We need to talk in person. Where do you want to meet? I asked. I don't know. Somewhere outside of Octavia Falls, please. I can't stand to be here right now. There's a scenic outlook not far from the town's perimeter, but it's outside the protection spell. I said. It's called Perry's Point. That's perfect, she said. I'll meet you there. I left Oliver sleeping in my dorm room and took Grant's car to Perry's Point. Nadine was already waiting for me. She leaned against her car with her arms crossed, holding her thick cardigan close to keep herself warm. 
I slammed on the brakes as I sped into the parking spot beside her. I leapt out of the car and rushed over to her. What happened? I demanded. Nadine's eyes were puffy and bloodshot. She looked like she was barely holding herself together. They found evidence at her house. Everything you'd need to cast the curse that killed Professor Damon. I gaped. How's that possible? She couldn't have done this. Nadine swallowed. That's not all they found. Lucas, they've tied her to nightshade production. Someone planted it, I insisted. Professor Daniels was researching nightshade. She couldn't be behind this. Nadine gritted her teeth. I know. That's not even the worst part. My blood turned to ice. What is it? Magnus Knight is gone, she growled. What? I shouted. I thought the Imperium Council was questioning him. They did, and they found nothing, she said. My hands curled into fists. So they question him, he takes off on, what, a business trip? And they just so happen to find another suspect two days later? They have to see this as a cover-up. She shook her head. They won't listen. They must be working with him to frame Professor Daniels, I stated firmly. It's too suspicious. I don't know, Lucas. They seem pretty damn upset about Nightshade. I think they're too afraid of it to think rationally. Magnus must have framed Professor Daniels, and the Imperium is jumping on their first opportunity to convict. They've gone too long without taking action. It's a political move to placate the coven. What about a trial? I demanded. They say the evidence is too substantial. They've voted to hang her, and there's nothing I can do. Even as a priestess, I'm the odd man out. So they'll hang Professor Daniels without a trial, but not Magnus Knight, who we know is the real killer? I demanded. We heard Professor Damon's testimony. It doesn't matter to them, Nadine raged. I thought the coven believed in forgiveness and second chances. Santos got a second chance when he married Mother Miriam, but that doesn't matter now. The Imperium doesn't care about the truth. All they can see is the story that's been manipulated for them. By Magnus, I snarled. He could have taken the croc with him when he left. Our chances of ending Nightshade and finding the alchemy wand could be ruined. Magnus had other people working for him, Nadine reminded me. I'm not sure he'd give up the operation unless he got caught. There's too much money in Nightshade. He must have left someone in charge, and we can't prove Magnus is involved until we uncover his entire operation. In the meantime, please tell me you've found something. I shook my head. Nothing to prove Professor Daniel's innocence. I'm starting to wonder if that's not why she sent me to her office. It's like she knew nothing could be done. Remember she told me to stay out of it? It's more like she wanted me to finish her work. Nadine sighed. Professor Daniels knew there was too much evidence against her and not enough time. Goddess, this is so wrong. If anyone else called for a hanging like this, they'd be the one headed for the gallows. But because it's the priestesses, they can do anything. And I'm sitting here completely powerless. There must be something we can do to stop this, I said. Nadine's hands trembled. We can't, Lucas. The sun is setting. She'll be hanged any minute. All I know is that the priestesses have gone too far, all in the name of protecting the coven. They couldn't find solid evidence on Magnus Knight, so they want someone else to blame. I can't work for people who will go to these lengths. You want to stop working for them? I asked. I have to. If this is what they're willing to do to their own people, we have to find the wands before they do. My grandpa took them from the council for a reason. Grammy said the council was corrupt back then. There may be new priestesses on the council, but nothing's changed. They're still bad. If this is what they'll do to exercise their power, I don't want to know what will happen when they possess all five of the oaken wands. 
You're right, I agreed. I reached out for her trembling hands. And I will be beside you every step of the way. Thank you. Nadine gazed out toward the setting sun. I can't be there when it happens, knowing there was nothing I could do to stop it. We'll stay here, I offered. All night, if we have to. She gazed up at me. Is there anywhere to sit down? I'm not feeling well. She was downplaying it, I could tell. She looked like hell, and her hands felt swollen when I touched them. I could only imagine what her joints felt like during today's flare-up. I pointed. There's a patch of rocks just through those trees. Thanks. Nadine leaned against me as I led her through the woods. The rocks were further than I remembered, but we eventually found them. Twilight fell over the forest and my stomach twisted. The thought of what was going on in the town below made my knees quake. I bet everyone in town was there, watching Professor Daniels hang. I sat beside Nadine. On instinct, I wrapped my arm around her shoulder. I expected her to draw away, but she sagged into me. Nadine sighed. I thought being a priestess would change things. I thought it would give me a stronger voice. But I've never felt so powerless before. I rubbed her arm. I'm so sorry. I wish there was more I could do. Like what? She asked. I wish I could at least make you feel better. It's not your responsibility to make me feel better, she said. I still want to, I replied. With everything, you're so independent. You never let people help you when you're not feeling well. I feel like shit now, she admitted. And I let you help me over to these rocks. It's a start, I said. But I don't have to be your boyfriend to care. Nadine sat up straighter to look me in the eyes. You know why we're not together. I didn't mean it like that, I said quickly. Her eyes searched mine, and I found myself breaking down, confessing all my feelings to her. I screwed up, and it may not mean much to you now, but I'm sorry for how I treated you. All I ever wanted was to protect you, and it felt like driving you away from me was the only way to save you from the Reaper's shadow curse. The things I said to you when we broke up, though, there's no excuse for it. Nadine dropped her gaze. It wasn't all your fault. I said things that I regret, too. That may be the case, but I need to take responsibility for my part in it, I said gently. I'm not going to lie, Nade. I want to be with you. I was shocked to hear the words come out of my mouth. I never intended to admit that to her, as much as it tore me to pieces. I didn't want to cause her any more pain. I know you've already made your decision, and I will always respect that. I promised. No matter how I feel, all I want is what's best for you. Please just know that I'm not trying to beg for you back. I know you don't want that. Nadine's gaze shifted over my features. I couldn't quite read her, but something in her eyes caught my heartstrings. Or do you? I asked carefully. She hesitated, and her voice came out as a whisper. I don't know. Sometimes I wish you would get on your knees and beg, but I know how things would turn out if you did. It's like I'm protecting myself. If you begged for me back, then I could blame you when we broke up again. It's stupid and immature, and I know that. But that's how I feel deep down. You don't have to feel ashamed of how you feel, I said gently. I'm glad you felt like you could share that with me. Nadine shook her head. You're making this really hard, you know. 
I thought I was trying to make this easier on you. That's the hard part, she replied. You're so sweet and understanding. Everything in my heart tells me to run back into your arms. But if I lost you again, I don't know if either of us could go through that. You're scared. I get that. I am too. If we got back together, I'd want it to be for good. I couldn't stand around waiting for the other shoe to drop. I can't do that either, she said. Which is why I think we might be better off as friends. At least then we know what the future holds. My heart became heavy in my chest, as if it had been replaced by a cinder block. I knew Nadine was right, but hearing her say it made me want to hurl. You're right, I said, mostly to convince myself. A relationship would just be a distraction. We can't have any distractions while we're trying to help the coven. This is too important. Or maybe... Nidian hesitated. Maybe this is the distraction. Trying to convince ourselves we're something we're not. I furrowed my brow. You're saying things would be easier if we got back together? She pressed her hand to her forehead. I don't know what I'm saying. Even if we get back together, the Reaper's Shadow Curse still stands. That's always going to be an issue. Ugh. I don't know what I want, Lucas. With what's going on in the square right now, maybe we need the distraction. I'm making no sense. I gently guided her face back toward mine so that I could look into her eyes. Hey, you're not alone here. I don't get any of this either. Her eyes glistened as she stared up at me. Lucas, I'm so scared of everything. The council, these wands, nightshade, us. I shook my head. You don't have to be afraid of us. Whatever happens, we'll make the decision together. Her voice cracked. I don't want to make any decisions right now. Then we won't, I said gently. All I needed right now was her, even if I didn't know what the future held for us. Nadine reached up, and her fingers caressed the side of my face. She was so warm, so welcome, and so familiar. I could melt right into her. Lucas, she whispered, like she was about to say something. But she never got the chance. Nadine leaned into me, and my breath caught when she paused halfway. It was an invitation. One that my brain didn't even process before I was saying yes to it. I closed the distance between us, and my lips connected with hers. I didn't know how it happened. One moment we were talking, and the next Nadine and I were making out. It never should have happened. And yet it felt like this moment was always meant to end this way. Warmth swelled in my chest, and a spark ignited in my heart. Desire for her burned through me unlike ever before. Regardless of what happened in the future, Nadine was mine in this moment, for as long as she let me have her. My hand came up to cradle the back of her neck, and I looped the other around her waist. Nadine sagged against me, and her tongue slid into my mouth. My pants tightened as her lips roamed over mine, and passion surged between us. Nadine shifted, and I guided her onto my lap until she was straddling me. Her hands ran through my hair, and I moaned as mine cupped her ass. She came up for air, but she pressed her body against mine. I began trailing kisses down her neck, and she gasped. How's this for a distraction? I asked as I buried my face into her collarbone. Goddess, she smelled so good. It's definitely working, she said through ragged breaths. Neat, I... I started, but she silenced me with a kiss. Shh, she said. Let's not talk about this. 
Nadine was vulnerable, and I knew it wasn't right to take advantage of her. I forced myself to draw away, and I took her hands in mine. Nade, we shouldn't. Don't try to save me from this, Lucas, she begged. I need to be sure of how I feel. I want this, if you do. I do, I said. Hell, I was desperate for it. I'd be an idiot to refuse her invitation. My lips connected with hers again, and we continued making out. If you were trying to convince me we shouldn't be together, you're kind of doing a shitty job of it. I teased. Let's not question my motives. She joked back. Motives? I smirked. What motives? Footsteps rustled in the distance. I jumped to my feet and grabbed Nadine's hand. Her features paled. No one knows we're out here. It might be just hikers, I said, hoping that's all it was, but dread twisted in my gut. Stay behind me. We walked toward the footsteps, my heart hammering. As we stepped out from behind the bushes, my pulse came to a full stop. A group of eight people stood before us, four boys and four girls around our age. A frizzy-haired girl walked beside a nervous-looking boy, and a blonde with huge glasses clung to the arm of a tall man with pale hair. At the head of the group was a redhead. She looked completely panicked, as if she was in a great hurry to save someone's life. One of the guys looked like he'd been beaten. A hugely muscular man dragged him along the ground, his face was covered in bruises, and his body appeared starving. The guy looked to be withering away against some kind of magical bonds he was bound by. I didn't know how I knew what they were, but I could sense it immediately. It must have been something magical inside of me that I didn't even know was there. I could practically smell the wet dog on the woven shifter and the reptilian scent of the dragon. Something rebelled inside of me, like I knew these individuals were my worst enemy. A battle orb formed in my hand. Get back, Nade! It's a group of fucking fey! The group came to an abrupt halt, and several of them stared at me like a deer in the headlights. The girls threw their hands up in surrender. I didn't trust them. Fey in Octavia Falls? They should know better than to come here. We're not here to harm you, the frizzy-haired girl said quickly. We need help. Yeah? I challenged. Then what did you do to that guy? The one who looked beaten convulsed. He frothed at the mouth, seething to escape. Something was dreadfully wrong with him. I felt it in my gut. He's been possessed, she replied desperately. We've been told there's a witch who can save him. I narrowed my eyes. Why should we believe you're not invading? There's eight of you. The biggest, burliest guy spoke. He had to be the dragon shifter. Yeah, we might have been able to do this without everyone coming along. The fiery redhead took charge. Her accent was soothing to me. She had to be American like us. Strange for a fay. What are your names? I opened my mouth, but Nadine spoke first. Nadine and Lucas. I scowled at her. She didn't know how dangerous the Fae could be. She shouldn't be giving them our names. Nadine, Lucas, the redhead repeated. My name is Emma. This is my mate, Ethan. He's been possessed by a forest demon. She gestured to the agonized man writhing against the ground in pain. Something in my chest twinged. Demons were not to be messed with. Every witch knew that. If she was telling the truth, this guy could be hours away from death. Emma pleaded with us. He's in the final stages of possession. The demon's totally taken over his body. The demon's being held by a binding spell, but it won't keep him contained forever. This was dangerous. Way too dangerous to get involved in. I wanted no part in it. If he's that far gone, nobody can help him, I said. Tears pricked at Emma's eyes. 
There's a witch there that might be able to save him, but she lives in town. And as Faye, we can't cross the ward. If you can take it down for us, just for a second, we might be able to save his life. My stomach sank. The way her voice shook. Nobody could fake that. This girl was about to lose her mate. And fairy or not, she needed our help. But letting them through the barrier would put our whole town in jeopardy. I glanced to Nadine, and she shot me a worried expression. Who do you want to see? Nadine asked. Hattie, Emma replied. I tried not to let my emotions show, but I was sure she noticed that I recognized the name. We couldn't risk this. You're a fae. You're obviously lying. This has to be a trap. Nadine grabbed my arm. Lucas, if this man's dying, we have to help. She obviously didn't know what we were dealing with. I turned to her. Do you know how many witches have died because of Fay? We don't have to do anything. Emma's voice cracked. Please, I don't care that you're a witch. Only if you can do something to save my mate. The coven is our only hope. Wouldn't you do anything to save the person you love? Nadine looked at me. It wasn't hard to read the look in her eyes. She was pleading with me, begging me to let her help them. She couldn't stand there and watch someone suffer if she could do something about it. And she could help. Nadine could control the protection spell and let them through, since she was a priestess now. Had the Fae run into anyone else tonight, there was nothing any witch or warlock could do to help. This guy didn't look like he had enough time left for us to run and get Hattie and bring her back to Perry's Point. He'd be long gone by that point. But they hadn't run into just any witch. The Fae had found Nadine. It was almost like fate had led us here tonight. Maybe this was our way to help someone when we couldn't help Professor Daniels. Fine. I finally agreed. But if this is a trap, don't blame us when all hell comes down on you. Trust us, the dragon shifter said. We don't want to be here any longer than you do. We wouldn't be asking witches for help if we hadn't exhausted every other option. Follow me, Nadine said. She went on ahead, but I hung back, following the group from behind. I had to keep an eye on every single one of them. No matter how much I wanted to help this guy, I didn't trust the Fae. This could still be a trick. We reached the edge of the boundary. Though we couldn't see the ward, Nadine must have been able to feel it. She lifted her palms, and a small area around the ward began to glow. It appeared as a shimmering tear, as if she'd pulled back a curtain to let them inside. Here, Nadine said. This will get you inside. Can we get out once we leave? The frizzy-haired girl asked timidly. I cleared my throat. There was only one way we could help them with that. The hole in the ward will last until morning. Once that happens, you're on your own. The dragon shifter stepped past the ward. Trust me, the last thing we want to be is trapped inside a witch village. We'll be gone long before sunrise. Emma followed him. You guys want money or something? Nadine shook her head. We're just trying to help. Pay us back later. I grumbled internally. Nadine should know better than to make a deal with the Fae. But she didn't. She hadn't been taught a thing about them. I really had to sit her down and instruct her on these things. Emma nodded like we had a deal. Where can we find Hattie? I lowered my voice. She lives in an apartment above her shop. The place is called the Jolly Pumpkin. It should be pretty deserted. Everyone's at some big event on the other side of town. I didn't tell them what was really happening. How could I admit what our own people were doing? That witches were hanging each other? If you're lucky, you should get in and out unseen. Good luck. Just looking at their possessed friend made my skin crawl. Faye or not, I really hoped Hattie could help them. 
or this guy was going to be dead before morning. The Fay took off toward town, and Nadine turned to me. She pulled her cardigan around herself and shivered. I did the right thing, didn't I? I watched the Fay go until they disappeared into the trees. I don't know, I admitted. I've been taught my whole life not to trust the Fay, but right now I don't even trust our own people. I guess we'll find out. That whole thing was weird. At least if Hattie can help them, we saved one person tonight, Nadine whispered. She took a step forward, then winced. I reached out to catch her, and she steadied herself against me. Your flare-up's getting worse, isn't it? I asked. She nodded. Can you take me back to my dorm? I don't know if I can drive. Yeah, of course. I helped Nadine back to the parking lot and into the passenger seat of Grant's car. We would come back another day and pick up her car. When we got back to the school, it was practically abandoned. Everyone was either at the square to watch the hanging or hiding from it in their rooms. Grant and Talia weren't back yet, and I knew they must have gone to watch. It was horrifying to even think of being there right now. Isa gave a happy meow when we returned. I helped Nadine into bed, then stripped off her shoes. Can I get you anything? Water or your meds? I can manage my meds, she said. I need to use the bathroom anyway. I helped her stand. As soon as she shut the door to the bathroom, I sank into the couch. This night had been wild, in more ways than one, but the brief high we'd experienced couldn't make up for the rest of it. None of it felt quite real. Isa must have noticed my unease because she jumped onto the couch beside me and nudged me until I scratched her behind the ears. That didn't satisfy her, though. She kept pawing at me and meowing, like she was trying to get my attention. After several long minutes of silence, the door to the bathroom opened. Nadine gingerly stepped into the room. When I caught sight of her, my stomach plummeted from my abdomen. The worry in her eyes was horrifying. What's wrong, Nade? I demanded, shooting to my feet. Her bottom lip quivered. Something's wrong, Lucas. This is more than just a flare-up. I immediately conjured my phone. I'll call the infirmary and let them know we're coming. She shook her head, and my stomach bottomed out. I need to go to the emergency room, now. Chapter 16 Nadine. Anxiety tangled in my gut. When I saw the foam in my urine, I knew something was seriously wrong. I'd been stupid enough to write my pain off as a bad flare-up. This was so much worse. I felt like I was dreaming when we entered the hospital. Lucas tried to talk to me, but I had no idea what he was saying. He must have called Grammy, because she showed up shortly after and helped fill out my paperwork. Isa curled up on my feet when I was admitted into a room. She looked really worried. We're going to get you an answer as soon as possible, the doctor promised. I'll call your rheumatologist right away. I barely processed what he said over the ringing in my ears. I couldn't remember much of what happened before Dr. Yonker arrived. He was dressed in street clothes, with a lab coat thrown over them. He must have already been finished for the day and rushed back to the hospital to care for me. We're going to run a few tests, Dr. Yonker told me. Grammy stood at my bedside. Do you have any idea what's going on? Dr. Yonker frowned. I noticed something in his eyes that worried me to my very core. He suspected something but he wasn't ready to say it out loud. This was bad. We're going to get you an answer as soon as possible. Hours passed while we waited for my test results. I fell asleep and didn't wake until after sunrise. Lucas gently shook me awake the next morning. Dr. Yonker has your results. 
I feared the worst. Grammy must have, too, because she nodded her hands in her lap. Dr. Yonker approached my bedside with another doctor in tow. Do you know what's wrong with me? I asked him. He drew a deep breath. We're going to have to run some more tests to know for sure. Right now, all we know is that your kidneys aren't functioning properly. This is Dr. Anna Tracy. She's a nephrologist, and she's here to help. My swollen hands trembled. A nephrologist? You're a kidney disease specialist. Is that what's wrong with me? I have kidney disease? I knew the statistics. They'd frightened me for years. Around half of lupus patients developed kidney problems due to the disease attacking our kidney cells. Goddess, let it be anything else. I wasn't ready for another life-altering diagnosis. We'll need to take a kidney biopsy to be sure of anything, Dr. Tracy said gently. I glanced between Grammy and Lucas, as if they could provide me with something, anything, to explain what was going on. They tried to hide it, but I saw the worry in their eyes. When can we do the biopsy? I asked. I'd like to do it immediately, Dr. Tracy said. Given your condition, we'll want to expedite the test results. I hope to have an answer for you in the next 24 hours. It felt like too long, yet not nearly long enough to process what was happening. I'd had lupus for years, and my symptoms had been progressively getting worse. But this felt like it came out of nowhere. Okay, let's do the biopsy, I said. Dr. Tracy nodded. We'll get prepped right away. You're going to be okay, Nadine, Dr. Yonker promised. I've worked with lupus patients before, and they've always pulled through. What if I don't? I wanted to ask, but I couldn't. As hard as it was right now, I wanted to believe him. I reached for Lucas's hand when the doctors left the room. You should go home, I said. It's going to be a while before they have my results back. Lucas shook his head. He wore a mask of strength, but I could see through it. You shouldn't be alone right now. I'm not going anywhere. As much as there was a part of me that just wanted to be alone to process this, a bigger part of me was grateful to have him here. I turned toward Grammy. You've been here all night. You should get some sleep. I want to help, Grammy protested. Goddess, all I wanted to do was cry, and for some reason, I couldn't do it in front of her. I could only fall apart in front of Lucas. I could use some help with Issa, I admitted. She hasn't eaten since last night, and she could probably use a litter box. Grammy seemed thrilled to help. Issa, on the other hand, didn't want to leave my side. After a while, Grammy managed to drag Issa out of the room. The door clicked shut, and silence settled between Lucas and me. A lump rose in my throat. I could hardly breathe as I stared at him. I'm scared, Lucas. I know, Nade, he said gently. But you have good doctors. They're going to help you fix this. What if they can't? My voice cracked. They're going to, he insisted. I shook my head. You can't know that. I'm terrified that my kidneys are shutting down and I'm going to die. And I feel so guilty even being afraid of that. I mean, we know there's life after death. So why am I so afraid of dying? Lucas placed his hand on mine. You're not afraid of death, Nadine. You're afraid to leave this earth before you finish everything you came here to do. I don't even know what that is. I thought my purpose was to protect the coven, but I'm already failing at that. Hey, Nade, Lucas said firmly, shaking my hand a little until I looked at him. His gaze was so comforting. I will never be able to say I understand what you're going through right now, but I know fear better than any other emotion. I know what it's like for the corners of your vision to blur, 
I know the taste of copper in your mouth and how your hands and feet can turn ice cold. I know, and I can help you. I will be here for you every step of the way, if you'll let me. A sob broke from my chest, and tears streamed down my face. My whole body shook as I cried. Lucas leaned over me and pulled me into an embrace. I clung to him like he was my very life. He didn't say anything, just held me as I let my emotions pour out. I never thought I'd need Lucas the way I needed him right now. Finally, I caught my breath and I drew away. You have no idea how much I needed to hear that right now. Thank you for being here for me. He nodded, his eyes glistening. I'll always be here. It wasn't long after that before the doctors came in to explain the procedure. They would sedate me and insert a long needle into my back so they could grab a tissue sample of my kidney. It's going to be okay, Lucas promised me, but I was scared to death. Grammy returned with Issa, but I told her to go home and that I'd call her when I had the test results. Lucas refused to leave, though the doctors wouldn't let him stay in the room for the biopsy. I passed out the moment the sedative hit. I didn't know how much time had passed before I came to, but Lucas told me I'd only been gone an hour. I got you something, he said, conjuring a gift bag. You went down to the gift shop? I asked. You didn't have to. He shrugged. We need to kill some time while we wait for the test results. I opened the bag and smiled when I pulled out a gorgeous puzzle. The artwork was of a black cat with green eyes and the moon shining behind her. It was the first time I'd smiled in over 24 hours. Issa eyed the artwork curiously. I turned the puzzle toward her. It kind of looks like you, doesn't it, girl? Thank you, Lucas. It was no big deal, he said, but he was a liar. It meant everything right now. The doctor said I could go home while I waited, but I insisted I wasn't going anywhere until I had answers. I was too much of a nervous wreck anyway. Lucas and I put together the puzzle, chatting about our classes. Did I ever tell you about the time Samantha accidentally conjured a dildo in my first semester conjuring class? Lucas asked. I chuckled as I fitted two pieces of the puzzle together. No, but I want to hear about it. That's basically the whole story, he laughed. She was practicing conjuring and everything spilled out of her stash. You should have seen our professor's face when he saw it. It's like he didn't know what it was at first. You could see the second it hit him. He dismissed class early. I smirked. Maybe he thought it was a wand. Lucas chuckled at my joke. Oh, speaking of which, have I shown you mine? I found one for wand theory. He conjured his wand and handed it to me. I turned it over in my hands. It was simple, but elegant. A light wooden wand with a twisted handle. When I looked closer, I noticed intricate swirling designs in the blade that I didn't see at first. It suits you. He shrugged as he took it back. It works. You know you're missing wand theory right now to do this puzzle, I pointed out. Lucas shook his head. I'm not missing class for this puzzle. I'm missing class for you. My face heated. A silent beat passed between us, and Lucas eyed me curiously. What is it? I drew a deep breath. It's strange. My health is nothing but shit, and I haven't felt this normal in a long time. Thank you for staying and taking my mind off things. This is... nice. Lucas offered me a kind smile. He looked like he was about to say something, but he must have stopped himself. He glanced down to the puzzle and grabbed for the last piece before fitting it into the center of the puzzle. There, he said, admiring our work. Issa stood on my lap and stared down at the puzzle. She batted at it with her paw and meowed like she feared the cat was trapped inside the painting. 
I snickered. I don't think Issa's pleased. No, I... Lucas started, but he cut off when a knock came at the door. We both turned to see Dr. Yonker and Dr. Tracy enter the room. My heart immediately began hammering. Well, Nadine, Dr. Tracy said gently, we have good news and bad news. My stomach twisted. Please just tell me what's wrong. Dr. Yonker drew a deep breath. The good news is that we have a diagnosis, and it's treatable. I should have felt relieved to hear that, but I didn't. I nodded my hands in my lap. What's the bad news? A silent beat passed, and every inch of my body began to tremble. It was the same life-altering silence I experienced when I was diagnosed with lupus. It's lupus nephritis. Dr. Yonker said, shattering my world with those three simple words. It's a condition? I know what lupus nephritis is, I said, my voice cracking. Tears beaded in my eyes, and I clutched the star necklace I wore. I'd come so far since my lupus diagnosis, and it seemed like none of it mattered anymore. What's lupus nephritis? Lucas said, his tone hollow. He could tell this was bad. It's kidney failure in lupus patients, Dr. Yonker explained. It's caused by Nadine's immune system attacking her kidney tissue. How bad is it? I rasped. Dr. Tracy shot a glance at Dr. Yonker, and I knew it was worse than I imagined. Nadine, you have class 5 lupus nephritis. I gasped for breath, because it felt like I'd just been punched in the stomach. That sounds bad. Lucas's voice wavered. What's class five? There are six classes, or stages, Dr. Yonker explained. Class five is characterized by immune deposits in the kidneys. Essentially, Nadine's kidneys are damaged, and they're unable to filter her blood properly. How, how come we didn't catch it sooner? I stammered. It can develop very quickly. Dr. Yonker started, but I didn't hear the rest of what he said. All I could hear was class five, repeating over and over in my head. You said it can be treated, I blurted. How? We're going to start you on dialysis immediately, and you'll be placed on the transplant list. Dr. Tracy said. Lucas gaped. She'll get better, right? Her kidneys can heal. She'll recover. Dr. Tracy's features turned sad. Unfortunately, with the damage her lupus has already done to her kidneys, Nadine's condition can only be reversed through a kidney transplant. In the meantime, she'll attend dialysis three times per week. Even patients who have been on dialysis for years lead normal lives. I couldn't move or speak. All I could do was sit and stare at the wall, absorbing the news. This is an opportunity, Nadine, Dr. Yonker insisted. A transplant will likely clear up all your lupus symptoms. How likely? Lucas demanded. There's a 3 to 5% chance her lupus would return following a transplant, Dr. Yonker said. But I have to literally swap out my organs, I cried. I couldn't wrap my head around the idea of this surgery. Lucas shot to his feet. I'll do it. I furrowed my brow at him. You'll do what? I'll get tested, he said firmly, as if his mind was already made up. If I'm a match, I'll do it. I'll give you my kidney. I grabbed his hand. Lucas, no! He yanked his hand from my grasp. Why not? I only need one kidney. You're probably not even a match, I insisted. What if I am? He asked. I want to at least get tested. Nade, this could be life-changing for you. I know. My voice cracked. 
but to ask you to do this for me. You didn't ask. I offered. He looked to Dr. Tracy. How soon can we know? The process usually takes several months, she said. You expedited Nadine's biopsy results, Lucas pointed out. Can't you expedite these tests? We want to be certain that everything will work out before undergoing such a large procedure, Dr. Tracy stated gently. You'll have to undergo blood tests, a psych evaluation. It's okay, Lucas cut in. I'll do anything, whatever it takes. A smile touched Dr. Tracy's lips. Very well. You're a very lucky girl, Nadine. If you two are a match, you might have a new kidney in just a few short months. I hope so, Lucas said. As soon as the doctors left the room, he turned to me. Lucas, I started to say, but I was at a loss for words. I didn't know whether to thank him or try to convince him this wasn't going to work out. I couldn't stand for us to get our hopes up if he wasn't a match. He squeezed my hand. It's going to be okay. I know this is really scary right now, but I'm not going to let anything bad happen to you. Understand? I hesitated. Yes, I finally said. I had to believe him, because I couldn't bear to accept the alternative. Nearly a week passed, and I was still trying to process my diagnosis. Lucas and I hadn't spoken about our relationship all week, and neither of us mentioned the moment we'd shared at Perry's Point. All conversation had halted, unless it involved my health. I wasn't sure I could handle anything else right now, anyway. Talia came with me to the hospital that weekend. I want to see what your dialysis is like, she said. It's boring, I insisted. I have to sit in a room attached to a machine for four hours at a time, three times per week. So let me keep you company, she offered. It was nice of her to care so much, so I brought her along. Isa and Gus stayed in our dorm room, because Isa got uneasy when she had to sit here for hours. So this is your artificial kidney, Talia said thoughtfully as she eyed the machine that filtered my blood. That's it. It's nothing fancy, I told her while the nurse hooked the tubes up to my arm. Nothing fancy, she teased. Nadine, one of your organs is a machine. You're part robot. I chuckled. I'm bionic? A bionic werewolf, she laughed. You know, because lupus is Latin for werewolf? It was a dumb joke. No, it's cool, I told her. I can be a werewolf. I'm just glad the dialysis is helping. I'm feeling so much better. Talia eyed me curiously, but she waited until the nurse left the room to speak up. Are you sure you're doing better? I know you won't admit it, but I can tell that you're scared. I dropped my gaze. I feel better physically, but I am scared. I know I can live a normal life on dialysis, but people die all the time waiting to reach the top of the transplant list. It's just, what if dialysis isn't enough? It will be enough, Talia insisted. It has to be. We're all here for you, and we're going to fight to get you whatever care you need. I shot her a smile. Thanks, Tal. It means a lot. She eyed the machine. So, how does this all work? I pointed to one of the tubes in my arm. This is the arterial line. My blood leaves through this tube and gets filtered by the dialysis machine. Once it's clean, it goes back into my veins through the venous line, here. What does it feel like? She asked. I shrugged. Not much, really. The worst part is the needles. Oh, and my diet. I can't eat whatever I want to anymore. I'm supposed to eat more protein and less salt. What do you normally do during your dialysis? I've had plenty of time to learn my Rubik's Cube, and I can solve it pretty quickly. Sometimes I do puzzles and... ugh, homework. Usually it's no fun, but maybe you can help. 
There's one full moon before the end of the semester. I'm supposed to perform a ritual for my moonology class, but I don't know what to do. She pressed her lips together. Well, tonight is the last quarter moon. That's a good time for releasing energy and letting go. Is there anything you need to let go of? I dropped my gaze. Maybe. Like what? She asked. I hated to admit it, but I knew I could confide in Talia. I've been holding on to all this resentment, and it's done nothing but hurt me. Resentment towards who? Myself, I admitted. When the doctors told me I needed a transplant, I couldn't help but resent myself, resent my choices. Like, maybe if I ate healthier, or didn't push myself so hard, I could have done something to prevent this. You did nothing wrong, Talia assured me. I sighed. I know that logically, but I can't convince myself of it. I just feel like I'm to blame for what's happening to me. It's no one's fault. I know, but it's not just that either, I continued. Lucas wants to give me his kidney, if we're a match. Part of me hopes that we aren't, because I don't know if I could take it. Talia furrowed her brow. What do you mean? I nodded my hands in my lap, because I didn't know how to explain it. Ever since we broke up, I think I resented him. On some level, I blamed him, even though I knew the breakup was mutual. I can't help but think that I'm drinking poison and hoping it will punish him. You're still hurt, Talia stated. Yes, I admitted. We talked a little about our relationship, but then I was in the hospital, and we haven't talked about it since. We agreed not to make any decisions yet, but we need to decide eventually. The thing is, I can't seem to find a reason to be apart anymore. So why am I not running into the arms of the man I love? I froze. I hadn't meant for that last part to slip out. It's been almost six months, Talia pointed out. If you still love him. Oh, goddess, I sighed. I didn't realize how much I still love him until I said that out loud. A smile spread across Talia's face. I think you have your answer for your ceremony. It sounds like you have a lot of reflecting to do. You're right, I said, feeling as if the answer was clearer than ever. Thanks for letting me talk it out with you. Any time. The sun had set by the time I finished dialysis. I stopped by the school library to check out a spell book. I nervously flipped through the book until I found a spell that was marked as one of the strongest releasing ceremonies in the coven. The problem? I needed Lucas to perform it. I started flipping through other pages. To hell with that. I'd find a simpler spell and... I stopped dead. This wasn't just about my class assignment. This was about my life. If Lucas and I were a match, I wasn't going to be able to accept his kidney with this resentment hanging over me. If I truly wanted to let go, I couldn't take the easy route. I had to use the most powerful spell in the book. I clutched the spell book tight to my chest and navigated the halls. Issa followed alongside me. She noticed Oliver and ran ahead of me down the hall. Oliver looked delighted to see her and tackled her to the ground. Lucas smirked as he stepped around the cats. Hey, Nate. How are you feeling? Pretty good, I said. I had dialysis today. That's great, he replied, shoving his hands into his jeans pockets. I'm glad it's helping. Tension filled the air. I couldn't bring myself to ask him to help me with the ceremony but I sensed he had something to say, too. What is it? I asked. Lucas sighed. I know the doctor said it could take months, but I hope we get an answer soon about the transplant. I fidgeted with the pages of the spell book. I actually wanted to talk to you about that. Worry filled his eyes. Did they tell you something? No, I said quickly. 
Besides, they'd call you first if they knew anything, since you are the donor. It's just... Can we go somewhere to talk? Yeah, anywhere, Lucas said. I glanced to Issa and Oliver, who were wrestling in the middle of the hall. Issa was winning. Let's leave the cats, I suggested. I want to be alone. Sure, but Nadine, you're scaring me. Don't be scared, I reassured him. It's not like that. Can you at least tell me what's going on? He asked. I glanced around the hall, and several people were passing through. I need help with some homework, I told him vaguely. He eyed me curiously, but he followed. I conjured a coat and slipped it on, before we left the school and snuck into the forest. It was chilly out, and snow dusted the ground. But when Lucas and I wanted to be alone, there was only one place to go. After several minutes of walking, we emerged into a clearing. The abandoned mansion we'd visited so many times before stood in front of us. I shivered. You okay? Lucas asked. I'm just cold, I said. Let's get inside and start a fire. I felt better once we were inside, but my stomach dropped when I saw all the wood beside the fireplace was gone. I must have used it all up the last time I was here, I said. Lucas eyed me curiously. Do you come here often? I shrugged. More than I'll ever admit. I've come a few times. Lucas cocked his head. I think there's a pile of wood in the master bedroom. Let's go check. For as many times as I'd been inside this mansion, I hadn't really explored it. It was falling apart, and I feared one wrong move would bring the whole room down on us. I'd never been upstairs, because the staircase didn't look safe. But when I stepped into that master bedroom, I felt a sense of relief wash over me. The room had long been abandoned, but there was happiness and warmth here. A large four-poster bed was set against one wall, with a chaise at the foot of it. Long black curtains covered the ornate windows, but the fabric had been torn through the years. A rusted chandelier that looked like it had been gorgeous in its prime hung above us. Here we go, Lucas said, hurrying over to the fireplace. We found a small stack of wood there, and he lit it. He performed a quick cleansing spell on the area, and the dust swept out of the room. Thank you, I told him, picking at the worn corner of the spell book. So what's your homework? He gestured to the book in my arms, but he looked skeptical, like he knew it was more than just a homework assignment. I'm supposed to perform a ritual for my moonology class, but I can't do it myself. He tilted his head. You need my help? Why? I swallowed the lump in my throat. Because the ritual is for you. Well, not for you, exactly. About you, maybe? For both of us? I was rambling, and Lucas noticed. Can I see? He reached for the spell book and gently took it from my hands. It's a type of forgiveness spell. He flipped to the page that I'd bookmarked. His eyebrows knitted as he read over the spell, and I bit my lower lip. Finally, he lifted his gaze. You're sure you want to do this? Yes, I said confidently. There's a lot I haven't said, a lot I haven't even admitted to myself. And I think we both deserve to hear it said out loud. Lucas handed the spell book back. Okay, I'll help you, but I want to do it too, to share how I feel about you. I smiled up at him. I'll listen. Then let's get started. Lucas gestured to the area in front of the fireplace, and we sat on the floor facing each other. The fire was warm and cozy. So why did I feel so cold? I conjured a short pillar candle. The spellbook says we have to light it together. 
Lucas placed his hands over mine so that we were both cupping the candle. Okay, together. We tilted the candle until the wick pointed toward the flames in the fireplace. The wick lit, and I set the candle between us. Next, I conjured a knife and pressed the blade to the end of my pointer finger, holding it above the flickering flame. Whoa! Lucas stopped me. What are you doing, Nade? I glanced at the spell book. It's part of the spell. Pour your heart out over the flame. I have to bleed onto the wick while I confess my feelings, until the flame goes out. No, that's blood magic, Lucas explained. This spell is using a metaphor. Pour your heart out means to express your feelings. Don't hold anything back. You're supposed to do that until the candle burns out. I set the knife aside. Oh, so the candle is just giving me a time limit? Yes, Lucas said. I breathed a sigh of relief. Okay, that makes things a little easier. Or not. Sharing your feelings is never easy, Nade, Lucas said gently. But that doesn't mean it isn't good for you. If I've learned anything over these last few months, it's that this shit is powerful. I chuckled nervously. Well, it's a spell. All magic is powerful. So are your words and your emotions, Lucas said. Sometimes that's even more powerful than magic. You say that like you've been through something like this before, I remarked. He nodded. I did a ritual last month, a lot like this one. I didn't use magic, but it was the most powerful thing I'd ever done. My breath quivered as I stared into his eyes. They were so gentle and honest. I couldn't help but feel safe in his presence. Then show me how, I begged. I can do that, he offered. Lucas leaned over to take my hands in his. They warmed my fingers more than the fire possibly could. Nadine, I've spent so much time stuck in the past, wondering how things would have turned out differently if I'd just changed one tiny thing. If I'd gotten to Eric sooner, would he still be alive? If I heard the Imperium Council follow us into the trees, would your secret still be safe? If I'd bottled up my feelings that night on the catwalk, would we have broken up? I can never go back and change what I said to you or how I treated you. But I can choose to accept that the past cannot be changed. No amount of worrying can possibly take me back in time. I'm done living there. I'm ready to look toward the future. You say it so elegantly. I don't even know where to go from there, I admitted. I spent the summer blaming you when I deserved the blame. But maybe that's the problem, thinking there's someone to blame. Maybe none of this is anyone's fault. Maybe it's not good or bad, but it just is. I thought there was no way to fix what we'd broken, and that relationship should be easier than this, but I didn't even try. I thought that you couldn't accept me, darkness and all, but you've done nothing but love me. Part of me couldn't handle the way that you showed it. Because I worshipped you, Lucas stated. That's a problem. Loving you in that way was intense and unfair. You wanted a partner, and I didn't know how to be that for you back then. But you know now? I asked my heart fluttering. I'm trying, Lucas said. I understand it better now, and I'll do my best to keep learning. I'm seeing a therapist. That shocked me. I didn't know that. Well, I didn't tell you, Lucas said. I've been going to therapy ever since I got out of the hospital. I'm really proud of you, I didn't think I'd ever uttered a truer statement. I have a lot to learn, too, about myself and about being in a relationship. I'm not perfect by any means, and I know I never will be, but I can at least try to be a better person every day. 
Lucas chuckled under his breath. What is it? I asked. He smirked in a way that made me swoon. You're so perfectly imperfect, Nade. All your imperfections and flaws make you human. That's why I must accept you, darkness and all. I love that you want to be a better person. I love that about you, too, I told him. I can see how much you've changed, and it's like night and day. I thought I came here tonight to forgive you, but I don't even know anymore what I have to forgive you for. I think I came here to forgive myself, and I can't think of anyone better to pour my heart out to than to you. Lucas squeezed my hand. Me either. Thank you for trusting me so much. Of course, I said. Everyone should trust their partner. Lucas went rigid, and I realized what I said. I, I didn't mean, I stammered. I don't know what I meant by that. Lucas's features turned thoughtful. You said it, though, so it must mean something. Nade, do you still think of me as your boyfriend? No. I furrowed my brow because I had thoroughly confused myself. Maybe I do? I wonder if a part of me expects us to get back together someday. Like our breakup was nothing more than a break. A tiny little blip on the map. It makes no sense, because a few months ago I was certain we would never get back together. But every time I see you... Lucas eyed me curiously. Yes? I drew a deep breath, but it didn't stop the tears from rising to my eyes. Lucas, you offered to give me your kidney. You love me more than I can ever fully comprehend, and as much as I've told myself I can't be with you, my heart refuses to believe that I don't love you. I have been asking myself every day why we can't get back together, and I have yet to come up with a single reason. A month ago, we had all kinds of reasons, Lucas pointed out. Yeah, we had all these reasons to stay apart, but what about all the reasons to be together? I asked. His breath wavered. Like what? Like the way that you support me in anything I go through, I said. You believe in me in a way that nobody else does. When I told Grant I was going to be a detective and a priestess, he didn't think I could be both. When I told you that, you didn't even question it. You've never questioned how I'm going to achieve things. Your only question is to ask what you can do to help. How? Did you ever wonder why Grant and I only had one date? A bit, yeah, Lucas admitted. Grant is one of my best friends. He's a total freaking sweetheart, but I'm not, I said. Grant wants to sit in the background and avoid conflict, which is fine. He's helping us decipher the nightshade formula. But I'm out there following drug dealers and asking questions, and I need someone by my side to do that with me. Someone who's willing to get involved in things that are dangerous. If I could choose anyone, I'd want it to be you. Because you support me, and you challenge me. Right now, I can be totally open to you in ways that I never have with anyone else. You help me make sense of the world. Lucas's hands trembled. I agree. You have been patient with me in my own growth, and you never judged me for my depression. You broke me out of my shell, and I can never thank you enough for that. I think it's great that we reflect our issues back on each other so that we can grow. But the last time, it got too hard, and we broke up instead of working through our shit together. I was scared, I said. Being with you terrifies me, but nothing can compare to when I was sitting in that hospital room waiting for my kidney disease diagnosis. As scared as I am that I might lose you again, I'm even more afraid that I could die without you. I realize now that no matter what I'm going through, I want you there by my side. I want to be with you, and I want you back. Tears spilled from Lucas's lids and I thought for certain he was going to tell me he couldn't be there for me. 
not in the way I hoped. Instead, Lucas's voice cracked as he said, I thought I'd never hear you say that. His hands immediately left mine, and he grabbed my face. We rose to our knees as our lips connected in a passionate kiss. His fingers warmed my cheeks, and his cinnamon scent surrounded me. The whole room seemed to tilt around us, spinning unevenly as something more powerful than magic itself surged between us. The candle we'd lit continued to flicker. I carefully climbed over it and into his lap. Lucas grabbed my hips and rolled me onto a soft rug at the foot of the bed. I moaned as he hovered above me, planting passionate kisses on my lips over and over again. I wrapped my legs around his hips and yanked him closer. Goddess, Naid, he groaned. I've missed you so much. I've missed you too, I replied, desperately clinging on to him like I thought he might vanish at any moment. I love you. I'm sorry I let you go. Lucas's lips connected with mine again, silencing my apology. Shh, he whispered. None of that matters anymore. I wish I could make love to you. Nade, the curse. I know our limits, I said. I would never ask you to step past them. I just love you so much, and I wish you could feel what I do. I already do, Lucas whispered. His gaze dropped to the apex of my thighs. Besides, we don't have to cross any lines to make love. We collapsed onto the floor, breathing heavily. My pulse finally began to slow as I curled into him. I rested my head on his chest, enjoying the sound of his breath and his heartbeat against my ear. He wrapped his arms around me, sighing heavily. Even on this cold winter night, Lucas was so warm and his skin was soft against mine. I never wanted to draw away from him. I stared at his arm, tracing his veins with my finger and replaying everything that had just happened in my mind. Goddess, it was glorious. This is perfect, Lucas said breathlessly. It is. He stroked my shoulder with his thumb. Nade, if we're going to get back together, we need to agree on a few things. Anything, I said. Lucas stalled with a long breath. I need you to understand that even though I'm doing better, I'm still struggling with depression. Some days it hits me worse than others. I don't want us to run away again when things get hard. If we do this, I'm in it for good. That means that you need to be okay with me being sad, and I need to be okay with you being sad sometimes, too. I drew away and looked him in the eyes. That's fair. We're both sick in different ways, but we're going to be here for each other. We'll have to trade off. Lucas smirked. I get Mondays and Wednesdays. You can be sick the rest of the week. I sucked a breath between my teeth, trying not to laugh. Ooh, that's not going to work for me. I need Wednesdays, but you can have Thursdays. Lucas laughed, then pressed a kiss to the top of my head. Thursdays it is. We fell silent for a beat before I asked, Can I make a request? Of course, he replied gently. I paused, because I wasn't sure exactly how to word it. Finally, I said, I want to be able to rely on you for anything, but I don't think either of us can rely on each other for how we feel. You're right, Nade. I can't expect you to make me feel a certain way. Lucas squeezed me tighter to his chest. I feel amazing when I'm with you, but that's not your responsibility. It's my choice. All we can really do for each other is to support each other. And I will, I promised. I'll support you in anything. And I need to do the same. I need to support you in breaking the Reaper's shadow curse, if that's what you want. I furrowed my brow. But 
You've always been so against me even trying. You said it was too dangerous. That's my problem, not yours, he said. I just wanted to protect you, but holding you back isn't going to do you any good. I have to trust you with this. You're powerful, and I have to be okay with that. You think we can learn how to break it? I asked. The least we can do is try, he replied. I don't want you to have to sacrifice a thing for me. If we're going to get back together, I want you to have it all. Hell, I want it all. Marriage, kids, all of it, even if that scares me. I placed my hand on the side of his face. It scares me too, but with you by my side, I feel like I can do anything. You have no idea how much it means to have your support. Lucas hugged me closer to his chest. Always, Nade. I glanced at the candle to see that it had completely burned out. I snuggled closer to Lucas, and euphoria settled in my chest. Somehow, Lucas and I had managed to steal this perfect moment. We'd never stop stealing them. Even though everything else had gone wrong lately, this was right. We were together again, and nothing could ever break us apart. Chapter 17 Lucas After that night at the abandoned mansion, everything changed. I walked Nadine to class every day and kept her company during dialysis. Weeks passed, and it seemed like life couldn't get any better. We'd been researching the Reaper's shadow curse, but we wanted to get everything right before we tried breaking the curse. I was still gathering information. Our friends were thrilled to see us back together, and I didn't think we'd ever been happier. Nadine gifted me a handmade blanket for my birthday, and I wrote her a poem once a week and slid it under her door. But life couldn't stay perfect for long. Finals week was quickly approaching, and Octavia Falls looked different than ever before. Ever since the hanging, people had divided even further. The cafeteria seemed to be split by invisible lines that appeared out of nowhere. Nobody sat in groups outside of their caste. My friends and I hadn't hung out in public in weeks, because people stared and whispered every time we did, like we were to blame for what was happening. We'd all started getting takeout and hanging out in Nadine and Talia's room during our lunch hour. Thanks to my new journalism professor, who'd replaced Professor Daniels, I was now failing journalism ethics. He had a serious prejudice against anyone who wasn't a seer, and he definitely didn't like anyone from Mortana. I was passing through the main foyer after protection magic when I spotted my friends gathered in a corner. Oliver followed at my heels. Grant caught my eye and waved me over. He stood beside Talia, who was fidgeting. She bit her lower lip and glanced around. Mandy and Amy whispered lowly to one another. Miles stood with his arms crossed, glaring across the foyer like he was ready to start a fight with anyone who approached. Tate sat in one of the chairs, studying an open newspaper. She seemed so hyper-focused on it that she didn't even look up when I approached. What's up? I asked. Where's Nadine? Talia questioned immediately. Not with me. Last I saw her, she was headed back to her dorm room, I said. We were going to meet up in the library to study for wand theory, but to be honest, it sounded like she was having a hard day. Is everything okay? Nadine should be fine, Talia said. We should let her rest. We can tell her later. Tell her what? I asked. Talia shot Grant a worried look, then gazed back down to her hands. Something happened during my seer exam. What kind of something? I asked carefully. The Miriamic Police Department was there when I got there, Talia explained. My professor said they were helping monitor the exam. They must have thought people were cheating, because in the middle of the exam they stopped us and started searching people's stashes. They what? 
I demanded. Talia's voice shook. They lined us up against the wall and did some sort of spell. I've never seen it before. I didn't even know such a thing existed. A spell? I gaped. They forced a search on your stash? Talia nodded. Everything just came spilling out. I couldn't stop it. That's a huge violation of privacy, I growled. They're the police, she said. They have the right. Nothing about this is right, Grant said with a frown. Who's going to stop them? Talia challenged. It's not like any of us know a counterspell. Miles's features hardened as he listened. He turned toward Tate. Did you find anything yet? Tate chewed on her cheek as her eyes darted across the newspaper. It was like she was in a totally different world. She hadn't heard him. Mandy leaned over and snapped her fingers in front of Tate's face. Earth to Tate, what'd you find? Tate snapped out of it and shook her head. Sorry, I was in the zone. I can't find anything that would explain why they're doing this. There are no notices, no mandates, nothing. Shouldn't they have to tell us the police are coming in for our exams? Amy asked. I mean, how many of us are going to pass if we're nervous the police are watching? I pressed my lips together. What are they scared of? The Imperium wouldn't be ordering the police to attend our exams if they weren't looking for something. Please. We already know they're frightened about the waning, Mandy pointed out. Everyone is. Why target students? I asked. Why not? Grant scoffed. They already put a curfew on us. There isn't a single student strong enough to cause the waning, I said. What about a group of them? Miles asked. If someone's caught cheating, could that make them a suspect in the waning? It means they're willing to turn to forbidden magic. Or maybe it's not about the students, Amy added. Maybe they're watching our professors. Then why target us? Talia asked. Grant narrowed his eyes. Maybe they want to see how the professors react. Mandy chewed on the end of her fingernail. You think they're trying to see who will comply and who will fight against them? Grant shrugged. Maybe. Or maybe they're trying to scare the coven, I thought aloud. If you wanted to exercise your power and show off a new spell like this, where would you start? With the students, Talia said, sounding disgusted. We're still learning our magic, so we won't be able to fight against their spell, and they know we're going to be pissed about it. We're going to take this home to our parents, and everyone's going to hear about it. It's a publicity stunt, Tate sneered. Those bastards are... Tate cut off, and my friend's eyes all went wide. I turned around to see four police officers step into the main foyer. I recognized Officer Baker, one of the assholes who'd arrested Professor Daniels. He was partially responsible for her death. I half-wished he would hang for it himself. My hands curled into fists, and my nostrils flared. Talia grabbed my wrist and tugged on my arm. Don't do it, Lucas. We don't need to draw any attention to ourselves. Grant cleared his throat. I think we already have. The four police officers had spotted us and were making their way toward us. Act natural, Miles said under his breath. But the whole foyer had gone silent. All eyes watched as the officers approached us. Their heavy footsteps sounded like ominous drumbeats. Can we help you, officers? I asked when they stopped in front of us. Officer Baker narrowed his eyes at us. Mind telling us what's going on here? A study session? I said flatly. It's a bit unusual for so many different castes to study together, isn't it? He sneered. Not really. I replied, but my tone was less than friendly. Officer Baker narrowed his eyes. Are you talking back to me, kid? I shook my head, 
but I already wanted to throw a battle orb in this guy's face. No, sir. I don't like your sass, and I certainly don't like seeing all these different castes studying together. Something's not right. Baker sneered. I glanced between the officers and noticed various tattoos. But sir, you and your colleagues are all different castes. That's it. Officer Baker grabbed me and yanked my arm behind my back. I gasped as pain shot through my shoulder, and my friends jumped back in shock. Officer Baker shoved me against the wall, and Oliver hissed. I'm sick of your attitude. Search him. I didn't do anything! I shouted. He drove his elbow into my back, pinning me to the wall. My friends stared in shock. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the other officers twist their hands in a complicated manner. Their spell hit me like a punch to the gut. The air knocked out of my lungs, and belongings began to spill out of my stash, falling into a heap from out of nowhere. Panic swept through me. I had nothing incriminating on me. A jacket, blanket, my wallet, textbooks, my journal, and some other odd items. But this was a gross overreaction, and it had happened so fast. I couldn't wrap my head around what was happening. What if they had targeted me? What if they were planning to plant something in my things? I was pissed. This was far worse than when Professor Ward had forced me to conjure my belongings in class. That was ridiculous and uncalled for. But this? This was dehumanizing. A warlock's stash was his one piece of privacy that no one else could ever touch. Or so we thought. There was nothing I could do to stop this. Even when I pulled back, I couldn't overpower their spell. Look what I found, one of the officers said like he'd just hit the jackpot. What are you? I turned my head as far as I could, but Officer Baker still had me pinned to the wall. I saw the other officer lift my poetry journal. My stomach dropped as he opened the leather-bound book and began flipping through the pages so fast that they tore. That looks like a spell book, Officer Baker growled. Someone's been writing incantations between classes. So what if I was? I spat. We're encouraged to write our own incantations. Not if those spells are designed to hurt somebody. Officer Baker said, as if accusing me of something. They're not incantations, I insisted honestly. It's just poetry. Officer Baker scoffed. Poetry? I swear. I started, but I cut off when I heard the sickening sound of tearing paper. The officer flipping through my book had been careless. He tore a page out completely, and my heart lurched. Please don't! I begged. My poems had helped me so much through my depression. They helped me make sense of my feelings, make sense of the world. I couldn't imagine something so intimate being taken from me. We'll be the judge of the incantations you've been writing, Officer Baker sneered. My blood boiled when the other officer subconjured my poetry book. It vanished from sight, and all I wanted to do was punch these fuckers in the face. Fighting back was a good way to earn myself a criminal record, though. How many times has the waning hit you? Officer Baker demanded. I don't know, I spat. A few? He scoffed. Like I thought, you're a weak warlock. How do you figure... I asked. The weakest in the coven lose their magic first. Baker shot back. Yeah? When'd you lose yours? I questioned. He dug his elbow into my back harder, making me wince. All the students here are weak. No wonder the waning is hitting the school the hardest. Well, we are still learning. You figured that one out on your own? I don't like your attitude. He growled. I suggest you shut your mouth before I book you. I've already got your spell book. You want to spend the night in jail with it? I had a million comebacks on my tongue, but I kept my mouth shut and gritted my teeth. I knew this asshole wasn't messing around. Hell, he was probably the officer who'd booked Miles for missing curfew. Officer Baker laughed lightly. That wasn't so hard, was it? You best learn how to comply, son, or you'll be hanging from the gallows next. He shoved me one last time, and I fell to the floor. 
He walked off with the other officers, heads held high as they breezed past onlookers and headed out of the school. I turned around, my knees shaking. The main foyer was so silent, not even a cat meowed. Everyone stood frozen, and my friends stared at me in shock. Oliver was the first to move, rubbing against my leg like he was sorry about what just happened. Whispers began to spread around the room, and people started moving again. I shook in rage. What the hell was that? Miles asked. It was a demonstration, I growled. Just like the one they put on during Talia's exam. I knelt down and began subconjuring my belongings. Talia rushed over and helped me organize my things. It'll be okay, she said kindly. You can write more poems. I frowned. I don't remember them all, though. I'll never get those ones back. Her eyes glistened. Lucas, I'm so sorry. If I lost my songs. I shrugged, though it bothered the fuck out of me. I just wouldn't admit it. They're just poems. I noticed my poetry book wasn't the only missing thing. They'd also swiped my journalism ethics notebook, which had all my notes for the semester in it. Assholes. What does he mean about people being weak? Grant wondered. I picked up a stack of textbooks. It means their prejudice runs deeper than cast lines. Still think this is about our professors? Grant looked shaky on his feet, and he grabbed the arm of a chair to steady himself. The cops. The council. They're trying to show us who's in control. I eyed him. He didn't look so well. Grant, you should sit down. When's the last time you ate? I... Uh, I don't know, he admitted. Miles groaned. Grant, you know better than that. Come here. Mandy jumped up from one of the chairs so Grant could sit. Miles grabbed his brother's shoulders and guided him into the seat. He conjured a candy bar and handed it to Grant. Eat. I can tell when your blood sugar is dropping. Grant took a bite. I've been anxious all day. I forgot. Well, the cops left, so I doubt they'll be searching anyone else's stash today, Talia offered. Grant shook his head. It's not that, though this doesn't help. I finished cleaning up my stuff and stood. What else has you on edge? Grant shot a glance around the main foyer, but everyone else had returned to their own conversations. He lowered his voice anyway. It's the nightshade. Amy and I are so close to cracking the recipe. We expect it to be ready today. It just needs a few more tweaks and we should have some answers. My heart jumped. We'd been waiting so long for this. Amy glanced at the big clock that hung next to the stairs. It actually might be ready by now. Let's check it out, I said immediately. I needed something to distract me from what had just happened. Amy glanced around the foyer, then lowered her voice. Meet us in my dorm in five minutes. We'll go separately, so we don't draw any more attention than we already have. I nodded. By the time I finished organizing my stuff, my friends had dispersed. Miles and Tate had gone in a different direction. It'd look too suspicious if we all went to Amy's room. No one was watching me, but I kept throwing glances over my shoulder as I headed to Amy and Mandy's room. I knocked lightly, and the door swung open. I quickly stepped inside, and Mandy gestured me over to where Grant and Amy were working. Talia watched on with intrigue. I hadn't seen their setup yet, but it was impressive. Amy's desk had been entirely taken over by cauldrons and vials of various sizes, with different colors of liquid inside. I assumed they were all filled with nightshade at different stages of the breakdown process. Grant organized the vials like he knew his way around with ease. It was safer to keep the supplies with Amy, considering the run-ins I'd had with the druggies. Amy stirred a cauldron, and Grant poured a clear liquid into the smallest cauldron. It turned into a deep shade of purple. The two shared the same bright look. What is it? I asked. 
You learned something? Amy turned to me, beaming. We just confirmed the final ingredient, the one thing we've been missing all this time. My pulse quickened. Finally, we were getting somewhere. What does it mean? Talia asked. What's the ingredient? Grant pointed to an open book on the desk. The potion indicates that Nightshade contains high levels of a magical plant called Tortus Vitis, also known as Twisted Vine. The plant is used in potions to help improve focus and concentration. It was supposedly really effective, but alchemists stopped using it years ago due to its side effects. What kind of side effects? I asked. Irritability, mostly, Grant said. But it had killer withdrawal symptoms, too. That explains the nightshade symptoms we've heard about, I pointed out. This is good news, right? It's a step in the right direction, Amy said, but her features turned worried. But we don't know much more about Twisted Vine. That's all our textbooks tell us, and we don't use it in any of our classes. Which is good news, Grant added, because it's rare. How is that good news? Talia asked. Won't it make it harder to find? I thought about it for a moment. It might, but this also narrows things down for us a lot. Once we know where the twisted vine grows, we can find out where the dealers are getting it. We're one step closer to exposing Magnus. Exactly, Grant agreed. But I'm not even sure what environment it grows in. I pressed my lips together. It sounds like we might have to pay a visit to Professor Lewis. Amy glanced between Grant and me. You two should go. Professor Lewis doesn't like me ever since I spilled a potion in my Alchemy 101 lab and lit one of the tables on fire. We'll see what we can find out, I said. Grant and I left the room. We caught Professor Lewis just as she was leaving her office. Professor Lewis, I called. She turned to us. Lucas, Grant, what can I help you with? Grant and I weren't in the same class, but we both had her this semester. We're trying to settle a debate, Grant lied. She looked intrigued. Oh, a debate about what? I played along. We ran across this plant in one of our textbooks, Tortus Vitis. Twisted vine? Professor Lewis said thoughtfully. It's quite rare, and the school hasn't been able to get its hand on samples for years. We stopped studying it over a decade ago. What questions do you have about it? We're wondering where it grows, Grant said. See, I'm convinced it grows like grapevines in full sun with lots of heat, whereas Lucas is convinced it's a swamp plant. She shook her head. It's neither, I'm afraid. The conditions needed to grow Tortus vitis are precise. It's why the plant is so rare. It requires a dark, damp environment. Even the slightest bit of sunlight will cause the plant to die. No sunlight? I wondered aloud. That's strange. Well, aren't all magical plants? Professor Lewis pointed out. If you look into the history of Tortus Vitis deep enough, you'll know that it was first discovered in a cave. But there are a few caves that can grow it properly. If the cave is too far underground, the plant won't grow. And if you're too close to the surface, where sunlight touches the leaves... It will suffer. I furrowed my brow. We didn't have much for caves in this area. All our caves were more like crevices in the rock. The sunlight would surely touch anything inside. Where could the dealers be growing this? Unless they weren't growing it themselves. They could be trading it with other supernatural races, just like they were doing with the unicorn hair. So if someone wanted to grow it, they'd have to find the perfect cave? Grant questioned. Oh, no, Professor Lewis said. It was discovered in a cave, but it can grow in similar environments. Like a basement? I asked. Yes and no, she explained. Most modern basements are too dry to grow the vine. It requires a damp environment. Think more like a dungeon. Grant and I shared a wide-eyed gaze. Of course, there's nothing like that in Octavia Falls, Professor Lewis added quickly. 
But this was all hypothetical, wasn't it? I quickly cleared my throat. Yes, of course. Very well, she said like she was happy to help. Perhaps you can move on from hypotheticals and study for your finals. Grant straightened his spine. I'm studying hard, I promise. I'll see you both in class, she said before striding off down the hall. I turned to Grant the second she disappeared from view. The dungeon. His eyes went wide. Do you think she knows about the club? I don't know, I admitted. But either way, that club would be the perfect place to grow Twisted Vine. I mean, it's in the basement of the school, so no sunlight. And the entrance changes all the time, so anyone searching for it without an invite couldn't find it. But Professor Lewis said the plant grows in damp places, Grant pointed out. I don't remember the dungeon being damp. How do we know that club is all there is to it? I asked. There could be other rooms down there that we didn't see the last time. Goddess, I can't believe we didn't think of this before. Think of the people who frequent that place. They're the perfect kids to rope into buying or dealing drugs. Grant bit his lower lip. You know something? I asked. He shook his head. Not exactly, but I remember seeing drugs down there when I went last semester. I didn't realize they were nightshade at the time. I felt the blood drain from my face. I recalled seeing Gregory surrounded by a group of girls who were dropping liquid under their tongue. I thought it was just some potion that would help them loosen up. I didn't think it was a hard drug like nightshade. We need to get back in there, I pressed. Whether Twisted Vine is being grown there or not, somebody down there knows something. I agree, but how are we going to get in? Grant asked. No one's going to extend an invite, and we'll be kicked out the second we walk in. All the druggies know not to mess with us. Mandy got her hands on Nightshade for us. Maybe she can get us some tickets, I suggested. As for being recognized, we're going to need disguises. Grant looked thoughtful. I might have an idea, but it's going to be tricky to get my hands on ingredients, and it will take over a week to brew. Then let's get started on it right away, I said. We have until the end of finals week to get into the dungeon before school shuts down for break. We need to get answers before then. Agreed, Grant said. We returned to Amy's dorm to share what we learned. Mandy promised she'd get us tickets to the dungeon, and Talia agreed to help Grant gather ingredients for his brew. After I left my friends, I paced the halls nervously, not really sure of where I was going. Nadine had heard from Talia that I was busy hunting down answers on Nightshade and left for dialysis without me. That left me too much time to think. I wanted answers, but I knew we wouldn't find anything until we got into the club undetected. Instead, I focused on what I felt I could control, hunting down answers about the Reaper's shadow curse. Nadine and I had looked into it before and never found anything, but I was determined to learn how to break it now more than ever. I'd been researching it for weeks, but I'd hit a dead end. It was time to finally ask for help. I headed to Professor Warren's office. He was hunched over his desk grading papers when I arrived. His features brightened when he saw me in the doorway. Lucas, to what do I owe the pleasure? I have some questions, if you have some time, I said. He gestured to the seat across from him. Sure, come on in. I closed the door and sat. Oliver prowled around the room, eyeing the collection of animal skeletons on Professor Warren's shelves. Before you shut me down, please hear me out. It's about the Reaper's shadow curse. Professor Warren leaned back in his chair, looking thoughtful. I was wondering when you'd come to me about this. I furrowed my brow. What do you mean? Given that your girlfriend is a curse breaker, I assume you believe there's a chance to break the curse. I frowned. Of course you heard. Given the current political climate, intercaste relationships are high profile right now. He pointed out. I crossed my arms. That's bullshit. I didn't say it was okay, he replied. I disagree with the division of the castes as well. 
People are scared, and they'll go through extreme measures to mitigate their fear. His gaze bore into me, and I sensed he meant more than he was saying. You think I'm coming to you about the Reaper's shadow because I'm scared? I questioned. He shrugged. Are you? I pondered it for a moment. No, not really. Then why do you wish to break the curse? He asked curiously. It's not about fear. It's about love, I admitted. I love Nadine, and she wants to be with me. I can't avoid her when I feel this way about her, but I can't let her live with the threat of this curse hanging over her either. The only way to save her is to let her break this curse. He nodded along like he understood. The curse begins at marriage and physical intimacy. Why do you think those are parts of the curse? I'm not sure exactly. Okay, why do you want to get physical with your girlfriend? My stomach twisted. I was mortified we were having this conversation, but I needed Professor Warren's help, so I had to be honest with him. It's not something I can put into words. It's something I just feel. It's not about sex or a wedding. It's about how I can show her how much I love her. It sounds shallow, I know. I can't explain it. It's like that time together is ours. The experience is just ours. I don't get to share that with anyone else, just her. And getting married, it's so much more than a piece of paper. Nadine's disabled, and I love her so much that I want to provide for her when she can't help herself. Everything the curse targets, sex, marriage, kids, it's a deep soul contract that I never get to fulfill as long as this curse stands. Professor Warren smiled. There you go, Lucas, he said proudly. That's your answer. That's why intimacy is part of the curse. The man who cast it was jealous of his parents' affection toward one another. The curse isn't specifically about the act of sex. It's about what it represents, the love, trust, and vulnerability that manifests in physical form, which was something your curse caster could never have. I felt all the blood in my body drain to my toes. Physical intimacy? So I could have already cursed her. Hold on, let's back up, Professor Warren said quickly. That's not what I said. But if it's true, then I... I trailed off. Nadine and I were no strangers to physical intimacy, but we thought there was a strict line. If what Professor Warren said was true, then I'd already cursed her. Fuck. Nadine's kidney disease. I stood from the chair and began pacing around the room. Goddess, I've made Nadine sick. Her kidneys are failing, and I... I... Uh... Lucas, sit down, Professor Warren insisted, but I barely heard him. I clutched my chest, sure I was on the verge of hyperventilating. Oliver spun around my feet, meowing in worry. No, 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 no. Why would you? Lucas, let's talk about this. Professor Warren rose from his chair, but he sounded frantic, like his mind was racing a million miles per hour trying to fix this. You shouldn't be ashamed of anything. I'm not ashamed, I cried. But I'm sure as hell scared. I thought there were pretty damn clear lines. What lines exactly? Professor Warren asked. Virginity is a social construct. Many would argue where the line is drawn. I thought there were loopholes! I trembled as I screamed. Goddess, what had I done? Lucas, please, Professor Warren pleaded. There's no judgment here. I'm judging myself. He reached for me and guided me back to my seat. I think we can use this to our advantage. I clutched the armrest of the chair. How? He returned to his seat. Curse breakers work by drawing the magic from a curse and reworking it, right? I nodded. So, if Nadine's already cursed, maybe she can pull the magic out of herself. 
He spoke quickly, like he was grasping at straws. He obviously hadn't known where this conversation was headed when he started asking questions. I drew a deep breath and started to calm down. She's broken a curse on herself before, but... But she and Chloe had to work together to break it. Nadine wouldn't be the first Reaper's shadow in history. What about those other women? If she can break the curse on herself... I stood up abruptly, cutting him off. Thanks for your help, but I need to talk to Nadine. I fled from the room. I couldn't wait to talk to her, so I hurried to the hospital. Her jaw dropped when I entered the dialysis room. There was a chair next to her machine for visitors, but I couldn't sit. Lucas, what's wrong? She asked. I paced back and forth. Oliver and Issa both watched me. I wish I could put it into words, but I... I caved and sat in the chair next to her. The coven's dialysis center was small, with only three machines, since it was all our town needed. No one else was around, but I lowered my voice anyway. I just spoke with Professor Warren about the Reaper's shadow. I blurted. I... I didn't realize what it... Nadine, I'm so sorry. She tilted her head. What do you mean? Sorry about what? I drew a deep breath to calm myself. Professor Warren said the curse isn't specifically about sex, marriage, and kids. He seems to think it's about the physical manifestation of intimacy and what it all represents. Nadine looked thoughtful. You know, I've never been able to put into words why I'm so desperate to be with you in those ways. But I like the way you just put it. The physical manifestation of intimacy. Nade, you don't get what I'm saying. I pressed. If the curse is about the abstract, about what it all represents, then maybe we've already crossed the line. Her features fell, and she glanced at her dialysis machine. No, you don't think. Nade, I'm so sorry. My voice broke. I think I already cursed you. No, Nadine stated firmly. She grabbed my hand and squeezed it tightly. No, Lucas, you can't blame yourself. If this is about how much I love you, then it's already done, I argued. You've been cursed. You're sick because of me. Don't say that, she insisted. I was sick long before you and I ever met. I'm hooked to this machine because my lupus has been out of control for over a year. My magic made it even worse. I was going to end up here one way or another. She didn't deny that she'd been cursed, and there wasn't any way to know for sure. I'm going to get better, she promised. The dialysis is already helping, and once I get a transplant, there's a good chance I'll do remission for good. Whether I'm cursed or not, I can still break the curse. I'm strong enough to do this. I relaxed a little, but I was still worried to death. You're right. Just then, my phone started ringing. My heart leapt when I saw the number on the screen. Nadine paled. Is that... Dr. Tracy. I finished for her. I punched the screen to answer, then stood and began pacing around the room. My stomach twisted into knots. Hello? Hello, Lucas Taylor? Dr. Tracy asked. Yes, it's me. You have my test results? I do, but I'm afraid it's not good news. My ears started to ring, and I turned my back to Nadine. The rest of the world seemed to fade to black as I listened to Dr. Tracy. The phone shook in my hand, and my knees trembled. I could barely respond when she asked if I was still there. Her voice was static and so far away. Yes, um, thank you for calling, I said flatly. She started to reassure me, but I couldn't process it. I hung up and slowly turned back to Nadine. Her wide eyes met mine, and her face had gone pale. You're not a match, she guessed. I swallowed the massive lump in my throat and grabbed for the chair beside her before I collapsed into it. I am. I replied breathlessly. She gasped. You're a match? So I'm getting your kidney? Goddess, she sounded so excited. 
It killed me to be the one to tell her. Tears pricked in my eyes and my bottom lip trembled. She blinked a few times, her eyes turning red. I'm not getting your kidney? Nade, I'm so sorry, I said through shallow breaths. I'm a match, but they won't do the surgery. I... I didn't pass the psychological exam. What? Nadine cried. She threw a trembling hand over her mouth. How could they deny you? I don't know, I said desperately. They know I'm being treated for depression. Dr. Max not recommending me. The doctors must think I won't be able to handle giving up my kidney. What are they afraid of? She demanded. You're not suicidal. It's bullshit, I agreed. I'll fix this, Nade. I'll redo the interview. I'll convince my therapist. If we have to, we'll leave Octavia Falls and find someone else to do the transplant. How long will that take, though? Lucas, do you know how long the transplant list is? It could take me years to get a kidney. Tears welled in her eyes, and guilt racked my entire body. Nadine wasn't getting a kidney, and it was my fault. I couldn't accept this. You don't need that list, I insisted. You're going to get mine. I'm a match. That doesn't matter if the doctors won't help, she said. Shit. One of us had to be strong right now, and I didn't expect it to be her. I leaned over and wrapped my arm around her. Nadine curled into me, and her tears soaked into my shirt. Seeing her break down like that was enough to crush my spirit. I felt myself begin to unravel, and there was nothing I could do but hold her. I had to do more. I had to save her. There was no other option. I gently stroked her arm. We're going to do whatever it takes. One way or another, I'm giving you my kidney. I promise. Goddess, I hoped I didn't just tell the biggest lie of my life. Chapter 18 Nadine To say I was devastated was an understatement. I had been holding on to the hope that Lucas and I were a match. The joy and hope that swelled in my heart when I heard we were was unlike anything I'd felt before. It only made the following disappointment worse. Such polarizing emotions that nearly tore me to pieces. I couldn't believe the doctors would do this. It was obvious Lucas was really torn up about it, but it wasn't his fault. I didn't really know what to do with myself, because I couldn't think straight the rest of the week, and it wasn't lupus fog like normal. This was a pure, broken heart. My magic wasn't working quite right either. At first, I thought it was because of how I felt, but when I failed to conjure my meds, I realized it was the waning. I freaked. I'd been subconjuring my medication ever since Lena had poisoned me last semester by planting fake pills in my room. I called Dr. Yonker immediately, and he ordered an emergency prescription to cover me until my magic returned. I tried talking to him about the transplant, but he told me there was nothing he could do. I was just going to have to wait for another kidney. It terrified me. Lucas kept me company when he could, to take my mind off things. He surprised me with another date jar for my birthday. It was filled with endless date ideas that he'd folded into the shape of hearts so that I could pick a date whenever I wanted. I loved it. Finals week arrived, and my first exam was wand theory. The promise of sitting next to Lucas through the test was the only thing that made me want to go. His knee brushed against mine the whole way through the written test, which was enough to relax me enough, and I was pretty sure I passed with a decent grade. After the written part of the exam, we were called into Professor Blackbird's office individually to demonstrate our practical use of wand theory. It was a simple test, and all I had to do was cast three different spells using my wand. I performed a cleansing spell, a locking spell on his door, and a glowing enchantment on a paperweight that sat on his desk. It glowed for a solid minute before fading back to normal. 
He frowned as he stared down at the paperweight. Are you experiencing the waning, Miss Evers? I shook my head. I was last week, but my magic is back now. He sighed. The waning isn't making these final grades easy. I'm glad to hear your magic is doing well, but that last enchantment just saved your grade. I'm afraid your first two spells were elementary, though you've impressed me with the enchantment. You infused orb magic into the paperweight, correct? I nodded. It's all I could think of. He marked something down on a piece of paper. It was a creative choice. You can expect to have your grade back by the end of the week. Take care. That was all he said before he dismissed me. How'd it go? Lucas asked when I stopped at our table. He was still waiting to take the practical portion of the exam, and he had another exam later that day. I shrugged. I'm pretty sure I passed. That's good, he replied. I'm going to fail, thanks to the waning. My magic's totally useless today. I think Professor Blackbird will be sympathetic, I said. I hope so, he replied. I'll catch up with you at dinner. That sounds great. I'll see you then. I leaned over and gave him a kiss. Screw anyone who was watching. They may not agree with intercaste relationships, but half of their parents were from different castes. It was hypocritical, at best. I tried to study in my dorm, but I couldn't focus. Isa kept walking all over my books and shoving her butt in my face, so that didn't help, either. To take my mind off it, I pulled out my craft supplies. Ever since I made Lucas a blanket for his birthday, I'd started really getting into it. It was really easy and therapeutic. All it took was two pieces of fleece and a pair of scissors. I cut the ends into strips and tied them together. I made a pink blanket for Talia, with cats on one side and flowers on the other. I left it on her bed, then took the others to the nursing home. Thank you so much for your donation, the receptionist told me. Our residents will love these. From the front desk, I could see several of the residents in the community room. Some played cards, and others watched TV. Would you mind if I stayed for a while? I asked. No, not at all, the receptionist said kindly. I don't think she knew who I was, because most people around here weren't that nice to me. The residents would love to meet you. I entered the community room. A nurse greeted me and asked who I was there to see. I told her I was there to keep the residents company. The nurse gestured to a lady in a wheelchair. I'm sure Rose would love a visitor. Rose was working on a puzzle. She looked a bit confused as she tried fitting one of the pieces into another. It didn't fit, but she was persistent and tried another piece. She didn't look up when she spoke. You must be lost, my dear. I smiled. Not anymore. I found you. Finally, she lifted her gaze, and a smile touched her lips. I'm Rose. Nadine, I introduced. Rose invited me to help her with her puzzle. The whole time, she told me stories about herself. Her husband was long gone, and her son didn't live in Octavia Falls anymore, ever since he left for grad school and got married. She used to visit her grandkids all the time, but couldn't anymore with her health. My health isn't the best these days either, I admitted. Oh dear, she said, looking worried. It's treatable, yes? Yes, it's my kidneys, I told her. I'm on dialysis, and that's really helping me feel better, but I'm on the transplant list, and... I choked up a little and couldn't finish. My dear, Rose said kindly. She reached out and placed her hand on mine. You'll get your transplant. Mother Miriam will make sure of it. But we have free will, I argued, and the doctors are the ones who get to make this decision. Free will or not, Mother Miriam is always there to support you, Rose reminded me. Have faith in her. She will not abandon you. I relaxed a little after Rose said that. We finished our puzzle in under an hour. 
Eventually, the nurses told me it was time for Rose's meds, so I left. I was feeling so much better after visiting the nursing home, and vowed to visit again. Maybe I'd make it a point to swing by before dialysis once a week. After all, the best way to feel better when you were in a crappy mood was to help someone else. The traffic back to school was insane. It was so congested that I came to a full stop on Main Street. Cars honked, and I craned my neck, trying to see what was going on. I caught sight of a group of people crowded in front of Octavia Hall. The crowd was so thick that people stood on the street. They looked angry, shoving each other and shouting things. Lincoln, the poor guard stationed in front of Octavia Hall, tried to keep the crowd back, but he couldn't control them. The police hadn't arrived yet. I had to do something, or Lincoln was going to get trampled. I shoved my car into park and jumped out. The car behind me blared their horn, but it wasn't like traffic was moving any time soon. Snow dusted the sidewalk. I pulled my cloak's hood up and hurried over to the crowd. I didn't recognize anyone in particular, but they all looked my age. Someone at the school must have organized this protest. I shoved my way past them. I got a few elbows in the side in return, but I managed to force my way to the front. "'What's going on here?' I asked Lincoln. He had his hands up, creating a shield to keep the crowd away from the doors. "'They just showed up!' "'We demand an audience with the Imperium Council!' someone shouted. "'We're losing more and more magic by the day!' another screamed. "'The Council needs to be doing more to stop this!' "'They're doing everything they can!' Lincoln boomed in a deep voice. Glass shattered, and I flinched. Someone had thrown a battle orb into the window, and glass rained over the sidewalk. Lincoln thrust his arms apart, spreading his shield so wide that it shoved people into one another. Several people stumbled and fell into a heap, close to where the window had been shattered. "'I suggest you back up right now. The police are on their way!' These people were pissed, but something told me most of them were all experiencing the waning right now. Otherwise, there'd be a lot more damage to Octavia Hall than a broken window. A girl shoved me aside, until she was right up next to Lincoln's shield. She pounded on it with her fist, like it was a window. "'The Imperium Council has a duty to hear us out!' she screamed. My jaw dropped when I looked over to see it was Tate. What are you doing here? She turned to me, but her features were hard. She looked like she wanted to punch someone in the face. I'm sick of the waning. We all are, she seethed. You don't even have your magic yet, I pointed out. I'll have it soon enough, she countered. That is, if the waning doesn't steal it from me first. The Imperium Council is sitting back and doing nothing. Tell me this protest isn't getting out of hand, Tate, I said. The Imperium Council will see this as a threat, trying to break into their headquarters. Fuck off, she growled. This is a peaceful protest. We have every right. Someone just broke a window, I yelled. Somebody could get hurt. Who organized this? Tate scoffed. Like I'll tell you, you're one of them. I gaped at her. Of course, I expected Tate to be involved in something like this. I didn't blame her. We were all angry about what was happening in the coven. But I thought we were friends. Tate, I... Don't, she snapped. I want to listen. Maybe I can help, I pressed. I've been affected by the waning, too. Believe me, the priestesses don't want this to happen. Then do something, Tate shouted. She grabbed my hood and yanked it down. Around me, people gasped. It's her! One of the priestesses! A girl shouted. The crowd looked ready to eat me alive. Priestess! Priestess Nadine! I turned to Lincoln, who was shouting my name. He cocked his head, as if inviting me past the shield. I quickly jumped toward him and passed through his shield like it was nothing but air. No one else could get past, though as he'd opened it only for me. I faced the crowd. 
I am Priestess Nadine, and I'm here to listen. I cut off when someone grabbed me by the back of my cloak and yanked me backward. Suddenly, I was inside the building, being dragged by my collar. I stumbled backward, but finally found my footing inside the main lobby. I turned around to see Priestess Lillian had been the one to pull me inside. The three other priestesses stared at me. What in the name of the goddess is this? Priestess Lillian barked. I don't know, I answered. I was driving by and... If anyone is to address these people, we do it together, Priestess Lillian demanded. I was just trying to help. I defended myself. And we will, Priestess Margaret said. But these people are angry. They're not ready to listen. We are doing everything we can to get to the bottom of this. They don't know that, I shouted. For all they know, we're behind it. How dare you even suggest that, Priestess Lillian gasped. I'm not suggesting it, I replied. But like you said, these people are angry. Without answers, they'll come to their own conclusions. I know you're trying to stop this. They don't. What are you suggesting? Priestess Charlotte asked. That we divulge all our plans and secrets? If anyone learns of the wands, it could compromise us finding them. I'm not saying we should tell them about the wands, I said. While we're looking for the wands, we're also trying to figure out what's causing the waning. The coven at least deserves to know what we're doing to help. A public relations campaign? Priestess Lillian sneered like she despised the idea. It may be the only thing to keep the coven from dividing further, I argued. They've already divided themselves by castes. People are losing their jobs over it, and families are being torn apart. Do you want it to be the Imperium Council against the Coven next? I was met with stunned silence. Stella stepped forward. Priestess Nadine makes a good point. It may be time to address the Coven formally. Lillian glared down at me. Her voice was strained, like it was difficult to admit I was right. We'll need some time to prepare a statement. It's nice to see you actually contribute to your position. You know why I'm not here full-time like the rest of you. I have class and dialysis. I swore I caught Priestess Lillian roll her eyes, but I couldn't be sure. I'd had to tell the priestesses about my kidney disease, but I didn't understand how they felt about it until now. It was obvious Priestess Lillian didn't care. My illness was nothing more than a burden to her. Hell... I was a burden to this woman. Priestess Margaret at least looked sympathetic. Nadine's classes are crucial to her position on the council. She will continue to attend college with a full course load. Once she graduates, her schedule will be wide open to assist the council full time. I assume by then she will have a new kidney and be off dialysis. Actually, I may not, I told them could take years for me to reach the top of the transplant list. I thought you had a donor lined up, Priestess Stella said. I shook my head. He was only in the testing stage. Stella frowned. And he's not a match. He is, I countered. But the doctors won't let him go through with it. Something about his psych evaluation. I don't have all the details. Something hit me just then. Could the Imperium Council persuade the doctors? I asked. I mean, we are the greatest governing power in the coven. Priestess Margaret pursed her lips, looking doubtful. None of us are medical professionals. Something like this should be left up to your doctors. But we are a match, I argued. Lucas is being treated for depression, but he's not on meds or anything. His treatment has nothing to do with the transplant. Please, you must have the power to convince them. This may be my only chance. The priestesses all looked at one another, but I couldn't read their gazes. I held my breath. Finally, Margaret turned to me. Bring us a wand, and we'll see what we can do. All the blood in my body drained to my toes. 
I'd expect that kind of response from Lillian, but for the other priestesses to agree? It horrified me to my very core. They didn't care about me, only about what I could offer. They had the power to convince my doctors to go ahead with the transplant. I knew it. But they chose to hold my kidney hostage in exchange for the wands. Nausea rolled around in my gut. I didn't know how they could be so heartless. But I've helped you in other ways, I insisted. I got you the information about the Croc of Death. And we have yet to find it, Priestess Lillian snapped. I solved Professor Damon's murder, too, but you wouldn't listen, I wanted to yell. But the priestesses weren't on my side, and I already knew that. Bring us a wand, and we'll get you your kidney, Priestess Lillian said. Otherwise, I suggest you prepare for the worst. That's all she said before the priestesses turned and swept off, leaving me alone. They were manipulating me in the worst way possible. I was a fool to even request their help. But it may be the only thing that could save me. This is bullshit, Lucas growled when I told him what the priestesses had said. I sat on his bed, running my hands over the fleece blanket I'd made him. He paced around the room. The notebook he'd been studying when I arrived flopped around in his hand as he became enraged. Issa and Oliver watched him curiously. It is bullshit, I agreed, but there's nothing I can do about it. They can't do this to one of their own priestesses, he protested. I cocked an eyebrow. They are doing it. The council runs on a majority rules system. I literally have no power unless the other priestesses agree with me. Lucas stopped pacing. He set his notebook on the nightstand, then sat beside me. Aid, I'm so sorry this is happening. There must be something we can do. He draped an arm around me and pulled me close. I laid my head on his shoulder. My heart calmed at his touch. I think the only thing we can do is find one of the wands and hand it over, I said, feeling the defeat sink in my belly. Problem is, I don't trust the council with the wands, not after what they did to Professor Daniels. Lucas stroked my arm. We'll think of something. I sat up straighter, though my voice cracked. I really don't think I'm in a place to come up with solutions right now. Right now, I just really want... I cut off when my eyes landed on his notebook. Slowly, I reached out to grab it so I could get a better look. At the top, he'd scrawled the words, Reaper Shadow. Below that was a long list of names and dates. I thought you were studying for finals, I remarked, my eyes scanning the page. You've been researching the curse? Lucas nodded and a proud smile twitched at the corners of his lips. I figured out how to break it. My jaw dropped, and I jumped to my feet. Are you for real right now? You did? His smile grew so wide, he was beaming. I did. I squealed and threw my arms around him. We tumbled onto the bed together, and Lucas laughed as his arms came around me. You're really excited, he remarked. I planted a kiss on his lips. Of course I am. This is huge. His smile disappeared. This could still be dangerous, Nade. Are you a hundred percent sure you want to do this? Yes, I stated confidently. I've been practicing my magic with Verla all semester. I know my limits. I want to try. I climbed off Lucas and sat up. How do we do it? He took the notebook from me. When you broke your family curse, you and Chloe had to work together to break it, right? Yes, but I'm wondering, if I'm already cursed, could I just break it on myself and be done with it? I asked. If we don't break the curse completely, it will return, Lucas pointed out. It wouldn't do anything but delay the consequences. 
For this to work, we need to gather together all the women who have ever become the Reaper's shadow. They're all dead now, though, I said thoughtfully. Are you suggesting we grave rob? Sort of. He bit his lower lip before quickly adding, I'm pretty sure it will work without actually uncovering their bodies. Once we're in the cemetery, you should be able to sense the magic, right? I would think so, I said. So, you found all these women? Lucas flipped the page, where there were even more notes. There actually weren't that many. I've been researching the coven's records, and I've been able to track the timeline from when the curse was cast until now. What did you find? I asked. We know the origin of the curse, he explained. Roughly two hundred years ago, a guy named Samuel Davis killed his mother. I nodded. I recall. He was the son of a reaper's apprentice. The event caused the curse to be cast. Right, Lucas said. Samuel fled the coven afterward and was presumed dead. His father, Jasper Davis, remarried. His second wife, Sarah Davis, was the first reaper's shadow. I eyed his notes, but there was so much information to absorb. What happened to her? After they married, she lost her sister to a drowning accident, Lucas said. Shortly after, she became very ill. The records don't say what she had, probably something they couldn't diagnose back then. I never found any mention of kids in their obituaries, but I did learn that she and Jasper died around the same time. So she never reached the final stage of the curse? I said thoughtfully. No, and I don't think anyone even knew about the curse back then. Lucas flipped through his notes. After Samuel's father died, two other Reaper's apprentices took wives and had children. The women both died at the hands of their firstborn. It wasn't until the second woman was killed that the coven drew the connection. The thing is, curses leave trace magic behind. The coven was able to go back and confirm that the murder caused this curse. They were able to work out the details based on the similarities between the cases. Every woman experienced trauma, illness, and death in conjunction with marriage, intimacy, and kids. Journal entries confirmed the dates. That's three women for sure, I said. Were there more after the coven confirmed the curse? Lucas shook his head. Four other Reaper's apprentices followed, until I was handed the job. But by then, they all knew about the curse, and none of them ever married. I can't find a single mention of any woman in their lives in newspapers, photographs, or journal entries. That's it? I asked, relief flooding through me. We only have to find three graves? I'd be looking for four, Lucas said. We don't know if the magic touched Samuel's mother when she died, but we should check her grave, just to be sure. I got to my feet. What are we waiting for? Let's go! Lucas grabbed my wrist. We don't want to rush this. Well, I don't want to wait, I told him. If it's true that I'm already cursed... Then you can wait one more day, he offered. I want to make sure you're ready to perform this magic. I'd feel a lot better about it if you had a good night's rest. Tell me honestly, how are you feeling right now? My shoulders sagged. Wiped out. I'll feel better after my dialysis tomorrow. Lucas took my hand. Then we'll wait until then. What finals do you have tomorrow? None, I said. I have the day off. Lucas smirked. Consider your day booked, then. Lucas, I... Please, he begged. I know you're eager to get this over with, but I want to do this right. I narrowed my eyes. What do you have in mind? He smirked. Would you be opposed to a surprise? Yes, I laughed. You know me better than to ask. He chuckled. I just need the night to come up with a plan, okay? We're going to do this, Nadine. One night, I told him. 
holding up a finger. I'll agree to one night, but by tomorrow evening, we're breaking this curse. Lucas took my face in his hands, then pulled me into a passionate kiss. Tomorrow night, Nate. This curse doesn't stand a chance against you. My heart lifted at his encouragement. I felt untouchable as I pulled him into another passionate kiss. By the time I awoke in my own bed the next morning, I felt fantastic. I'd slept really well, and I had this hope stirring in my chest. It seemed as if nothing could get me down. The priestesses may have refused to help me, but it didn't seem to matter right now. I was going to break the Reaper Shadow curse tonight, and Lucas and I could finally be together, with no restrictions. The scent of pumpkin spice hit my nose, and I rolled over to see a plate of eggs and toast on my nightstand. Next to that sat a cup from the cafe. I knew instantly that it was pumpkin spice cocoa, my favorite. Talia stood at her dresser, applying makeup. What's this? I asked her. She turned, looking happy to see I was up. It's breakfast in bed. Lucas stopped by. He said it's a very special day for you. My heart melted at the gesture. Aw, that's so sweet of him. Talia picked up her mascara, but she kept her eyes on me and wiggled her eyebrows. I bit into my toast, but I couldn't hide my smile. So he told you what we're up to? That and more, she smirked. My jaw dropped. He told you his surprise! Tell me! She shook her head. I can't, but trust me, you're going to love it. He said he'll be there to pick you up after his exam this morning. You have plenty of time for breakfast and a nice long bath. You expect me to relax when I know there's a surprise coming? I teased. You can try. She chuckled before turning back to her mirror. I finished my breakfast and sat in bed for a while, sipping on my pumpkin spice cocoa. It was so good. Isa lay on my lap, purring, which helped me relax. When I finished my drink, I got up and went to the bathroom. I stopped in the doorway when I saw what was inside. Rose petals trailed from the door to the tub. A basket full of Epsom salts, bath bombs, lotion, and chocolate balanced on the edge of the bath. There was a mix of my two favorite scents, lavender and rose. Gingerly, I stepped into the bathroom, and my gaze locked on the mirror above the sink. Over a dozen sticky notes had been stuck to the mirror, all in Lucas's handwriting. You're amazing. You make me smile. I love you. My jaw dropped as I read over each one, my heart warming more and more with each word. Lucas, I breathed. He shouldn't have. Except it felt so good that he had. For the first time, I could actually say I loved the surprise. I drew myself a hot bath and used the lavender Epsom salts Lucas had given me. Isa sat on the edge of the tub, batting at the water and splashing me in the face. I splashed her back, and she lost her balance and face-planted into the water. She squealed as she jumped out of the tub and ran behind the toilet, growling at me. I couldn't stop laughing. Just as I finished getting dressed, a knock came at my door. I opened it to see Lucas standing there with Oliver at his heels. He pulled his hand from behind his back to reveal a single red rose. Lucas, I breathed as I reached for it. You didn't have to do this. He shrugged. I wanted to. I smiled, then gave him a peck on the lips. This is all really nice. He smirked. I'm glad to see you're enjoying the surprise. I wrinkled my nose. Perhaps just a little. Good. There's more. He took my hand. More surprises? I asked as we walked down the hall. Our cats followed close behind. He eyed me with a playful expression. You want me to stop surprising you? Um, I'll allow surprises for one day only. Deal? He nodded firmly. Deal. 
Lucas took my keys and put a blindfold over my eyes as he drove me through town. I wasn't allowed to take it off until we came to a stop. It killed me not to steal a peek, but I had agreed to a surprise. I was shocked when I opened my eyes and saw we were parked in the strip mall, in front of the spa. Are you serious? I squeaked. He smiled brightly. But you don't like surprises, right? How are we going to afford this? Don't worry about it, he said. We spent the morning being pampered with a couple's massage. I didn't think I could relax any further until Lucas took me to the Cozy Cat Cafe, where we ordered delicious cherry pie infused with calming magic. He let me choose our afternoon activity, so we went to the movie theater to see the latest mystery based on Sherlock Holmes. It was a matinee showing, and we were the only ones there, so we took free reign of yelling at the characters and throwing our popcorn at the screen. After my dialysis, Lucas took me to a new place for dinner at one of the breweries in town. We shared a plate of sweet potato fries, which were amazing. The sun was starting to set by the time we left. I held his hand on our way back to the car. I had a really good time today. That was my goal, he said with a smile. It was all so thoughtful. I felt like I could forget everything and just enjoy myself with you, I said. You may be warming me up to surprises. He chuckled. That's something I never thought I'd hear you say. I can be unpredictable, I teased as we turned a corner to a secluded street. You're the one with a stick up your ass. I poked him in the side, and he laughed. Oh, I'm predictable? He challenged. He didn't give me a chance to respond before he scooped me up in his arms and started carrying me down the sidewalk. I threw my arms around his neck, laughing. What are you doing? Being unpredictable. Lucas kicked open the back door to my car and tossed me onto the back seat. He climbed in behind me, and his lips connected with mine before I heard the door close. Isa and Oliver must have slipped in behind us because I heard them jump into the front seat. I moaned as I leaned back, lying across the back seat. Lucas climbed on top of me, laying passionate kisses on my lips. I ran my hands through his hair. Very unpredictable. He smirked. You like that? There's more where that came from. Lucas kissed me again, and our hands began roaming each other. Heat pooled deep in my belly as his fingers slid beneath my shirt. As his kisses trailed down my neck, I finally got a chance to breathe. Your day of pampering was a success, I told him breathlessly. I'm feeling very good about tonight. Lucas drew away, biting his lip. Goddess, when he looked down at me like that, I didn't want to wait to break the curse. I wanted him to take me right here, right now. Are we ready for this? he asked. I nodded. I'm feeling really good. I can do this. He ran his thumb over my cheek, staring down at me with a soft expression. I know you can. Then let's do it, I told him. Lucas and I drove to the cemetery. By now, the sun had set and the stars twinkled above us. The cemetery gates were locked, but all it took was one simple spell to sneak inside. Snow covered the gravestones and crunched beneath my feet. The further we walked, the more my heart hammered. Are you okay? Lucas asked, noticing the look on my face. I'm nervous, I admitted, twisting my hands beneath my cloak. But not enough to stop me from going through with this. Lucas stopped in front of me and grabbed me by the shoulders. If at any point you want to stop, you don't have to do this. I know, but thank you. I drew a deep breath. I'm ready. Where do we find these graves? Lucas pointed. The west side of the cemetery is the oldest. I'll bet you anything we'll find them all there. I can do this, I told myself. Come on, then. We have a curse to break. Lucas and I walked between the tombstones, but I didn't see any of the names he'd mentioned. Could we be wrong? I wondered aloud. 
Maybe their graves are gone. It's been over a hundred years. They could have been moved. How old is that mausoleum? What if they'd been placed to rest there? Lucas shook his head. No, I checked. The coven records say they were all buried in the cemetery. This place is huge, I pointed out. But we'll stay here all night if we have to. Issa meowed, and I turned to see her sitting in front of a nearby gravestone. It was so old that it was tilted and chipped. Lucas and I exchanged a glance, then hurried over to the grave. A light dusting of snow covered the name. My fingers trembled as I reached out and wiped the snow away. When I touched the gravestone, something dark twisted inside my belly. Hair rose on the back of my neck, and my knees buckled. I fell to the ground at the edge of her grave. Marianne Davis. A shiver ran down my spine. This must be her, Samuel's mother. Lucas came to an abrupt halt beside me, and Oliver meowed. It is, Lucas said, his voice sounding hollow. I drew a wavered breath. We found her. Goddess, she's waited so long for this. You don't think she could carry the curse with her to the afterlife? Lucas asked. I shook my head. No, but I wouldn't want to wait two hundred years for my remains to be laid to rest properly. There's something here. Marianne never got her closure. She's not at peace. How can you tell? Lucas asked. I can feel the curse in her bones, I whispered. The magic was so strong and tragic that tears rose to my eyes just being near her. How can I help? Lucas asked. I don't know if you can, I admitted. I dashed the tears from my cheeks. Issa gazed up at me with worry in her eyes, and I scratched her behind the ears to let her know that I was going to be okay. Just be here for me, okay? Lucas nodded firmly. I'm here for whatever you need. I hesitated. I knew how to break a curse, but that didn't feel like enough. Marianne had been in love with the Reaper's apprentice. Her son had been born from the darkness his father carried with him every day. She died because she'd been in love with a Reaper. I felt a deep connection to Marianne, though I couldn't explain it. It went deeper than my emotions, as if the curse brought us together magically. I shook the nerves from my body, then focused on her grave. Something about this didn't feel right. Do you have a candle? I asked Lucas. Yeah, here. He conjured a candle and lighter and placed them in my hands. I turned back to the grave and set the candle at the base of it. The moment I lit it, a cold breeze swept through the cemetery, blowing snow past our faces. Issa pressed closer to me, and I pulled my hood around my face. The wind died down, though the candle flame continued to flicker. Marianne, I said aloud. I don't know if you can hear me, but I am so sorry about what happened to you. Nobody deserves that kind of ending, and I pray that you found your happiness in the afterlife. Even though you've passed on, it's not right to let this curse live in your bones. I will break this curse and end this cycle that your son started, and I pray that it will provide you the closure that you didn't get when you were alive. Goddess bless you, Marianne. I pressed my hand to her gravestone and closed my eyes. I sensed the darkness swirling in the earth beneath me, the curse that I had to break. It was frightening and intimidating, because I didn't even have to reach out with my magic to feel it. Lucas had been right. This curse was strong and insanely dangerous. But I had to do this, not just for me, but for all the other women who had come before me, and all the others who would come after. I barely reached outward with my magic before the darkness of the curse slammed into me. My stomach clenched, and I gasped. Nadine! Lucas reached for me. 
I held a hand up to stop him. I can do this. Lucas gingerly took a step back. I could see the pain in his eyes, like he couldn't watch me do this, but didn't want to leave. No matter what it looks like, you have to let me finish, okay? I told him. Okay, he stammered. Promise me? Lucas hesitated, but I held his gaze. I promise, he told me. I knew his promise was genuine. I turned back to Marianne's grave and took a deep breath. My magic dove into the earth and traveled over Marianne's decaying bones. I could feel them with my magic, as if I'd grabbed her body with my hands. My head spun and the cemetery blurred in front of me. Pain stabbed through my gut so hard and fast that I doubled over, clutching my stomach. The magic that cast this curse had permeated the memory of the murder into her body. It was as if Samuel was standing in front of me, stabbing me through the stomach in real time. Marianne's heart-wrenching pain from the betrayal rippled through my body. The energy signature from this curse was unlike anything I'd ever experienced before, worse even than the dark magic I'd encountered when I'd killed a demonic monster last semester. No darkness could compare to the betrayal Marianne experienced when the one person she would always love unconditionally turned on her. I felt it in the magic, in the memory. Even as Samuel drove that blade through her gut, she still loved him. Her only regret was that she couldn't save him. Samuel! I screamed as my fingers curled around the edge of the gravestone. I shrieked the name in my own voice, but something about it didn't sound like me, either. My voice, the pain, it was all so heartbreaking. I knew from my practice in curse-breaking that the only way to break a curse was to transform the magic into something comparable. The only thing that came even remotely close was complete and utter destruction. Boom. The gravestone exploded, sending a blast across the cemetery. I was launched off my feet over the top of the gravestone behind me. I landed flat on my back in the snow so hard that the air left my lungs. Issa yowled as she landed on top of me. Tiny pieces of rock rained down on us. The magic had reduced the gravestone to nothing but sand. Lucas groaned from nearby, but my vision blurred so badly that I couldn't make out the stars above. The stabbing pain in my gut intensified, and I knew it was because I hadn't broken the curse yet. That was a mere piece of it, but there was far more to face. Nadine, Lucas cried as he and Oliver rushed toward me. I'll be okay, I groaned as he helped me up. I must have winced because Lucas didn't look convinced. This isn't worth it, he insisted. You're hurt, and it's only going to get worse. No, I protested. I want to keep going. Show me the other graves. Lucas froze for a moment before finally giving in. Let's keep moving. We found Sarah Davis's grave next, as it wasn't far from Mary Ann's. She'd never had kids, so the curse wasn't as intense in her bones. Still, drawing it out was like eating glass. Lucas had told me Sarah had suffered an undiagnosed illness as part of the curse. When I touched the magic inside of her, it felt as if her ailment was transferring to me. Pain landed deep in my abdomen, and fatigue swept through my body. Every joint seemed to swell. My best guess was that Sarah had suffered from some sort of uterine cancer. Add that on top of the stabbing pain from Marianne's death, and I thought I was going to hurl. Goddess... I wanted it to stop right then, but I was almost halfway through. I had to finish this. I funneled the magic into Sarah's grave. A crack like the sound of thunder filled the cemetery, so loud that Issa jumped. I yanked my hand back and saw that Sarah's grave was cracked completely in half. 
Are you okay? Lucas asked. I nodded, though I wouldn't admit how much pain I was truly in. Two down, two to go, I said in a strained voice. I leaned against Lucas as we followed Isa and Oliver. Oliver stopped in front of a grave several rows down. Adeline Gray, I said as I read the name. She was the wife of the next Reaper's Apprentice? Yes, Lucas said. She had some sort of muscular disorder, lost her leg in an accident, and then finally... Died at the hands of her child, I whispered, my mouth going dry. How'd it happen? Blunt force trauma to the back of the head. Lucas's voice was hollow. I didn't tell him that I was experiencing the physical pain of each of the victims, or he'd never let me finish this. I knelt at Adeline's grave, running my hands over the top of the stone. Adeline, I whispered, I hope this helps you rest in peace. As I drew the curse from her bones, pain twisted through my muscles, as if my flesh was being ripped apart piece by piece. I winced as her illness permeated my body. Then came the loss of sensation in my leg, and finally the ungodly pain throbbing in my head. Goddess, I gasped. My entire body trembled. Lucas knelt beside me and held me. I'm here. It was obvious in his tone that he meant more than he was saying. Just say the word and we'll stop. Fuck it. I had years of experience in unending pain. I could handle this, too. I gritted my teeth as the magic filled my body. The cemetery spun around me, and I reached for the grave, but couldn't find it. I felt Lucas's hands on mine, and he pressed my palm into the stone. Magic shot from my hands, and the gravestone shattered into dozens of pieces. One of them slammed into my shoulder, and I gasped, but it was nothing like the pain pounding in my head or twisting in my gut. Nade, Lucas started. It's fine, I rasped. I was sure Isa was nearby, but the cemetery seemed to shake like an earthquake, though I knew I was the one shaking. I couldn't find my cat. One left. I heard a meow. By now, I could barely stand. Lucas wrapped an arm around my waist. I tried to walk, but I'd lost all feeling in my left leg. I sagged against him. I wasn't sure what I looked like, but I felt on the verge of collapse. Nadine. You promised. I cut Lucas off. We're almost there. I can do this. Lucas must have picked me up to cradle me, because the next thing I knew, my feet were off the ground. I could barely keep my head up as he walked us to the final grave. I could make out Issa's and Oliver's shadows, but I couldn't read the name on the stone. Clara Sampson, Lucas said as he set me down in the snow. She was the last Reaper shadow, before you. Clara, I whispered, though I wasn't sure I actually made a sound. I wanted to say more, but I couldn't find my voice. My whole body shivered, and I lost control when I reached for the gravestone. I fell into it, face first, catching my cheek on the edge. Everything went black for a moment, but Lucas had just barely touched me when I became conscious again. The cold, wet snow stuck to the side of my face. Lucas hoisted me into his arms, and I sagged against him like a rag doll. I noticed several drops of blood in the snow, but the cut on my cheek was the least of my worries. I... we're so close, I said. We need to stop, Lucas demanded. I'm not willing to do this if it's going to kill you. It's not worth your life. I shook my head, though it was the smallest of movements. No, but it's worth their peace. Tears spilled from my eyes, and sobs racked my body. I shook in Lucas's arms, 
but I couldn't find the strength to lift my hands and touch Clara's gravestone. My trembling hand fell limp at my side, landing in the freezing snow. Nadine, they're already gone, Lucas was saying, but his words disappeared as I began pulling Clara's curse from her grave. Lucas didn't have to tell the details of her curse, because I felt them. Clara had lost six babies to miscarriages before birthing her first child. I experienced the trauma in my heart. It felt as if someone had reached into my chest and squeezed my heart with their hand, because I swore it was no longer beating. Pins and needles entered my joints. Whatever illness she'd encountered had affected her joints. But Clara's death, dear goddess, her death. I felt the fire consuming me, peeling apart my skin, layer after layer. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. I couldn't imagine a death more horrifying than burning alive. I kept my gaze on the stars as I transformed the curse with my magic, but they faded above me, as if they were burning out one by one. The gravestone beside me shattered, but that seemed like an afterthought as the cemetery faded around me. Nadine! Nadine! Lucas's voice cut through as I began slipping away. I thought he shook me, but I couldn't be sure. I'm not done, I wanted to say. I'd broken the curse on all the other women, but I'd taken it on myself. Lucas and I had crossed a line we didn't know had been drawn. I was his reaper's shadow, and I carried the burden of this curse alone. I had to break the curse on myself. The magic within me was difficult to find past all the pain. I searched for it in my belly, as I had done with my family curse before, but it didn't seem to reside there. Goddess, the pain was everywhere. That's when I realized. The curse was way stronger than the family curse I'd grown up with. This magic wasn't localized in one place. It swirled through my entire body, making it feel as if it was tearing me apart from the inside out. That's what this curse did. Emotional trauma, illness, and betrayal from those you love most. It destroyed you from the inside out until it broke you completely. Pain stabbed through my back and through my kidneys. I swore I heard myself scream, but I didn't remember opening my mouth. A deafening snap sounded, and I felt my body lurch as the ground shifted. That was all I remembered before everything went dark. Chapter 19 Lucas I paced outside Nadine's hospital room. I hadn't been able to sit still since I brought her here hours ago. I still couldn't wrap my head around what had happened how Nadine had split the earth in two with the power of the curse. The crack in the earth must have been a full foot wide and covered at least an acre. Gravestones had been upturned, and I'd caught sight of caskets deep within the crack. To be honest, I hadn't even been sure she was still breathing when I rushed into the hospital with her in my arms. I stopped abruptly as Issa stepped in front of me. I swore to the goddess the cat frowned at me. Don't look at me like that. I fucked up. I shouldn't have let her go through with it. I knew it was dangerous, but I wanted to believe she was stronger. I didn't want to be the one to stand in her way and doubt her. I should have protected her. I had no idea what Issa was thinking, or if the cat could even understand what I was saying, because she turned from me and hopped onto a chair beside Oliver. The hospital was empty because it was late, well past curfew. Nerves twisted in my gut, and it felt like I'd been waiting forever. Someone cleared their throat, and I turned to see a doctor standing behind me. You're with Nadine Evers? 
Yes, is she okay? I asked desperately. She's stable and awake, the doctor replied. She's asking for you. Thank the goddess, I cried. I rushed into the room, the cats following close behind. My stomach dropped when I saw Nadine. All the color had drained from her face, and her lips were dry and cracked. Her hair stuck up, and she had an IV hooked to her arm. I grabbed her hand. How do you feel? Are you okay? I'm so sorry. I never should have... I did it. She breathed. My eyes searched hers, but my emotions ran so high that I couldn't read her. You mean... Nadine swallowed. I broke the curse. You finished it? I asked, unsure if I believed it. I thought for certain the curse had been too much. Tears beaded at the corner of her eyes. The whole time, the curse made me feel what they felt, she admitted in a raspy tone. I don't know if it was the connection that we shared, or if it was part of being a curse breaker, but I felt their ailments and trauma and... Their deaths? I asked in a wooden tone. To think of what she'd been through tonight terrified me. If I'd known what she'd go through to break the curse, I never would have asked her to do it. It's okay, she assured me. It's gone. The pain is gone. The curse is broken. Relief flooded through me. You have no idea how incredible that is to hear. I'm glad you're all right. I really am. Nadine closed her eyes, sinking deeper into the pillow. She looked totally at peace, and that eased all my nerves. I pushed her hair out of her eyes and pressed a kiss to her forehead. I'll let you rest. Sleep well, my miracle. Nadine smiled. I will. Nadine was released from the hospital the following day, but between our exams we didn't get a chance to talk. She messaged me after lunch. I have my final with Headmaster Verla today. I'll see you at the talent show. I'd almost forgotten about the talent show. I hadn't signed up, but all our friends would be there. My protection magic final ran late into the afternoon. I barely had half an hour to grab dinner before I stopped at Nadine's room. She answered the door wearing a short black dress. It revealed quite a bit of leg, but I wasn't complaining. She carried a sparkly black bag over her shoulder. I eyed the bag curiously. The waning? She frowned. Unfortunately, my magic worked through my final earlier. I had no problem charging up the rainbow moonstone in my wand with curse-breaker magic. Verla seemed impressed. I only felt the waning around dinner time. That's not good, I sighed. Hopefully my magic will be back soon, she said. At least I don't need it for the talent show. I didn't know you'd signed up, I remarked. Nadine shrugged. It was a last-minute thing. Ready to go? I asked. She tossed her hair over her shoulder. Almost. Talia's just getting her music together. I'm ready, Talia called. She hurried over to us, carrying a stack of papers. Oliver spotted Gus and immediately rushed over to him. They tackled each other in a playful game. Issa jumped in and held Oliver to the ground. Nadine laughed and shook her head. Behave yourselves, she scolded. Save your energy for the show. I tilted my head. Issa's going to be in the show? What exactly is your talent? 
Nadine winked as we started down the hall. You're not the only one who gets to keep secrets. It's a surprise. Are you trying to kill me with anticipation? I teased. She pressed her lips together. I couldn't take my eyes off her as we descended the grand staircase. Talia leaned toward us and lowered her voice. Speaking of secrets, you wouldn't happen to know who vandalized the cemetery last night. Nadine and I exchanged a shocked expression. Vandalized? I asked. Nadine smirked, but her voice came out innocent. I have no idea who would do that. Talia snickered, like the two were speaking in code. I'm glad you guys figured it out. Oh, that. I squeezed Nadine's hand. It was all Nadine. Hold up, no, Nadine protested. You're the one who found the names. We did it together. I guess we did, I said. We reached the ballroom where a stage had been set up for the talent show. Chatter filled the room and performers in all different costumes came and went from a door behind the stage. We have to check in, Nadine said. Do you want to find us a spot? Sure. I scooped up Oliver, then caught sight of Mandy and Amy, who were sitting in a row near the front. Several chairs sat empty beside them. Nadine and Talia disappeared backstage, and I made my way over to the other girls. So, Lucas, did you sign up? Mandy asked, bouncing a little in her chair. I set Oliver on my lap and stroked his head. Yes, because I'm so talented on stage, I said dryly. Mandy frowned. Everyone has a bit of a performer in them. You just need to harness it. She even convinced me, Amy said. Well, I'm excited to see what you came up with, I encouraged, before glancing around the room. I saw the tarantulas gathered near the stage. I was shocked because they had no talent other than getting into trouble. I'd bet my wand it was going to suck. I continued to scan the room and noticed someone was missing. Has anyone heard from Grant? He's getting set up, Nadine said as she returned. I eyed her curiously. What exactly is his talent? Tell me it's not juggling. Oh, goddess, Mandy scoffed. He gave that up weeks ago. It's cool, I promise, Nadine said. She sat beside me, and Issa jumped onto her lap. Talia and Gus sat on her opposite side. Shh, Talia hissed. They're about to start. The lights dimmed and people quickly took their seats and quieted. A girl walked onto stage, though I didn't see who it was until she stepped into the spotlight. Ashley Blake, a girl from my protection magic class, stepped in front of the microphone. Welcome to the Miriam College Drama Club's first annual winter talent show, Ashley said. I hope you're ready to loosen up during finals week because we have an amazing lineup for you tonight. Singers, dancers, skits, and more. So, to all my guys, gals, and non-binary pals, hold on to your wands. It's going to be an amazing night. Put your hands together for our first act, the Treacherous Tarantulas. The crowd cheered, but I leaned over to Nadine to whisper, they actually had her call them that? Like they're some sort of boy band or something? Nadine snickered. The winning act gets $500. It's the only reason they entered. The runners-up gave gift certificates to the lounge, but it's the grand prize everyone wants. My eyebrows shot up. $500? I have to see this. Ryan took the microphone from Ashley and she rushed off stage. Hey, hey, hey! He shouted, throwing his fist into the air. He sounded like a frat boy. 
How are we doing tonight? A few people in the crowd cheered, but Ryan yelled into the microphone, I can't hear you! The crowd cheered louder, but my friends and I exchanged glances. This was more comical than anything. Let's go! Ryan snapped his fingers and music started playing over the speakers. The tarantulas formed a line. The beat dropped and they burst into song and dance. Ryan began rapping and the other four tarantulas danced exactly as if they were a boy band. To say I was surprised was an understatement. All the years Ryan and I hung out in high school, and not once had I heard him rap. I would have bet my magic he didn't have it in him. I mean, the performance wasn't great, but it wasn't a train wreck either. Nadine's jaw dropped. Who gave them a talent enchanting potion? She teased. I think it's legit, Talia whispered. I saw them coming out of the music room the other day. I think they were practicing. Damn, they really want that $500, I said. Their movements were a bit uncoordinated, and Ryan stumbled over his words a few times, but I was actually impressed. The crowd cheered when they finished. It must have stroked Ryan's ego a bit too much, because he ripped off his shirt and tossed it into the crowd. A group of girls fought over it until it ripped completely in half. Wow, what a performance! Ashley said when she reached the microphone again. She introduced the next act, and my friends and I calmed our laughter enough to watch. Kenna Farlin, a girl from my intercast magic class, came on stage next. She played a pretty tune on the flute, but she must have been really nervous because she fumbled with the notes a few times. Come on, Kenna, you can do this, Talia sighed. I've heard her in the music room. She's really good. Kenna looked about ready to puke, but she bowed at the end of her act, then rushed off stage. Onyx appeared on stage next. She was Nadine's lab partner last semester, but I didn't know much about her. She always seemed really quiet and kept to herself. Her cat followed behind her. I expected her to say something as she stepped up to the microphone. Her gaze shot around the room, and she ran her fingers through her purple hair. She opened her mouth, but she quickly snapped it shut. She didn't say a word. Instead, she grabbed the stand and moved it out of the way. The audience seemed to hold their breath in anticipation as she sat cross-legged center stage. Her nerves seemed to ease as she closed her eyes like she forgot she was in front of an audience. I had no idea what to expect. Music came over the speakers, a fast classical tune. Onyx raised her hands and light orbs blasted out of them. The crowd gasped as the orbs shot toward our faces like fireworks. My heart lurched, but the orb flying toward my face never reached me. It stopped right in front of my nose and hovered there a second before shooting up toward the ceiling. The crowd gasped as the orbs split apart, then came back together in beautiful shapes. The starry patterns spun above our heads to the music, creating unique images like flowers and diamonds. The lights pulsed with the intensity of the song. It must have taken a lot of magical control to create such intricate shapes. It was like art in motion. As the music slowed, Onyx drew back on her magic until the orbs came together on stage and touched her heart, disappearing completely. The crowd went dead silent when the music ended, then erupted into cheers. Talia whistled and shot out of her chair. The rest of us quickly followed, giving Onyx a standing ovation. She's going to win, Nadine said. She has to. That was impressive. I agreed. A few people I didn't know followed. Their performances weren't as good as Onyx's, but they weren't bad either. One girl sang, and a boy played the violin. We're up soon, Mandy whispered, before she and Amy hurried backstage. The dance team came on stage next. 
They weren't horrible, but the whole performance left a bad taste in my mouth. Probably because Lena was front and center, and I couldn't stand her. At least she didn't seem to notice me in the crowd. As the dance team was walking off stage, another dancer emerged from backstage. I couldn't tell who it was in the shadows, but I saw Lena slam her shoulder against the other girl. There was clearly some rivalry going on there. When she reached the spotlight, I saw that it was Chloe. The music began, and Chloe began twirling and leaping across the stage. The precision in which she moved looked like it belonged on Broadway. I hated to admit it, but it was pretty obvious that Chloe had been carrying the dance team on her back last semester. She had more talent in her pinky toe than the whole dance team combined. Chloe finished her dance in the splits, and the crowd erupted into cheers. Nadine beamed as she clapped for her. If Onyx doesn't win, I hope Chloe does. That was amazing. You want Chloe to win? I asked. Nadine shrugged. We're on better terms now. I mean, she's not my best friend, but I do wish the best for her. I smiled at that, but my attention was stolen by the next act on stage. Music started playing, and Mandy started across the stage, swaying her hips like she was on a runway. She wore a long black evening dress that complemented her curves well. A voice came over the speakers, but I didn't see anyone. It sounded like Ashley reading from a script. Ladies looking for their next midnight formal fashion look no further than our very own resident fashion designer, Mandy Lane. She's sporting an original gown made from satin. Notice the rhinestone details on the bodice. Ashley went on, using a bunch of fashion terms I didn't know. Mandy stopped at the end of the stage then spun to show off her dress. As she was walking back, Amy stepped on stage. She wore a dark blue dress with a crescent moon embellishment around the waist. Mandy appeared moments later in another dress, showing off for the crowd, all while Ashley read from her script. The girls showed off one more dress each before Ashley announced that the dresses would be for sale after the show. Fashion wasn't really my thing, but all the girls in the crowd seemed starstruck. I was mostly impressed that Mandy had managed to design and make all those dresses in one semester. We're up soon, Talia whispered to Nadine. Nadine nudged me. You want to come so you're not alone? I glanced at the empty chairs beside me. Sure. We hurried backstage between acts. The room was cramped with performers, racks of costumes, mirrors, and a countertop full of makeup. Talia rushed up to Mandy. That was amazing, she gushed. Your dresses are gorgeous. I had no idea you had so many designs, Nadine said. And Amy, you were such an awesome model. She was so hot. Tate rushed up and draped an arm around Amy's shoulder. Amy blushed. You really think so? I know so, Tate said, tickling Amy's side. The two giggled, and their noses got so close that I thought they were going to kiss. Nadine leaned over to Talia. Did I miss something? Talia didn't get a chance to respond before Mandy answered. They're unofficial. Mandy made air quotes, and she didn't sound pleased about it. She crossed her arms and shot daggers at Tate. Tate stepped back, and I finally got a look at what she was wearing. She wore an all-black bodysuit with glow sticks taped to her body in the shape of a skeleton. I noticed Miles across the room wearing the same thing. When are you up? Talia asked her sister. Soon, I had to hide out so no one saw my costume, Tate said. Mandy narrowed her eyes. And the glow sticks are for... Dancing, Tate said. No spotlight. It's going to look really neat. 
Tate Murphy and Miles Bryant, someone called. I turned to see it was Christine, another one of the girls from my protection magic class. You're on deck. I gotta go, Tate said in a rush, before hurrying off to join Miles near the door. I want to go watch her, Talia told us. We snuck out of the room and watched from the side of the stage. The room went completely dark when the duo climbed on stage, and the music began. Their act was way cooler than I expected, since you couldn't see them at all. Their black clothes blended in with the curtains, and all you could see was the dancing skeletons on stage. The crowd cheered when they finished. We remained on the sidelines to watch the next few acts. Alex and Shane performed a magic trick that was supposed to look like teleportation, but we all knew it was just two identical twins playing one guy. Nobody was surprised. Soon Nadine was up. She winked at me before stepping on stage. She sat on a chair that had been placed in the center of the stage. My eyebrows shot up when she pulled a Rubik's Cube from her bag and asked a few of the audience members to come on stage and mix it up. A timer projected onto the curtains behind her, and the crowd cheered her on as they watched in anticipation. Nadine shot out of her chair and shouted, Done! The timer buzzed and the projector stopped at three minutes and twelve seconds. No way! Someone in the front row shouted. That was amazing! Another person cried. Nadine beamed as she left the stage. I grabbed her around the waist when she came over to me. That was incredible, I whispered to her before brushing my lips across her cheek. She shrugged. I've had a lot of time to practice at dialysis. Don't downplay it, I told her. It's a real talent. She looked down to her solved Rubik's Cube. I guess it is pretty impressive. I enjoyed the performance, I told her. Music began to play, and Nadine swatted at me. Talia's up. Talia's fingers moved over the keyboard without missing a single note. She played an upbeat tune and sang into the microphone. It was a beautiful song, but the lyrics were kind of sad. It was all about her feelings going unnoticed by the guy she loved. You hear the thought I think out loud. My secrets are a sacred vow. But there's just one thing I can't admit, and you don't seem to hear it. She's so good, Nadine gushed. She really is, I agreed. I can't believe she wrote that. Talia bowed to the crowd, then rushed off the stage. I did it. I hit the high note at the end. I wasn't sure about it. You did amazing, Nadine told her. Oliver bumped against my leg, and I looked down at him. I suddenly noticed that Issa and Gus were gone. Uh, your cats are missing, I told them. Nadine smirked. Don't worry about it. I narrowed my eyes at them. What do you have planned? I still haven't seen Grant. He wasn't backstage. Nadine patted my chest. Trust me, okay? A few other acts came on stage but none of them were as good as my friends had been. Gregory tried his hand at stand-up comedy, but it came off as highly offensive toward women. The only people laughing were the tarantulas. Everyone else seemed pretty uncomfortable, and Gregory cut his act short. The drama club did a skit, but Felicia Green had been cast as the main character, and her performance was a bit stale. After a juggling act and a guy who could beatbox really well, Ashley returned to the stage to announce the final act. Nadine grabbed my arm. This is it. I watched the side of the stage curiously, but Grant never appeared. Instead, the lights faded until the room was cast in complete darkness. The curtains at the back of the stage parted, and I could barely make out the shape of a tall shadow. The sound of an organ blared over the speakers. 
In sync with the chord, a blast of blue magic exploded on stage. The magic lit up, billowing like smoke out of a large cauldron. I was finally able to make out the scene on stage. Grant stood in front of an elaborate laboratory setup, with endless cauldrons set up at various levels, almost like a drum set, but with cauldrons instead. He was dressed in his Phantom of the Opera costume from Halloween, complete with the white mask. He held a potion vial high above his head, like he was showing it off to the crowd. The music notes shifted, and I recognized the tune as the theme from the Phantom of the Opera. With every note, Grant placed a drop of potion into another cauldron. Colors exploded in perfect time to the music, creating flashing lights of all different colors on stage. As a long chord sounded, he placed another drop into a large cauldron and swirled his hand as the bright magic swelled upward. It looked as if he was controlling it, though I knew that was only part of the act. Grant moved from one cauldron to the next on the beat, creating a light show unlike I'd ever seen. He really got into it, too, bending his knees and moving his hands like a conductor lost in the music. And that's what he was, a conductor to the magic show on stage. Everyone's eyes locked on the flashing lights emitting from the cauldrons, but it was Grant who was the true star. The potions he'd brewed for the show were incredible and it was amazing how in sync it was with the music. Some of the magic sparkled and was gone within moments. Others glowed bright and lingered. Issa and Gus appeared from behind Grant. They each wore a small bow tie, and they held tiny potion bottles in their mouths. The cats jumped onto the cauldrons, one on either side of Grant. They balanced on the edges. I thought for sure one of the cats would fall into one of the pots, but they didn't. As the music intensified, the cats dropped some of their potion into different cauldrons, while Grant poured potions into others. It created an incredible light show that he never would have been able to pull off with only two hands working. My jaw dropped, and I leaned over to Nadine. How did you train them to do that? Issa's very smart, she snickered. I was so mesmerized by Grant's performance that I was shocked to hear a group of people laughing in the front row. My gaze darted to the tarantulas. Ryan was doubled over laughing, like Grant's light show was hilarious. It's just potions, I heard Ryan laugh. Any alchemist can do that. My hands curled into fists. This show was incredible. It wasn't something just any alchemist could do. It was obvious Grant put a lot of time and energy into coordinating his potions. I had half a mind to go over there and kick their asses, but the last thing I wanted to do was interrupt Grant's performance. It wasn't fair to him that they were being so loud in the first place. I noticed Grant's eyes darted toward the crowd, and his hand faltered. He fumbled, and the potion he held dropped out of his hands. Issa squealed in shock and fell off the cauldron she stood on. She rolled across the stage. The music continued, but the stage went black. Nadine gasped, and I went as still as a statue. Fuck, is he going to finish? I asked. Grant bailed. All I saw was his shadow racing off stage. Then he darted into the room backstage. Come on! I tugged Nadine's hand. We hurried after Grant and were the first ones backstage. Talia followed behind us. We walked in to find Grant pacing nervously. That was bullshit! I cried. Grant chewed his thumbnail. I screwed up. It wasn't supposed to end like that. No shit! I raged. You should get a redo. The tarantulas interrupted your performance. The door opened behind us, and I turned to see Ashley and Christine enter the room. Christine held her clipboard to her chest, and she shot a nervous glance to Grant. Is everything all right? Christine asked. I'll be fine, Grant started. That wasn't fair, Talia cut him off. I agree, Ashley said. 
but we can't give anyone a redo. Grant's shoulders sagged. He looked devastated. I guess I can try again next year. No, I protested. This needs to end. How? Nadine asked. You could have killed Ryan in your warlock stool, and he knows it, yet he's still tormenting Grant. I hesitated a second, but then it hit me like a stunning spell. You know what? Fuck the tarantulas. Fuck anyone who has something to say about Grant. They want someone to make fun of? I'll give them something to talk about. Nadine's brow furrowed. What are you thinking? I didn't think. I just reacted, because nothing seemed to matter right now but showing the tarantulas just what my friends and I were made of. I turned to Ashley and Christine. You have music set up? Ashley's mouth bobbed, but she quickly composed herself and answered, We can play anything you want. Then you have one more performance tonight, I stated firmly. Nadine, give me your dress. Talia's eyebrows shot up so high that it was comical. Lucas, you don't have to do this, Grant said. But I didn't listen. Nadine smirked. In front of everyone, Lucas? I leaned toward her and ran my fingers under the strap of her dress. She shivered beneath my touch. I got so close that my lips grazed her cheek as I whispered, I dare you. Nadine's jaw dropped. Lucas Taylor. Don't tease me or I'll back down, I warned her. Her lips curled into a wide smile. She grabbed my hand and yanked me behind a rack of costumes. She quickly stripped off her dress and tossed it at me. I didn't even have a moment to take in her exposed skin before I was stripping off my own clothes and pulling on her dress. It was tied across my chest, and so short it nearly showed my underwear, but it was stretchy and worked. She quickly yanked on my clothes. Thanks, I told her in a rush. I turned, but Nadine grabbed my arm. Wait, you need these. She grabbed a top hat and a cane from the costume rack and shoved them in my hands. As I emerged from behind the rack, Christine poked her head into the room. I hadn't realized she'd left. Ashley just announced you as a bonus act, she said. I've got three songs ready for you. Which one do you want? She rattled off a few pop songs, and I picked the one at the top of her list because it was the one I'd heard the most. It had even been on Dr. Mac's playlist she put together for me. Perfect, Christine said. You're up. Good luck, Nadine cried, squeezing my hand. I took the stairs on stage two at a time. I should have been nervous as hell, but I didn't give myself a moment to question it. I took center stage and struck a pose in the darkness. I faced the back curtains, with my hip stuck out to the side. The music started and the spotlight flicked on. I spun around, twirling my cane and moving my lips in sync with the lyrics. I strutted across the stage in large, dramatic motions, drawing inspiration from Mandy's fashion show from earlier. A mixture of gasps and laughter came from the crowd, stroking my spiteful ego. I could just barely make out Ryan's features from the front row. His jaw dropped like he couldn't believe it was me on stage. Hell, I could hardly believe it. But I was doing it, and it made Ryan speechless. I was fucking pleased. I twirled around, then dropped my ass to the floor, placing the cane upright between my legs like it was a stripper pole. I spread my knees and smacked my ass as I stood. The crowd cheered louder. As the beat dropped on the chorus, I grabbed my top hat and threw it into the crowd. A group of girls leapt to their feet, all trying to catch it at once. They argued over it, but I was already moving on, dancing across the stage. I made large hand gestures as the music intensified, as if I was singing the song myself, and not just lip-syncing. As the final beats of the chorus sounded, I slammed the bottom of the cane against the stage, then thrust my hips toward it in a highly suggestive manner. 
The crowd went fucking nuts. People screamed, and a few girls even stood on their chairs and cupped their hands around their mouths to yell louder. The song continued, and I got really into it. Whoever would have thought that I, Lucas Taylor, would find such freedom in dancing like a stripper in front of the whole school, and in a dress, no less. Hell, I'd never felt such a high in all my life. Just the mere satisfaction of Ryan's shocked expression was enough to keep me going. Fuck him. I did a few more suggestive motions, even putting the cane between my legs and rolling my hips over it. The crowd seemed to like that one. I became so lost in the music that I stopped paying attention to the crowd's reaction. By the end, I was on my hands and knees, spinning my head around and around, my hair flying in all directions. The song ended, and I panted as sweat dripped down the side of my face. My gaze went out toward the crowd, and they went fucking wild. Someone whistled loudly from the side of the stage. I looked over to see Grant jumping up and down, whooping and hollering. As my racing heart settled, it hit me what I'd just done. I could hardly believe I'd had the courage. Ashley stepped onto the stage, and I hurried off stage toward my friends. That was incredible, Nadine exclaimed. I took her hands in mine. You really thought so? I can't believe I did that. Did you see Ryan's face? Talia laughed. I smirked. They won't be making fun of Grant anymore, that's for sure. Grant stepped toward me. Thanks for that, man. I don't know what to say. You don't have to say anything, I assured him. Shh, Talia said. They're announcing the winner. I draped an arm around Nadine's shoulder and turned my attention toward the stage. She leaned in to me and whispered, That was really hot. The corners of my lips twitched, and I lifted the hem of the dress. You like this? She wiggled her eyebrows. I like your dancing, that's for sure. Maybe I'll have to dance for you sometime. I leaned down and kissed her. The judges have made their decision, Ashley announced. She said it like it was a big deal, but we all knew the judges were just a few kids from the drama club. In third place, Chloe Olson with the solo dance routine. The crowd applauded for her, and Chloe came up on stage to claim her prize. Ashley handed her an envelope. In second place, Onyx Fox with a light show, Ashley announced. Onyx hurried on stage as the crowd cheered. And finally, our grand prize winner, Talia Murphy with an original song. A loud round of applause filled the room, but Talia didn't move. Mandy nudged her. Girl, you won. Go get your prize. Talia's jaw dropped. I won. Hell yeah, you won, Nadine told her. You were amazing. Congratulations. Grant said, sounding happier to see Talia win than if he'd won himself. Talia scrambled forward and claimed her prize on stage. She was beaming by the time she returned. I can't believe it. There were so many good acts. You were a great act, I assured her. She smiled brightly, clutching her envelope to her chest. Let's go celebrate, Grant offered. We have almost an hour before curfew. We could grab something in the lounge. That sounds great, Talia agreed. Drinks on me. Nadine and I slipped backstage to change into our own clothes, then joined our friends as the crowd funneled out of the ballroom. We ordered our drinks at the lounge restaurant, then claimed the couches near the TVs. Everyone was here, including Miles and Tate, who were still wearing their glow stick costumes. Amy sat next to Tate and leaned her head on her shoulder. Nadine had ordered warm milk for the cats, and they gathered around a bowl and licked it up. I'm sad we didn't get to see the end of your performance, Grant, Talia said. It was really cool. Did you brew all those potions yourself? Yeah, he replied as he sipped hot cocoa. 
but I can't take all the credit. Nadine helped with the choreography, and it was her idea to use the cats. Good job to both of you, Amy praised. It was badass. She cut off as a loud group of guys entered the lounge, laughing their asses off. I turned to see the tarantulas staring at me. He's an embarrassment to warlocks everywhere, Ryan quipped, as if I couldn't hear him. What a stupid performance. I wasn't going to say anything. Screw what Ryan thought. But Grant slammed his drink onto the coffee table and leapt to his feet before I could. What is your fucking problem? He yelled. All the chatter in the lounge died, and all eyes turned toward us. Ryan's lips curled into a sneer. My problem is people like you ruining shit for the rest of us. What does that even mean? Grant demanded. His hands curled into fists at his sides. You can't handle that Lucas ditched you and found someone else to hang out with? Or are you bothered by half-bloods with power greater than anything you can imagine? Maybe our illnesses and disabilities have you uncomfortable. Or is it lesbians that trip you up? Maybe you can't stand to see your ex-girlfriend happy. You expect every woman to fall at your feet, and when they don't, something must be wrong with them. But no, it can't be your shit-ass personality. Or maybe it's the fact that the prettiest girl on campus can show you up at any time and win the talent show. You're nothing but a pathetic little child with a jealousy issue who expects the world to bow to your demands and fit into a nice little box because your fragile little ego can't handle it. Shut up! Ryan shouted so loudly that his voice echoed off the walls. His hands shook in rage as he lifted them, but Grant was faster. Grant flicked his fingers, and a powerful defensive spell sliced through the air. Ryan's shirt ripped open, as if an invisible blade had sliced his abdomen. A string of blood appeared. It wasn't very deep, but it was enough for Ryan to jump back, looking scared as shit. Grant lifted his palm, and a high-powered battle orb shot outward. It whizzed through the air so fast that Ryan didn't have time to throw up a shield. The orb slammed straight into Ryan's chest, throwing him off his feet. Ryan knocked into his buddies, and they all went tumbling to the ground like bowling pins. Ryan went limp. I was certain Grant had knocked him out. Grant stepped forward and placed his foot on Ryan's chest. The tarantulas started for him, but Miles threw up a shield and they slammed straight into it. I rushed to Grant's side, cracking my knuckles in warning. Nolan hesitated a moment, but the second I conjured my scythe, he backed the fuck off. My fingers curled around the handle. Ryan shook his head as he came to. Grant leaned down, putting more weight on Ryan's chest. You want to fuck with us? Fine. But don't be surprised when we fight back. Grant stepped back, his chest heaving. He stared down at Ryan like he was curious to see what he'd do. Ryan jumped to his feet, his nostrils flaring. His eyes darted behind us. I glanced over my shoulder to see the girls standing with their arms crossed or their hands on their hips. Each shared the same death glare, looking ready to spill blood. Fuck you, Ryan growled. You said it yourself. You're nothing but freaks. You're not even worth it. He whirled around and stomped out of the lounge. The other tarantulas hesitated, then scampered after him like lost puppies. The room remained silent for several beats, then slowly filled with whispers. Ryan wanted to act tough, but he was nothing but a coward. I turned to Grant. That was bold. It felt so good, he sighed in relief. But there's one more thing I have to do before the adrenaline wears off. Grant stepped past me and stopped in front of Talia. If I can stand up to Ryan, I can do this. Her jaw dropped as he took her hand in his. Talia, Grant said. I've been in love with you since the moment I laid eyes on you. I admire everything about you, your talent, your beauty, your magic. 
I have so much fun when I'm around you, and you just seem to get me in ways that no one else does. When you're playing music, it's like you're speaking to my soul. You hold yourself with this incredible confidence that I can't help but be drawn to. After the song you sang today, I think you feel the same way, and I can't keep hiding how I feel. I love you, Tal. Talia's eyes watered, but she was beaming. I know, Grant. So, uh... Grant stammered. Do you want to go out with me? I thought you'd never ask, she cried. Talia threw her arms around Grant and he lifted her up, twirling her around. Their lips connected and I'd never seen either of them look happier. About fucking time. My friends and I cheered and even a few onlookers rooted for them. Finally, Grant set Talia down and the two of them blushed bright red. Oh, get a room! Miles laughed. For once you have a good idea, Grant quipped. Nadine leaned into me and whispered, Looks like love is in the air. I'm happy for them. So if they take my room tonight, does that mean I get to stay in yours? I teased. She entwined her fingers in mine. I like that idea. But Grant and Talia could walk in on us in either room. Then we'll have to go somewhere else, I suggested. I've wanted to get you out of that dress since the moment I saw you in it. She bit her lower lip. It's almost curfew. If we're going to go somewhere, we'd better make it quick. I'd never turned around so fast. Uh, we're going to call it a night. Catch up with you guys later. Nadine and I waved to our friends. We hurried out of the lounge so fast that Issa and Oliver didn't even see us. It was fine, because we knew they'd get back to our dorms safely tonight. Our friends would make sure of it. Where are we going? Nadine asked. I squeezed her hand and winked. Come on. Nadine giggled as she raced behind me. We ran through the halls and a few people shot us odd glances. Eventually, we reached a deserted hallway and slowed down. Where are you taking me? She asked. I smiled. Somewhere no one will find us. I opened a door, revealing an ascending, twisted staircase. You haven't taken astrology yet, have you? She shook her head. Not yet. Then allow me to show you around the astrology tower. I offered. I dragged Nadine up the staircase and muttered a quick incantation to secure the door behind us. It wouldn't be hard for a professor to break the spell, but it'd give us a heads up if anyone tried to follow. We stepped into a room at the top of the stairs. The room was circular, set on the highest level of one of the school's turrets. With the spell that made the school larger on the inside, the tower was far bigger than anyone would guess from the outside. Dark wood flooring spanned across the room, and shelves had been built into the outer walls. They were filled with spell books and candles. The room housed a section with tables and a projector, and another with telescopes. There was even a sitting area next to a fireplace. The most amazing part of the room, however, was the domed glass ceiling. Light from the waxing crescent moon filled the room, and the stars twinkled above us. Snow dusted the bottom edge of the glass dome. Something about it seemed magical. Nadine tilted her head back, taking in the massive dome. This is amazing. She looked so happy, and it warmed my heart to the very core. You think that's cool? There's more. Her eyes brightened as I headed over to the projector and turned it on. I clicked a few buttons on the remote the professor had left there, and suddenly the night sky was all around us. Constellations projected onto the dark walls, spinning and dancing in a beautiful display. Soft music played in sync with the visuals. The program was used for teaching purposes but Nadine took it in like it was a work of art. She spun around, eyeing the twinkling stars on the walls. 
Lucas, I love it. I couldn't take my eyes off her. I love you. Her breath caught as she looked up at me. I love you too. I reached for her dress and my fingers grazed over the strap. For all the stars in the room, she was the most gorgeous thing here. Am I wrong for thinking that this is perfect? She shook her head. Tonight has been so much fun. I haven't felt this comfortable in ages. I mean, watching you dance on stage. I chuckled. Maybe we shouldn't talk about it. No, she said with a smile. Let's talk about it. I thought it was sexy as hell. My eyebrows shot up. Me? In your dress? Was... sexy? I've never seen you look so confident in that thing you did with your hips. She bit her lower lip and her gaze dropped to my jeans. The whole time you were on stage, all I could think about was how I wanted you to do that to me. I chuckled. You were jealous of the cane? Hell yeah, I was jealous, she said. I moved my hand and the strap of her dress slid down her shoulder. She didn't move to lift it back into place. Heat flared through my body and my heart hammered. Holy shit, could this be it? My mouth went dry in anticipation. I already got you out of that dress once tonight. Think I can do it again? Nadine placed her hand on the side of my face and leaned in. Her lips brushed across my cheek, then whispered the words I'd been dying to hear. I dare you to. Chapter 20 Nadine I remained curled in Lucas's arms the rest of the night. When I told him it was perfect, I meant it in every sense of the word. I never wanted the moment to end. Our first time together was unlike anything. The stars dancing around the room from the projector were like a metaphor to the unraveling of the cosmos occurring around us. When we made love, it was like we were the only two people in existence. The prophecy was right. Lucas and I were bound together, our souls entwined. Last night had proven that in the best way possible. But perfection couldn't last forever. When I returned to my dorm room the next morning, a sense of dread settled in my gut. Isa purred at my feet, which usually comforted me, but it didn't today. It was Friday, the last day of the semester, which meant tonight was our last chance to visit the dungeon before winter break and find out the truth about the nightshade dealers. Are we ready for the dungeon? I asked Talia when she woke up. She and Grant had obviously had a long night, but I suspected they'd only stayed up talking, because she was alone when I returned to our room. It's all covered. Our disguises are ready. We'll meet here in our room tonight. Talia must have noticed the worried look on my face, because she added, Are you okay? My magic doesn't feel right because of the waning. What if we need it tonight? It should be back soon, Talia said, though I thought she was just trying to reassure me. It was obvious the waning worried her. And we'll all be there. It's going to be okay. I hoped, but deep down inside, I feared what sort of answers we might find about Nightshade, and what we wouldn't. Luckily, my Miriamic Law final was a written test. I was pretty confident I passed, but at this point I didn't really care what grade I got. I was just ready for this semester to be over. The sun had already set by the time my friends and I gathered in my room. Mandy and Amy wore matching dresses, though Mandy's was black and Amy's was white. Talia had ditched her pink wardrobe for a navy blue dress as to not draw extra attention to herself, and Grant had taken extra time gelling his hair. Lucas looked hot in an open button-down shirt that he'd rolled up to his elbows. His forearms were so damn distracting. I got hot just looking at them. 
All I could think of was what he looked like with his clothes off. I had to distract myself. How will this work? I asked. Mandy held up a stack of tarot cards. I have enough tickets for everyone. I meant the disguises, I said. I came up with something that I think is going to work really well. Grant stepped forward with a proud smirk on his face. He conjured four small potions vials. It's a potion I created. Well, Talia helped. I only got you the ingredients, she said. You did the hard part. You stole the ingredients? Lucas asked. We had no other option, Talia stated. But my gift paid off. When Professor Lewis wasn't looking, I snuck into her office. My power showed me which ingredients were used for different potions. How'd you steal them, though? I asked. Aren't there wards all around school to prevent that? Talia shrugged. It must be the waning, because nothing happened. I snuck out face rooms. Face rooms? Lucas asked. Mushrooms from Malovia, Grant said. They're super rare in the coven, because the Fae don't like to trade with us unless they have to, which is why I only got four vials out of it. What do the mushrooms do? I asked. They contain trace amounts of fey magic, Grant explained. Specifically, illusion magic. The potion won't change the way you look, but people won't recognize you when they look at you either. It's like we're tricking their subconscious. This is perfect, Lucas said. But who's going to take them? There's not enough for all of us. Amy and I will go in as ourselves, Mandy offered. People know we hang out with you, but I talk to everyone. People still trust me, and Amy, well, she has connections, too. Talia tilted her head. You do? I may know someone who's going to be there, Amy admitted, but she sounded eager to change the topic. What exactly are we looking for at the dungeon? Anything we can learn about Nightshade, Lucas said. Our goal is to track down where Twisted Vine is growing so we can expose the truth. It's possible the operation is headquartered in the dungeon, but if it's not, we need to find out where it is. Nightshade didn't dry up when Magnus left town, so we have to find out who else is involved. Someone took over, and we have to stop them. We'll talk to people and search the dungeon for clues. The priestesses won't do anything without proof, though, I added. We need to be taking a record of everything we find. Pictures, voice recordings, anything. Lucas held up his voice recorder that he used in his journalism class. I'll be recording audio all night. Then let's go, I stated. I quickly changed into a cute crop top and tight jeans. After I changed, Grant passed around the potion and we drank it. I knew who my friends were based on what they were wearing, but when I looked at them, it was like I was seeing them out of the corner of my eye. That is wicked, Mandy raved. It will only last a few hours, though, Grant said. It's just past sundown, so we have until curfew to get our answers. We hurried out of the room into the basement of the school. We didn't take the cats because we didn't want to be recognized. We followed the map on the back of the tarot cards until we found the spot marked with a white dot. It was in a different place than last time, but the same door materialized from out of the bricks. Music pulsed down a long hallway lined with red curtains. At the end of the hall, we entered a room full of flashing lights and dancing students. Talia covered her ears and said something, but I couldn't hear her. The music was too loud. I leaned over and shouted, What? Exactly, she screamed back. I can hardly hear myself think. I gazed over the club from where we stood on the balcony. There wasn't a band on stage like last time, just music pulsing from the speakers overhead. A few girls had climbed on stage to dance. The dance floor was packed so tightly that it looked impossible to wade through. Students lounged around on couches, chatting and laughing, and the bar was packed. It didn't look like the bartenders could keep up with their orders. Nate and I will take the bar, Lucas shouted to the others. We'll see who will talk. Amy and I will talk to people on those couches, Mandy replied. 
See what you can get out of the twins. They're the ones I got the nightshade from, along with the dungeon tickets. I think they know more than they'll tell me. Lucas nodded firmly. We'll see what we find out. Talia and Grant were left with the dance floor. We'll survey the room for possible exits, Grant said. If nightshade is being brewed down here, the room could be hidden. We all split up. Lucas held tight to my hand as we waded through the crowd. When we reached the bar, another couple was leaving, and we pushed through everyone else to grab a seat. I spotted Christine and Ashley on the other side of the bar, laughing and clinking their glasses together. They were obviously thrilled that finals were over, but they looked a bit out of their element. I don't think they came here a lot. We waited a while before the bartender finally came over to us. When he turned, I realized that it was Alex, or Shane. I still couldn't tell the difference between them. Alex! Another! Someone from down the bar shouted, confirming which twin it was. I'll be right there, Alex called back. He set a coaster in front of each of us. What can I get you two? Lucas leaned over the bar. Could you pour us some nightshade? Alex's eyes flashed. I'm not familiar with that drink. Then perhaps you could point us in the direction of someone who is, Lucas said. Alex frowned. Sorry, friend, but I don't know what you're talking about. He was a bad liar. I tugged my shirt down a little, showing off my cleavage, and I leaned over the bar. Alex, was it? I practically sang. The voice I used made me want to gag, but it was part of the ruse. Surely my best friend didn't lie about you. She said you'd show us a good time. Alex narrowed his eyes. Who exactly is your friend? I hesitated a moment. I couldn't out Mandy, so I said the first name I thought he'd recognize. Tate Murphy? Alex chuckled and shook his head like it was typical of Tate. She ran out? Of course she did. I warned her it wouldn't last if she was going to share. I was shocked, but I didn't let it show. Alex couldn't be serious. Tate was using Nightshade? It actually made a lot of sense, now that I thought about it. There were times when Tate seemed extra bubbly, and times when she was downright depressed or laser-focused on a task. She could get irritable in an instant. I always thought maybe she had some undiagnosed personality disorder, but these were all classic signs of nightshade use. I couldn't believe we hadn't seen it. There was no way Talia knew about this. Look, I'll be straight with you. Alex said, lowering his voice. All I've got behind the bar is alcohol. If Tate needs something else, she knows where to find it. So, can I pour you a drink? Sex on the beach, I said, because it was the only drink I knew. For both of us. Alex poured our drinks, and Lucas left him a tip. We turned from the bar to look out at the crowd. I only pretended to sip my drink, because I didn't drink alcohol. Can you believe Tate's dealing? I asked. Maybe she's just using, Lucas pointed out. I shook my head and sighed. Ugh, she seems so innocent. Lucas cocked an eyebrow. Does she? I pressed my lips together. You may have a point, but she can't know anything, right? I mean, Gregory didn't. Lucas shrugged. We won't know until we ask. I looked around the room. The longer I studied the crowd, the more I saw it. Nightshade was everywhere. All around the club, people opened their mouths and dropped liquid under their tongue. They tried to be discreet about it, but it was obvious if you paid attention. If they weren't actively taking nightshade, they were certainly high on it. Dilated pupils stared back from everywhere I looked. Holy shit, it's everywhere. Lucas said as he glanced around. My eyes continued to scan the crowd, and I noticed dark hair spilling over the back of one of the couches. Tate threw her head back and laughed. Shane sat next to her and draped his arm around her shoulder. He lifted his hand above her head, and I saw the small drop of liquid fall through the air. 
She caught it in her mouth and continued laughing, like she was having the time of her life. She was already getting high. I nudged Lucas. I found her. He set his drink down. Looks like Tate has some questions to answer. We stood and started toward the couches. What's our play? Lucas asked. I smirked. I think I know just how to speak Tate's language. How good are you at acting? I can try, he offered. I looped my arm through his elbow. Just go with it. I threw my head back and laughed loudly, stumbling into Lucas like I was drunk. As we made our way past Tate, I pretended to trip, landing right in her lap. Tate looked surprised for a moment, until our eyes darted down to my breasts. I'm so clumsy, I giggled, before throwing my arm around her. Hey, girl, I hope you don't mind. Not at all, she said, pulling me closer. That must have made Shane uncomfortable, because he took his arm off the back of the couch and leaned away from Tate. Unless your boyfriend minds, she added, shooting a glance toward Lucas. Oh no, I said, wiggling my eyebrows. In fact, I'm sure he'd love to join us. Shane scowled and turned to Tate. Want another drink? Absolutely, she answered. Oh, and grab one for my new friends. Shane obviously had a major crush on Tate because he couldn't handle our fake flirting. He got up, and Lucas quickly took his spot. You're so pretty, Tate said, before turning to Lucas. Her gaze roamed over his exposed forearms. And you, sir, are handsome as hell. What are your names? My name? I chuckled, coming up with a blank. I spat out the first thing I could think of. Faith. I haven't seen you around, Tate said. We're seniors, I lied, showing her the fake alchemy tattoo on my arm. Ooh, that's hot, she practically sang, but she couldn't take her eyes off my boobs. You look like you're having a good time, I remarked. Finals are done, and this club is the best place in this school. Tate laughed. I plastered on a fake smile. Well, my boyfriend and I are looking for a good time. Think you can help us? Tate's eyes brightened. I would love to. I giggled like a drunk girl and leaned close to Tate to whisper in her ear. We heard this is a good place for nightshade. Tate snickered. You heard right. She lifted her palm, and a vial of nightshade appeared out of nowhere. The first hit's on me, she offered. Lucas and I exchanged a wary glance. You first, I practically sang to Lucas. Tate handed him the vial, and she watched him closely. I lolled my head against her shoulder and grabbed her face. You're so pretty. I love your eyes. She tore her gaze off Lucas to look at me. Aw, you're so sweet. I love your eyes, too. Even as she said it, she kept her eyes on my boobs. I wasn't sure if it was the illusion, redirecting her gaze from my face, or if she was that interested in my chest. Perhaps a bit of both. Lucas faked a dose of nightshade, then handed the vial to me. Wow, he said, like he was already high. I frowned at him. It's really something, isn't it? Tate asked. How long does it last? Lucas questioned her. It's my first time. He was distracting her while I pretended to place a drop under my tongue. Tate didn't notice we'd faked it. A few hours, she said. I placed the cap back on the vial. So this is magical, right? How's it brewed? Tate smirked. Pretty and smart. You want to brew some? I shrugged. I'd be stupid not to try. Well, I don't know how it's made, Tate said. I've never asked. But someone has to know, Lucas pressed. I mean, 
where does it come from? Tate laughed. I don't care, as long as it keeps coming. Tate was obviously here to party. She didn't know anything. Shane returned with a cocktail. His pupils were so large that his irises had nearly disappeared. It was a bit eerie. Hey, Shane, Tate said. Do you know where Nightshade comes from? What? He asked, like he couldn't believe she'd ask. No, of course not. Nobody knows. Ooh, a mystery, I sang. Do you have any clues? I don't know anything, Shane said in a clipped tone. Tate should know better than to talk to strangers. Oh, come on, Tate groaned. We're having a good time. I was starting to get sick of this game. It was obvious Tate was clueless. If Shane knew anything, he wasn't going to talk. I really didn't know how we were going to find answers. I hopped to my feet and grabbed Lucas's wrist. I love this song. We have to dance. I shimmied my shoulders and yanked Lucas onto the dance floor. I waved to Tate as we left. Shane plopped down beside her, but she leaned away from him. Whatever she said to him didn't look pleasant. I think she blamed him for scaring us away. Where are we going? Lucas asked. Somewhere else, I said. Tate doesn't know anything. We can't waste our time down here. He nodded in agreement. I turned away from the stage, only to run straight into someone dancing. A girl in a navy blue dress turned, and it took me a second to realize it was Talia. I couldn't tell at first because of the potion, but I recognized her dress. She looked confused at first. Then recognition dawned. Did you find anything yet? She asked. I frowned. Not anything helpful, but we learned one thing you're not going to like. She leaned in to hear me better. What's that? I barely heard her over the music. What? I said, what did you learn? She shouted. I still could hardly hear her. I turned to Lucas. I can't hear anything. I'm taking her to the bathroom to talk. He saluted me, since we could hardly hear each other. I'll catch up with you soon. I dragged Talia off the dance floor, and we entered the bathroom. It was still loud in there, but at least I could hear myself again. I checked the stalls, but we were alone. What's up? Talia asked. I sighed. It's your sister. She's here. I hated to be the one to tell her, but she deserved to know. Talia immediately went rigid. Her voice came out, sounding hollow. She's using, isn't she? I grimaced, but I nodded. Talia groaned. I knew it! I knew she was going to get herself into trouble. This is bad. Tate's not the type to quit. Our best way to help your sister is to stop Nightshade production altogether. Talia went silent for a few beats. I guess you're right. You haven't learned anything yet? Nothing. You? She shook her head. There are no other doorways besides the entrance and the bathroom. My shoulders dropped, and I turned toward the mirror. It was eerie seeing myself in the mirror and not recognizing myself. It could be hidden, like Grant said, I thought, concealed by magic. I reached toward the mirror, holding my breath. I thought for certain I was onto something, that my fingers would move straight through it like air, but my fingers met solid glass. I sighed. Was coming here a mistake? None of these students seem to know anything. Then maybe we have to stop looking at students, Talia pointed out. Who else are we going to get answers from? I asked. It's not like professors are roaming around the club. No, but someone must be running it, right? Just like someone is supplying nightshade to the students. I thought about it. I always assumed the club was run by students, but someone has to be supplying drinks at the bar, and this seems to be the hottest place to get your hands on nightshade. Someone's bringing it into the school. Or brewing it here, Talia added. Where, though? I wondered out loud. 
I don't know. Talia looked as hopeless as I felt when she leaned against the sink beside me. She looked around and scoffed. This feels surreal. The last time I was in here, I was crying over some loser. I'm so glad you broke up with him. Cody was awful. Talia chuckled like she knew all too well. Tal, can I ask you something? Anything, Nadine. You're my best friend. I hesitated because I didn't want to hurt her feelings. You don't have to answer this, and I'm sorry to bring it up, but I've always wondered, why didn't you report him? For what? She asked, but she knew exactly what I meant. For manipulation? Coercion? I said yes. How could I possibly prove that I didn't want to go through with it? You know as well as I do that nothing happens in this coven without cold, hard evidence. It's unfair that he got away with it, I said. I know, Talia replied, crossing her arms. I'm just glad I got out when I did. It makes me sad to think of the girl I was. I was so dependent on him. I would literally wait for him to tell me what to do. I even wanted him to tell me who to be, like I thought that would make him happier. But it never did, I said. She shook her head. No, he always just wanted more. It's totally different with Grant. I can be myself and lean on him for support, and we can both be happy alongside each other. But I think I needed to learn that hard lesson for myself before I could be with him. I'm glad you did, I said. I think you and Grant are the perfect couple. She chuckled. Better than you and Lucas? Hey now, I teased. It's not a competition. Well, who got further with their man last night? She asked. I grinned. Me? Talia squealed. I've been dying to ask. How far? That far. Oh my goddess! Talia jumped up and down. I want to hear the details. Hey, that's private, I said. But it was amazing. Unfortunately, we don't have time for details. We have to get out there and find more answers. Talia stood up straight. Yes, let's get back out there. We left the bathroom, and I scanned the club for our friends. It was so packed in here that I barely recognized a single face. Talia yanked on my arm and pointed toward the couches. There they are. I pushed through the crowd toward our friends. We reached them just in time to see Tate lock lips with Shane. I think... Amy started to say, but the conversation stopped dead as she caught sight of Tate kissing Shane. Her expression was the most heartbreaking thing I'd ever seen. She obviously really liked Tate... It had to be a knife in the gut to see her making out with someone else. I didn't know if Tate had seen Amy there, but it was a shitty thing to do. She'd been leading Amy on all semester. Mandy's gaze darted toward Amy, then back to Tate. Oh, hell no! Mandy's features contorted into rage. She stomped right up to Tate and tossed her drink all over her front. Tate jumped away from Shane and leapt to her feet. What the hell, bitch? I could say the same to you, Mandy screamed. What the fuck is your deal? Me? I'm not the one throwing drinks on people, Tate snarled. Her eyes were super dilated, and she'd obviously been using all night. You've been nothing but cold to me all semester. What exactly do you have against me? The way you treat Amy, Mandy snapped. It's unfair to lead her on the way you do, then go around making out with other people. Tate scoffed. That's none of your business. Amy and I are just having fun. Are you? Mandy challenged. Because look at her. That's not the face of someone who's having fun. That's the face of someone who's deeply hurt. She loves you. Tate crossed her arms. Then she can tell me herself. All eyes turned to Amy. She blinked a few times, and tears rose to her eyes. Mandy's right. I am hurt. I thought we had something together. We do, Tate whined. 
But I thought we were just... Whatever you thought? You thought wrong! Mandy fumed. Amy, Tate begged, ignoring Mandy's outburst. Of course we have something special. I just... Shane stood. Hold on, Tate. You're dating her? Tate's eyes flickered between Shane and Amy. I'm not dating anyone. Shane just stared at her for a minute, the look on his face very clearly read, Are you fucking serious? I'm sorry, Tate said, but that apparently wasn't good enough for him, because he whirled around and stormed off. Talia stepped forward and grabbed Tate's arm. We need to talk. Tate shoved her off. Get off me, bitch. I don't even know you. Talia looked shocked for a second before she remembered she was completely unrecognizable. She looked hopeless, like all she wanted to do was help her sister and help Amy. Apologize, Mandy demanded. Tate gaped at her. Apologize for leading her on, Mandy yelled. Amy deserves better than this. She's the kindest, sweetest person I know, and she had her heart set on you. You've been playing her all semester like some fucking toy when she deserves to be treated like a queen. I won't stand here and let you hurt the woman I love. My eyebrows shot up, and Lucas's jaw dropped from beside me. The meaning in Mandy's words was clear. Amy stepped forward. You love me? I thought you were straight. I thought I was too, Mandy said. But seeing you with Tate all semester, I got jealous. I'm still trying to figure out my sexuality, but I know one thing for certain. I love you, and I want you to be happy. You seemed so happy with Tate. Well, yeah, Amy said, taking Mandy's hands. Tate and I have fun, but she's not you. Tate gaped. Wait, what? Amy dropped her gaze. I don't know what to say, Tate. It's like you said. We're not dating. Yeah, but we're still... Tate cut off. She stared at Amy like she couldn't believe what was happening. Whatever Tate had tried telling herself, she clearly had deep feelings for Amy. Tears welled in her eyes. This wasn't supposed to happen this way! Tate shoved past them, then hurried in the direction Shane had gone. Mandy wore a guilty expression. Should we go after her? I'll check on her, Talia offered. She grabbed my arm and dragged me after her. I barely had a chance to take in what happened. Lucas and Grant looked super confused. Tate won't recognize us, I reminded Talia. Doesn't matter she said. I know my sister, and I know how she acts when she doesn't get what she wants. She can't be alone right now. I looked around for Tate, but I'd lost her. My eyes landed on a guy beside the bar. He was older than us by at least ten years, and he had long hair tied into a low ponytail. My heart stalled. He tossed his head back and placed a drop of nightshade under his tongue. He wasn't even discreet about it. At least most of the students were trying not to be obvious. He said something to Alex, then turned away. I yanked on Talia's sleeve and gestured toward the bar. One of these things is not like the others. Talia shot me a glance. You think we have a lead? I saw him at Wicked Alchemy a few months ago when I went there with Grant, I said. The lady there called him David. He was picking up a package. A nightshade shipment? Talia wondered. I'll bet you anything it was, I remarked. I think I recognize him too. From where? That night in the alleyway when we were looking for clues on the missing boys, she reminded me. He was talking to Professor Damon. I mean, he was in the shadows, but it was definitely the same build, same ponytail. He's involved, I said, knowing it with my full being. You look for Tate. I'll go after this guy. Be safe, Talia said. I started pushing my way through the crowd, but David was already on the move. He stumbled one way, then the other. 
He was obviously drunk as well as high. People closed in on all angles, and I could barely keep track of him. I pushed past people. They scowled at me, but I didn't care. A tall guy walked in front of me, and I practically tripped over him. When I righted myself a moment later, David was gone. My stomach turned to stone as I frantically glanced around the room. He was just there. Where had he gone? I pushed through the crowd again until it thinned near the bar. But no matter where I looked, I couldn't find David. Fuck. I had to get back to my friends. The more eyes we had looking for this guy, the faster we would find him. Did you find Tate? Lucas asked when I reached him. I shook my head. Talia's looking for her. I found a lead. Older guy. Long ponytail. Grant and I saw him at Wicked Alchemy. We'll start looking right away, Grant offered. We split into different groups. Lucas and I pushed through the crowd, but we couldn't find David anywhere. I spotted Talia's blue dress, but she was glancing around the club hopelessly. Lucas and I approached her. Did you find your sister? I asked. I can't find her anywhere, Talia shouted over the music. This place is too crowded. Let's keep looking, I insisted. I didn't know how much time passed, but I was getting more and more frustrated. They could have left the club already, and we missed them. I was about ready to give up when I spotted Tate climbing the stairs to the balcony. She stumbled into people. The poor girl looked like she barely knew where she was going. Tall, I cried. I found your sister. We raced after her, but we were swallowed by the crowd. I tried to keep my eyes on Tate, but I couldn't. Lucas disappeared somewhere behind me. It must have taken us five minutes before Talia and I reached the top of the balcony. And that's when the scream started. My heart came to an abrupt stop. Two bodies lay sprawled across the floor, unresponsive. My stomach dropped at the sight of Tate and Shane clutching empty vials of nightshade. Talia's high-pitched scream tore through the club, chilling me to the bone. I immediately dropped to Tate's side and felt for a pulse. It was there, but it was faint. She's alive, but she's overdosed, I cried. It didn't matter what Tate had done earlier. She didn't deserve this. Nobody deserved this. Talia's knees buckled, and she pulled her sister into her lap. She shook her like she might wake up. Talia screamed her sister's name so loud that I was sure the whole club could hear it over the music. Panic set in, and my heart began to race. I rushed over to Shane, but horror twisted in my gut when I felt for his pulse. I felt nothing. It was already too late. The moment I realized it, the entire club fell silent. Someone had turned off the music, and all the chatter died. The only sound was the terror-filled cries racking Talia's chest. Tate! No! Wake up! Wake up! My head spun. I could hardly process that there was a dead body lying in front of me. We need a medic! Someone shouted, but I didn't see who. That snapped me out of it, and I began chest compressions on Shane's lifeless form. Someone rushed to my side, an older girl I didn't know. We're grad students in medical studies. We can help. I quickly got to my feet and moved aside. Her friend knelt beside Tate. The girl quickly assessed Shane, but her features fell. He's gone. My hand slapped over my mouth, and I backed up slowly. I didn't even realize how far I distanced myself until I stumbled into a group of onlookers behind me. Talia sobbed while the other med student looked over Tate. She has a chance, but we have to get help immediately, she said in a rush. I'm on it. Her friend leapt to her feet and raced out of the club. She's going to make it, isn't she? Talia sobbed. Tell me she's going to make it. The med student hesitated. The tears beating at her eyes said it all. It's going to take a miracle. We'll do the best we can, she said. 
People yelled and cursed from behind me. I turned to see my friends break through the crowd. Goddess, Lucas breathed. What's going on? Grant demanded. His eyes went wide when he saw Tate lying there. Tate's overdosed, I said in a hollow tone. Amy's hands shot over her mouth. Oh my goddess. I'm so sorry, Mandy breathed, staring in horror. I didn't think... It's not your fault, I told her. Talia's entire body shook as she stood. She stared down at her sister in horror, like she couldn't believe what she was seeing. Slowly, her horror turned to vengeance. Her hands curled into fists, then whirled toward me. We're finding that dealer. Now. I stopped her. Tal, attacking him isn't going to change this. She glanced around at the onlookers, then yanked me down the hall toward the entrance. Our friends followed. Attacking David won't save her, but finding that wand can, she insisted once we were alone. The alchemy wand can affect all alchemy magic, which means it can halt the effects of nightshade. This was caused by magic, and it can be reversed by it too. She was right, but finding the wand in time could be impossible. What if we don't find it? I asked. Tears streamed down Talia's face. We have to try! By now, the club had returned to chaos. Alex had reached the balcony. He wailed as he held his brother to his chest. Voices layered over one another, and I could see people on the balcony moving to get a better look. Everyone was trying to get answers about what just happened. Someone stumbled out of the crowd, making a break for the exit. He stopped in his tracks the moment he saw us blocking his path. Rage flared in my belly. That's him, I growled. David started to back up, but Lucas threw up a shield behind him. David stumbled to the side. He was obviously really drunk and could hardly stand on two feet. Grant and Lucas lunged at him in unison. They grabbed him by the arms and shoved him against the wall. Where's the nightshade? Lucas demanded. David's head lolled to the side, and he didn't answer. Lucas wasn't having it. He smacked the side of his face to keep him awake. David's eyes sprang open for a second. I'm not going to ask you again, Lucas snapped. Where's Magnus's operation? Where's he brewing nightshade? Where's the cauldron? Tell me! David mumbled something, but I didn't hear it. What's he saying? Grant cried. Get off me! David sneered. He swung his arm out and knocked Lucas in the face. That really pissed me off. I stomped straight up to him and grabbed him by the collar. Look, asshole, a student died tonight because of your drugs. Another overdosed and may not make it unless we find the cauldron you and your boss are brewing this stuff in. You say that like I give a shit, he snarled. Look at her! I screamed. I grabbed his face and turned it toward Tate. She lay just beyond the end of the hallway. The med student barked orders to keep everyone back. Look at her and tell me you don't care. David gritted his teeth. A death looks pretty bad for your profits, doesn't it? I said. Not to mention that I'm a priestess with the power to burn you at the fucking stake. So unless you want to be charged with homicide, I suggest you tell us exactly where to find that cauldron. David's eyes widened slightly, but apparently not enough to clear his head, because he didn't question whether I was a priestess or not. With the spell I was under, he couldn't recognize me. His eyes darted down the hall toward Shane's lifeless body. Nightshade wasn't supposed to hurt anyone. Magnus promised no one would get hurt. It's too late for that, Grant snarled. No one else has to get hurt, Talia begged. Please, my sister's life is at stake. Alchemy, David rasped. Yeah, we know, Grant said. Nightshade is made by alchemists. No, 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 David shook his head. Wicked alchemy. 
It's being brewed there. I shot a glance at my friends. Magnus owned the shop, but there was no way they were running a nightshade operation out of it. Was he playing us? There's hardly anything there. That shop is tiny. There's a hidden room, David admitted. It can only be accessed by alchemists. David sagged against the wall in his drunken stupor. I smacked him. How? A spell? A potion? Potion. A powder, he mumbled, but that was all he said. His eyes rolled back into his skull, and his knees gave out. Lucas and Grant dropped him. Fuck, Lucas growled. He whirled around and shouted at the med student. We've got another one. Still breathing, but barely. Everyone off the balcony, right now, she screamed. Students clamored down the stairs. The chatter was deafening. We have to go to Wicked Alchemy and find that hidden room as soon as possible. I started, but I cut off when three professors burst through the door. Professor Richards halted in his tracks. His jaw dropped when he saw the scene at the end of the hall, but his features quickly turned to pure fury. He was always one of my favorite professors, so gentle and kind, but tonight he looked downright scary. The professors barely looked our way as they rushed past us. A group of nurses came in behind them. They immediately conjured stretchers and got to work. Students! Professor Richards yelled over the club. The entire crowd froze, and the room went dead silent. This party is officially over. Professor Richards' voice boomed over the crowd. The priestesses have been notified of this incident, and they have decreed a mandatory gathering. This is not a request. You will be escorted from these premises and to the lawn where the priestesses will address this matter. Nobody is to return to their rooms. But what if we need our coats? A girl asked. I recognized the voice in the crowd. It was Christine. Her voice shook, and she sounded terrified. I didn't think she nor Ashley knew what had really been going on in this club. Yeah, Ashley agreed. It's freezing out. Your rooms are being combed for nightshade, Professor Richards announced. At this moment, every dormitory in the university is under evaluation. You are not allowed to return until the searches are completed. Gasps traveled around the room. They're going to search our stashes, too, a guy exclaimed. Professor Richards heard, and he was pissed. You have nothing to worry about if you're innocent. Professor Richards continued talking, giving students orders to move to the lawn while the nurses lifted the bodies onto the stretchers. My friends and I turned toward each other. Amy shook. I... I'm freaking out. There's still nightshade stuff in my room from when we were working on figuring out the formula. They're going to find it. Fuck, Grant growled. He obviously felt responsible for leaving it there. Mandy's voice shook. What's going to happen to Amy if they find it? Jail time? Amy guessed. For all of us, maybe. It's too risky to go back to our rooms right now, I whispered. That could get us into even more trouble, and we don't have the time. Tate's life is in danger. We have to get to Wicked Alchemy tonight and get the alchemy wand so we can save her. Maybe we can kill two birds with one stone, Lucas suggested. The alchemy wand can remove all traces of alchemy magic, so even if they find Amy's setup, they won't know it's nightshade. They'd assume it was something else. Yes, that's perfect, I agreed. It's the only way for us not to get caught. We just have to find some way to sneak away without being noticed, Talia said. Our illusion is still working, Grant pointed out. The professors may not even recognize us as students. Except look at what we're wearing, Talia pointed out, gesturing to her dress. Lucas lowered his voice. It's how many of them against all of these students? Sneaking away shouldn't be hard. Amy wiped her nose. I can't leave Tate. This is my fault. 
No, it's not, Mandy insisted. I'm the one who started the fight. Let's not argue about who's at fault, I said. Amy and Mandy, you go to the infirmary and stay with Tate. We need someone with her anyway to let us know if the wand worked. Talia? I can't sit here and do nothing. I'm going to find the wand. I need to save my sister. Her eyes glistened as she watched them lift Tate's stretcher. Wait! Amy cried. She and Mandy rushed toward the medics. We're her friends. We're coming with. The nurses shot a glance toward Professor Richards. He was an alchemy professor and had Amy in a bunch of his classes. He knew she was one of the kindest, smartest students at the school and that she could be trusted. He gave a gentle nod and the nurses gestured the girls to follow. Wait, hold on, Grant hissed. How do we know if this will work? We don't even know if the wand will choose us. I swallowed the lump in my throat. We have to believe that it will, because it's our only option. I hoped our gamble paid off, because if this didn't work, Tate would die, and there'd be no telling what would happen to the rest of us. Chapter 21 Lucas Rocks settled in my gut as we were escorted from the dungeon by school staff. I couldn't quite wrap my head around what had happened. Shane was with us one moment, then gone the next. And Tate might not make it. I wanted to hurl, but none of us were given a chance to grieve, or even to process it, really. We had to get that wand, and we had to do it now. We were herded like cattle to slaughter through the halls of Miriam Mansion. Nobody spoke. All I could hear was the sound of marching footsteps. The whole thing felt ominous and foreboding, so much that the hair on my arms stood. I tried a few doors as we passed, so we could duck inside and sneak out, but they were all locked. Nadine shot me a worried look. We were nearing the main foyer, and we didn't have many more chances to leave. My gaze darted toward the grand staircase, and she nodded. I grabbed her hand, and the four of us ducked behind the staircase. My heart hammered as the students passed by us, as if waiting for someone to notice us crouching there. My heart stalled when I saw who was bringing up the rear of the crowd. Headmistress Verla wore a stern frown, and she kept a close eye on every student. I thought for sure she was going to spot us. But she passed by without noticing. I released a shaky breath when the sound of footsteps faded outside. I poked my head around the edge of the staircase and saw we were in the clear. I gestured to my friends. Come on. We darted out from under the stairs and sprinted down the hall toward the side entrance. Sneaking out of the school was easy. We crept to Nadine's car and she kept the headlights off so we could make it off school grounds without being noticed. By the time we lost sight of the crowd, Nadine stepped on it. How much time do you think we have? She asked. I shook my head. No idea. Let's just pray this works. Talia's voice shook. Nadine slammed on the brakes when we reached the catwalk. I shivered in the cold, and snow crunched under my feet as we snuck through the darkness. It was late enough that all the shops were closed, but I kept throwing glances over my shoulder. This place was really eerie in the dark. Wicked alchemy appeared ahead, but something hit me just then. Fuck. I growled under my breath. What is it? Grant asked. We didn't think of the wards. I smacked my forehead. How are we going to get past them? I can break it, Nadine said confidently. It's just like breaking a curse, right? Have you ever done it? Talia asked. No, Nadine admitted. But I just have to move the magic. What about the waning? I pointed out. You've been struggling with magic for days. It's coming back she said. And if the waning is affecting those wards, it may be a blessing in disguise, the same way Talia obtained those face rooms. We approached Wicked Alchemy, and Nadine raised her hands. There's a ward, but it's weak. It shouldn't take much. A battle orb exploded out of Nadine's palm, and it slammed into the front window. The sound of shattering glass filled the street. We all froze, but the catwalk remained silent. 
no alarms went off. It was rare for the coven to use regular alarm systems because our wards were better. But not tonight, apparently. Nadine winced. Oops, I transformed the ward into battle magic. I didn't mean to lose control. Well, that's one way to get inside, I said as I stepped toward the shattered window. I kicked a few shards of glass out of the way, then climbed through the window. I helped Nadine over the glass, and Grant helped Talia through. I turned toward the dark shop, eyeing the items on the walls like they might hold answers. I tossed a light orb into the air. It hovered there, casting the room in shadows. Where do we start? In the back, Nadine said, starting for the door at the back of the shop. They must have supplies to brew the potion that will reveal the hidden door. Aha! Uh -huh. She threw the door open and wore a proud smirk. I followed her into the room, my light hovering overhead. The room was small, no bigger than ten feet across, with storage shelves along the outside wall. Between the shelves sat a table with all kinds of potion ingredients. Talia nearly tripped over the rug in the middle of the room as she entered, but Grant caught her. Do you have any idea what potion David was talking about? She asked him. Grant looked unsure. I might have an idea. Nadine hurried over to the potion ingredients. She grabbed a handful of alchemy stones that lay there. Then let's get to work. Grant eyed the potion ingredients. This, this, and maybe this? No, this. How can I help? Nadine asked. Um, crush this. Grant shoved a mortar and pestle toward her, along with a jar full of herbs. He grabbed a bowl and moved frantically, like he wasn't quite sure what to do. I hated just standing there. I had to do something. I nudged Talia and pointed to a stack of books on a nearby shelf. Maybe they keep the spell nearby. Good idea, Talia said. We hurried over to the spell books and began flipping through them. My eyes scanned the pages quickly, but these were all liquid potions. David had said we had to make a powder. I tossed that book back on the shelf and flipped through the next one. Meanwhile, Grant and Nadine mixed together potion ingredients. Green light filled the room as Grant worked his magic into the mixture. Then, boom! The potion exploded. I jumped and looked up to see particles flying everywhere. Grant's face was black with soot and his hair stood on end. Nadine coughed and fanned the powder out of her face. Grant cleared his throat. Well, that was clearly the wrong spell. Hold on, I think I found it. Talia cried. Revelare pulvis. That means revealing powder, right? Loosely translated, yes, Grant said, sounding excited. Talia slapped the book onto the table, and Grant looked over the spell. It's a little more complicated than I thought. But you can do it? I asked. Grant smirked. I can do it. Everyone stand back. Nadine came to my side, and I wrapped my arm around her waist as we backed into the corner. Grant worked quickly, but his measurements were precise. This time, when his green magic lit the room, it began to swirl into a vortex above him. The powder in the bowl lifted into the air, entangling with his magic to create a glowing powder. Watching him perform the spell was like viewing the northern lights. It was beautiful, but we didn't have time to admire it. The magic swirled back into the bowl and dimmed. I did it! Grant cried. Excellent. Now how do we reveal the doorway? Talia asked. Grant reached into the bowl and grabbed a handful of powder. We'd have to place the powder over the door to reveal it. Like, here maybe? We all held our breath as Grant tossed the powder against an empty section of wall. Nothing happened. Hold on, let's think about this, Nadine suggested. There's nothing beyond that wall but the forest, right? What if it's a portal? Talia theorized. I doubted it. The coven's portal magic isn't very good. A space-bending spell, maybe? Grant thought aloud. It's possible, I said. Or... Nadine stepped to the middle of the room and pounded her foot on the rug. 
We need to go down. Of course. I grabbed the corner of the rug and yanked it up, tossing it aside. Grant grabbed another handful of powder and tossed it onto the floor. In front of our eyes, the hardwood floor transformed, revealing a trap door beneath our feet. We found it, Nadine breathed. The croc is here. I pulled the trap door open and stared into the dark chasm below. Let's go get it. I guided my witch light into the hole and it illuminated a ladder below. I climbed down at first and looked around. The room was the same size as the one above, almost a near replica. It was filled with all types of storage, extra potion ingredients, empty vials like the ones Nightshade came in, and a bunch of brooms piled in the corner. But there was no crock of death. Come on down, guys. I called up to them. It's safe, but I don't see the... I cut off when I turned around. Behind me stood a large door built from worn wooden planks. Large iron hinges stretched across the door, and the big handle looked ancient. A shiver ran down my spine. Iron. To deter the fae. We were definitely in the right place. My friends gathered at the bottom of the ladder. That looks... creepy, Talia said. Could it be dangerous? I stepped forward. Of course it's dangerous. The croc of death is behind there. Magnus did his due diligence keeping it a secret, but we won't know what danger we face until we try. Lucas! Nadine warned, but I already placed my hand on the doorknob. I expected a spell to blast me back or something, but instead, a voice filled the room. I jumped back, totally taken off guard. I'm the door of mystery from high magic evolved. I open only when my puzzle is solved. The voice wasn't male nor female. It appeared to be coming from the door itself. A riddle? I said thoughtfully. You speak in strange fragments. You're wasting my time. The door of mystery responds only to rhyme. I pressed my lips together. Um, okay. We're seeking passage. Let's meet in the middle. You'll let us through if we solve your riddle. You have yourself a deal, as fair as it is. Be quiet, listen closely, for your riddle is this. I'm in the beginning, but I'm not part of time. I'm at the end of everything. Now you must solve my rhyme. I turned to my friends, my brow furrowed. What's at the beginning and the end, but not referring to time? Maybe it's spatial? Like the beginning and end of a string? Grant theorized. Nadine pressed her lips together. We have to read between the lines. There has to be a clue inside the riddle. I can figure it out, Talia said brightly. You know the answer? I asked. Not exactly she admitted. But if others have answered the riddle before, I can get a vision of it. Talia walked to the door and splayed her palm across it. She concentrated for a full minute before dropping her shoulders. The riddle changes every time. I don't know the answer. Nadine began pacing. Hold on. I'm in the beginning, but I'm not part of time. I'm at the end of everything. She muttered the riddle over and over. Well, what's at the beginning? Grant said. The Big Bang, right? But that's part of time, Talia pointed out. The beginning of what, then? Grant asked, sounding frustrated. The riddle, maybe? I theorized. But that makes no sense with the end of everything. I got it, Nadine cried. It's the letter G. It's in the word beginning, but not in the word time, and it's at the end of the word everything. Nade, that's great! I whirled back toward the door of mystery. You think you're clever, but we solved it, you see. Your riddle is simple. The answer is G. The doorknob clicked. We did it! Grant exclaimed. Way to go, Nadine! Talia praised. Nadine shrugged. Let's keep moving. 
The door swung open, and my witch light illuminated the space beyond. A long, narrow hallway stretched so far that we couldn't see the end of it. It had to be a space-bending spell, because nothing else made sense. A vine that looked like black, twisted branches grew along the floor and up the walls. Each vine was covered in a layer of slime that shimmered beneath my light. Twisted vine, Grant said. Tons of it. The cauldron must be at the end of this hall, Talia whispered. Timidly, she stepped forward, watching carefully to avoid the vines. But they grew too close together. She stepped on one, and my heart lurched. Everything happened so fast. The vines snapped outward, wrapping around her legs. Talia screamed as the plant yanked on her. She fell flat on her back and was pulled several feet away from me. The vines dragged her down the hall. I lunged for her and threw myself onto the vines. Our hands connected, and Grant and Nadine grabbed my legs to pull me back through the doorway. Hold on, Tal! I yelled. I've got you! I pulled with all my might, but the vines tugged harder on her legs. They began to curl around her middle, like snakes looking for their next kill. My heart hammered as I tried to overpower them. Vines grew around my torso, but I ripped them off with my free hand. I conjured a battle orb and threw it into the vines along the wall, the ones that were creeping toward her. The orb sizzled against them like the vines had been burned. The vines even let out a hiss as if they were screaming out in pain. It was enough to give us a chance. It's working, Nadine cried. Do it again. I tossed another battle orb at the vines along the opposite wall, and the same thing happened. Grant aimed an orb near Talia's feet, and it struck just inches below her shoes. Several of the vines retreated, but as the injured one shrank away, more and more came in for the kill. I let my anger take hold, and I formed a high-powered battle orb in my fist. I grabbed one of the largest vines in my hand and let the battle orb go. It exploded through the network of vines, searing them with rippling purple magic. My friends yanked on me one last time, and Talia and I broke free. We landed in a heap in the other room, gasping for breath. Holy shit! Talia cried, throwing her hand over her heart. Someone should have warned me that the twisted vine was alive. Of course it's alive, I said, trying to catch my breath. It's a plant. Talia frowned. You know what I meant. I had no idea it would do that, Grant said. But we can't walk down this hallway if the vines are going to attack us. There must be another way through, Nadine remarked as she got to her feet. Talia stood and took a cautious step toward the open doorway. Be careful, Nadine warned. But the twisted vine didn't reach out for her. It seemed confined only to the hall. Maybe I can figure out how Magnus did it, Talia thought aloud. She placed her hand on the doorframe and closed her eyes. Her eyebrows knitted in deep concentration. Anxiety twisted in my belly. I didn't know how much time we had left. Talia's eyes shot open. The brooms. I looked at the pile of brooms in the corner. What are we supposed to do, fly them? I said sarcastically. Yes. Talia said with a straight face. Holy shit, she was serious. She walked over and grabbed one. They must be infused with mentalist magic because I saw Magnus riding one in my vision. Headmistress Verla said brooms can be enchanted to fly, Nadine said. She took one and spun it in her hands, inspecting it. As if deeming it safe, she mounted the broom and shot me a smirk. Who wants to go first? I will. I said firmly, snatching up a broom. It could be dangerous. We don't have time to stand around talking about it, Grant said. I climbed on my broom, but it went nowhere. How do you do this? Well, it's mentalist powers, Talia pointed out. Which means the magic connects with the mind. Just tell it what to do. I cleared my throat. Um, okay, up. The broom tossed me upward so fast that I lost my grip and flew across the room. I landed on my shoulder several feet away. Nadine slapped her hand over her mouth and laughed. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have laughed. Are you okay? I grimaced, though I had to admit it was kind of funny. Peachy. I mounted the broom and guided it up slowly this time. 
then took off down the hall like a bullet. I moved so fast that my hair blew back from my face. I nearly disappeared into the darkness before I conjured another light and kept it speeding beside me. Whoa, this is insane, Grant cried from behind me. Um, I need to get myself one of these, Talia said. Agreed, Nadine called. We sped down the long hall, but the twisted vine didn't react like it had before. It was like it didn't know we were there at all. My light shimmered against something ahead, and I realized we were coming to the end of the hall. The corridor widened to a larger room. I slowed my broom and flew downward. I jumped off the broom as soon as I entered. It was a storage room of some sort, no bigger than a classroom, with tons of shelves lined with potion ingredients, as well as barrels and boxes I couldn't see inside of. My friends landed behind me, and I sent my witch light toward the ceiling to illuminate the space. My breath hitched when I saw it. A cauldron, sitting on a table at the center of the room. It was a decent size, but not huge. It looked like it could hold at least five gallons of brew. It was beautiful, with twisted handles that resembled tree branches and a shiny black finish. It looked exactly as I would imagine a fey goddess's crock would. There was no doubt about it. We'd found the crock of death. Chapter 22 Nadine the magic hit me the second I walked into the room, tugging at my guts and twisting my insides. I stumbled as I dismounted my broom. Lucas caught me. You okay? I stood straighter. I can sense the magic. It's really strong. Grant stepped forward. Let's get to work on this brew so we can get the wand out. Wait! I cried. All eyes turned to me, and my voice shook. The magic I'm sensing, it's a curse. Something Mother Miriam had said to me came back. The first wand lies inside the cursed cauldron, as you predicted. You, Nadine, must be the one to pursue the alchemy wand. Mother Miriam knew, I whispered. Lucas eyed me. What do you mean? She visited me recently, I said. She said I had to be the one to find it. I know why now. Because I need to break the curse upon the cauldron. I stepped toward the cauldron. The magic intensified the closer I got. What's the curse? Grant asked cautiously. I ran my fingers over the rim of the cauldron, studying the energy signature. I'm not sure exactly. Let me see what I can learn, Talia offered. She stepped in front of the cauldron. She closed her eyes and flattened her hands on either side of it. Her eyebrows pinched together like she was thinking hard. Her eyelids fluttered and she swayed on her feet. Grant steadied her. Tal, you okay? He asked, shaking her. She didn't respond and my pulse quickened. Talia! I yelled. She snapped out of her trance and stumbled backward. Whoa, this magic is very strong. What did you see? Lucas asked. Talia's breath wavered. Nadine's right about the curse. It's ancient. The Fae cursed the cauldron to backfire on a witch's brew and steal your magic. My eyebrows shot up. Lucas... Do you remember what Hattie told us about Nightshade? She said the Elementi had tried replicating the brew, but that something was missing. Yeah, the crock, he said. I think it's more than that, I replied. I think more specifically, this curse is the unique ingredient. Like the magic is leaching into the brew and causing Nightshade's side effects? Grant asked. I nodded. That must be why the withdrawal symptoms are so intense, why going off Nightshade makes you lose your magic. Nightshade wouldn't exist without the cauldron's curse. The room fell silent for a moment. How did your grandpa use the crock then? Lucas wondered. 
If it's cursed not to work for anyone, did he actually accomplish what he set out to? Worry twisted in my gut when I realized there was a very real possibility that my grandfather's spell never worked. The wand might not be in the cauldron. Let me look into the history of the crock again, Talia offered. If Nadine's grandfather made it work, I can see how to make it work for us. Talia placed her hand on the cauldron again. She stood there for a solid minute, swaying on her feet as her eyelids fluttered. The visions must have been intense, because Grant held her upright. I pressed closer to Lucas, worried about what Talia might find, or not find. Finally, she pulled her hands away. Nicholas didn't break the curse, but he tamed it. He used alchemy crystals to brew the potion. So the wand is here, for sure? Grant asked. Talia swallowed. Yes. To retrieve it. I need to tame this curse, I finished for her, and my magic is only at half power. Talia nodded. But there's more. To retrieve the treasure inside, the person who brews the potion must drink it. What happens then? I asked in a hollow tone. Talia's tone wavered. You have to prove your intentions to the cauldron, or suffer." Grant swallowed. Suffer how? I, I don't know, Talia stammered. She shook off a shiver. The vision is unclear. There was just so much screaming. Grant lifted his chin. I'll do it. Grant, no, I protested. We don't know how that potion could affect you. The croc only refuses people who are seeking its material riches, right? Grant asked. We're not here for that. We're here to get that wand to save people, to save Tate, and to end the waning. I can do this. We don't know what the croc will decide, Lucas pointed out, sounding worried. We have to try, Grant insisted. Tate might not have much time left, and I'll be damned if I let Talia's sister die without trying to save her. We need that wand. I've broken down the nightshade formula. I can brew the potion. But then you have to drink nightshade, Talia cried, sounding horrified. But it won't be nightshade anymore, Grant pointed out. Not once Nadine breaks the curse. The curse is what made this brew nightshade in the first place, right? Please, guys. I can do this. I have to do this. I'll suffer if I have to, because the coven needs this wand. I hesitated. This was dangerous, but Grant seemed pretty damn certain, and I trusted him. We need to make a decision now, I stated. Not just for tonight, but for the future of every wand we find. How much are we willing to sacrifice to save the coven's magic? The room went silent as we all considered the question. Talia spoke up first. I don't care about the other wands. Right now, all I care about is saving my sister. But to ask any one of you to suffer for her in ways I can't imagine, this isn't fair. This is our magic we're talking about. Grant emphasized. I waited my whole life to get my magic, and my entire future is based on my powers. I mean, every decision we make about our lives ties back to our magic. What we're going to do? Who we're going to be? Hell, half the coven decides who to date based on their cast. I want to be a culinary alchemist someday. I love brewing potions. If you say you don't feel your magic is a part of you, then you're a liar. It is, I agreed. I didn't grow up knowing about magic like you guys did. I wasn't prepared for this. But even losing my magic for a day or two with the waning is downright miserable. Without it, it feels like I'm missing a piece of myself. We all have unique gifts, and magic is an expression of that. I don't want to give that up. Lucas cleared his throat. 
I spent so much time struggling with my gift, but actually giving it up? I don't think I could anymore. I'm going to be a reaper someday, and if there's no apprentice, what happens to all those last thoughts? So many more people would be trapped here and be unable to join Mother Miriam and Alora. It's because of my gift that people can move on. Our magic isn't our own identities. It's the coven's. If we lose our magic, we lose our entire way of life. Our whole damn religion. I'll go through hell and back to make sure that doesn't happen. Talia hugged herself. The last thing I want is to see any of my friends suffer. The room went silent, and her words hung in the air. She didn't want to do this. But that's exactly what will happen if the waning continues, she finished, and my shoulders sagged in relief. To see the coven lose its magic, it would break us. Hell, it's already tearing us apart. We just witnessed a hanging. So, yeah, I'll suffer to find these wands and stop this. Whatever it takes. A weight seemed to lift from my heart. Then let's break this curse. How can I help? Lucas asked. I glanced around the room. I need something to shift the magic into. If the curse backfires, then I can transform it into something reversed. Make water dry up, make fire turn to ice, something like that. Lucas rushed over to a shelf full of potion supplies. Here, spear a cacti. He held up a jar with a phallic-looking cactus inside. What does that do? I asked. Wards off evil spirits. He paused. Yeah, probably not the best one. We don't need to attract evil spirits. I got something. Grant grabbed a jar from the shelf and set it on the table. Inside was a sparkling white liquid. The label read boneweed juice. What's boneweed? I asked him. It's a plant that grows on the edge of cemeteries, Grant explained. It's usually used in medicinal potions for enhanced strength. I eyed the extract. If this is being used in Nightshade, this is what makes your magic stronger when you're on it, isn't it? Grant nodded. I'm certain of it. So, if you reverse its properties... I can weaken it, I said. This will work. I'm ready. I closed my eyes. I placed one hand on the cauldron and held the jar of boneweed in the other. The curse felt like thick, swirling liquid against my palm, like I could physically touch it, but not grab onto it. I concentrated a while longer, until finally guiding the magic through me. Except it didn't budge. What's wrong? Lucas asked. I opened my eyes. It's resisting me. The curse is strong, and I'm... Lucas placed a hand on my shoulder. Even with a fraction of your magic, you're a strong witch. Hell, you broke the Reaper Shadow Curse. How does this one compare? It's intense, but it's different, I said thoughtfully. The way the Reaper Shadow affected several people, it's like it was rooted deeper. This one is tough, but the curse doesn't run as deep. Then the waning has nothing on you. Lucas encouraged. He was right. If I could break the Reaper Shadow Curse, I could break this. Waning or not. Okay, let's try again, I said. I clutched the bone weed and focused on the magic inside the cauldron. The magic was different than anything I'd ever felt, because it was a fey curse. I'd only worked with witch curses before. It was different, but familiar enough that I managed to entwine my magic with it. I yanked back and drew the magic out of the cauldron, then funneled it into the bone weed. I focused on changing the intention of the spell and reversing the effects of the juice. The more I moved the magic, the easier it became, until every last drop of magic entered the bone weed juice. Twang! 
Like a rubber band, the curse slingshotted through me and back into the cauldron. I gasped and yanked my hands backward. The jar of bone weed nearly toppled over onto the table, but Lucas caught it. What is it? he asked. I shook my head. I don't know. It was going fine, but as soon as I thought I finished, the spell undid itself. It's like the bone weed couldn't hold it. Talia tapped her chin. The cauldron is really powerful. Maybe this curse is tied to the magic inside of it? Which means we would need something just as powerful to hold the magic, I thought aloud. Grant began shuffling through the ingredients on the shelf behind us. There's nothing here that powerful. The best we have is unicorn hair. But that's peanuts compared to the croc. We need a whole damn unicorn. What about us? Lucas asked. No, I objected. I'm not putting dark magic into one of you. Temporarily, Lucas said quickly. Until we get out of here and can redirect the magic again. We don't have time for anything else. We need to get this wand. Then I won't do it, I stated firmly. Nade, we just said we'd do anything for these wands, Lucas pointed out. I can take a little dark magic for a while. You can change the intention to anything you want, as long as it's comparable in intensity, right? I'll be safe. I crossed my arms. You're asking me to curse you. I won't do it. Lucas eyed me a few moments longer, as if waiting for me to change my mind. Finally, he grabbed the boneweed juice and set the jar back in front of me. Then our only option is to try again. Fine, I said. I will. This had to work, because no way was I putting this magic into one of my friends. I wrapped one hand around the jar and placed the other on the cauldron, closing my eyes again. This time, the magic came out of the cauldron easier, now that I knew what it felt like. I changed the intention of the magic, turning it into a weakening spell. The magic funneled into the boneweed juice. I pushed harder and harder, until I felt no resistance at all. I breathed a sigh and stepped backward, and the magic remained where I'd put it. I did it, I said as I opened my eyes. Horror hit a moment later, when Lucas stood there, clutching the top of the jar. With my eyes closed, I hadn't noticed. Lucas! I cried. You... you... I had to, he said with a heavy sigh. We need the wand. You stood there the whole time, I accused. I funneled that magic into you, not the bone weed. I told you I'd sacrifice myself for those wands, Lucas insisted. I wasn't lying. Well, I never said I'd sacrifice you. Let me undo it! I reached for him. He jumped back. Not until Grant brews that potion. I looked toward my friends. Talia stared in disbelief, but Grant jumped into action. I'll get to work right away he said in a rush. I don't know what I've done, I cried, my voice cracking. I reached out for Lucas and noticed instantly how weak and frail he looked. The color had drained from his face, and he blinked slowly. Lucas, you're so weak. I'll be fine, he insisted. I wanted to believe that, but the second he said it, his legs buckled. I caught him, and Talia gasped. She rushed over to help me guide him to sit on a barrel. I grabbed his face in my hands, and my eyes searched his. He lifted his gaze, but his eyelids drooped. The witch light above our heads dimmed as his magic became weaker. You're too brave for your own damn good, I told him. Is bravery a bad thing? he asked. If it's going to get you killed, yeah, I said. How are we doing, Grant? I've got everything, he cried, tossing an armful of ingredients onto the table. How long? I demanded. I, I don't know, he stammered. Talia rushed over to Grant. 
Tell me how I can help. Shake this up, he said, shoving a bottle of boneweed juice toward her. I turned back to Lucas. I'm so sorry. Don't be, he rasped. I volunteered. Tears beaded in my eyes. I didn't know how long Lucas could hold on to this magic. You're lucky I love you, because I'm pissed. He squeezed my hand, but it wasn't very hard. I am lucky. Grant lit a fire beneath the cauldron and began mixing the ingredients. Some of the ingredients were benign, things to change the viscosity or potency of the magic. He stirred in the boneweed juice, then added clippings of twisted vine from one of the jars. My eyes widened when I saw the shimmering unicorn hair, which seemed to glow on its own. As soon as Grant dropped the hair into the potion, it began to bubble. He stirred it a few times, then announced, It's ready. We all froze at once. Grant was a great alchemist. He had no problem brewing this potion. But that wasn't the hard part. He grabbed an empty jar and scooped it through the dark liquid. His hands shook a little as he brought it to his lips. Are we sure about this? Talia blurted. In my vision, I saw screaming. I saw madness. I can handle that, Grant said gently. Trust me, Talia. No one got a chance to respond, because Grant threw his head back and chugged the potion. The liquid inside the cauldron began to bubble violently, snapping and steaming. Smoke billowed out of the crock and quickly filled the entire room. It had a strong scent that burnt my nose, like wine, but stronger. My friends and I started coughing. I squeezed my eyes shut tightly and fanned the smoke out of my face. A deep, animalistic growl filled the room, and my entire form went rigid. My head snapped in the direction of the sound, but I saw nothing except darkness as the smoke dissipated. Lucas's witch light was almost out. Talia took a step back and stumbled into the shelf behind her. What was that? Part of the ritual? I asked breathlessly. Or a protector of the cauldron, Grant squeaked. He tossed a witch light into the air, and my breath hitched. In the corner of the room stood a monster unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It had the body of a canine, but it had to be the size of a horse. Its head looked like the skull of a deer. There was no fur or flesh, just exposed white bone. Steam puffed out of its nose, and red eyes glowed from its bony eye sockets. But unlike a deer, it didn't have antlers. Instead, large, pointed horns protruded outward, looking like they'd impale anything that stood in the creature's way. Its long tail cracked like a whip, and my heart leapt when I saw there was a spike on the end of it. What the fuck is that? I yelled. Uh, that's a cane door. Lucas's voice shook. It's a monster, Talia cried. I grabbed Lucas's hand tight in mine, but the cane door took my slight movement as a threat. It lowered its horns and leapt at us. I immediately yanked Lucas to the side, and we landed hard on the ground. The cane door plowed straight through the barrel Lucas had been sitting on a moment ago. Its horns pierced straight through it, and dark purple liquid spilled onto the floor. Talia shrieked and raced to the other side of the room. What does it want? I think it's pissed that I finished the potion, Grant shouted. I bet Magnus put it down here to protect his brew. The cane door shook its head, then spun toward me and Lucas, eyes blazing red. I quickly tried conjuring a battle orb, but nothing happened. Lucas lifted his hands, but his magic wasn't working either. Fuck! I screamed. Same! Lucas cried. The cane door lunged for us again, swiping out a heavy paw. We scrambled to our feet and jumped behind the table, 
Wood splinters went everywhere as its claws sliced across the table leg. My magic's gone, I screamed. Lucas and I rolled under the table and hurried to the other side of the room. I've got nothing, Lucas said breathlessly. What the hell is happening? Talia screamed as she lifted her hands. It looked like she was trying to conjure a shield, but it didn't work. Grant tried too, but not so much as a spark came from his hands. This was the literal worst time for the waning to hit. The cane door jumped onto the table. It growled, sending a shiver down my spine. Sharp teeth seemed to grow from beneath its bony features. There has to be something in here we can use, I cried. Grant and Talia shrank into the corner. What are we going to do? Grant asked. Strangle it with unicorn hair? The cane door's eyes roamed over us, as if trying to pick its first victim. Its eyes stopped on Grant and Talia. In the blink of an eye, it kicked off the table. I instantly grabbed the first jar my hands could find, and I chucked it at the cane door mid-flight. The jar shattered over the side of the monster's face, but it didn't do anything to stop its trajectory. Grant pushed Talia out of the monster's path. They got out of the way just in time for the cane door to slam into the shelf behind them. Jars shattered, and potion ingredients spilled everywhere. A piece of glass spun across the ground toward me, and I bent to pick it up. Lucas took a large piece of wood from the broken barrel in his hands. The cane door was blocking the door to the hallway. Even if we wanted to escape, we couldn't. The only way out of this was to fight back. Lucas threw a jar at the cane door. Hey, you freak! Come and get us! Guys, no! Grant shouted, but it was already too late. The cane door's sharp claws dug into the stone floor. He threw himself at us. Lucas swung his weapon, and it thwacked against the cane door's face. The creature became momentarily disoriented, and that's when I lunged. I pierced the sharp piece of glass straight into its chest, then jumped backward. Blood oozed from the wound, but it didn't seem to phase the cane door one bit. The monster shook its head, then swiped its claws outward. I heard the tearing of fabric as its claws sliced through the top of Lucas's jeans. My boyfriend cried out in agony, and he fell to his knees. Three long, jagged wounds marred his upper thigh. I took one look at the blood, then screamed at the top of my lungs. You fucker! I grabbed another broken bit of barrel, one with a sharp, jagged end. I planned to stake him straight through the heart, but I wasn't fast enough. The cane door threw itself at me and reared its head. A sharp, pointed horn entered my abdomen as he lifted me upward. I screamed as pain seared my belly. The cane door tossed me to the side, and I rolled across the ground until I came to a stop at Lucas's side. He panted in pain. I clutched my stomach, and blood poured through my fingers. No! Talia shrieked. It's just like the screams in my vision. Get back! Grant yelled at her. The cane door must have had one goal, to incapacitate, because once Lucas and I were down, it turned its sights on Grant and Talia. We'll kill it together! She screamed back. Grant wasn't interested in letting Talia make any sacrifices. The cane door leapt toward them, growling like it was out for blood. Grant shoved Talia aside, and she tumbled to the ground. He threw himself toward one of the brooms we'd left by the door. He spun around just as the cane door came up behind him, and he aimed the handle of the broom at its eyes. I gasped as the broom entered one of the eye sockets and stuck there. The monster stumbled backward, throwing its head in one direction, then another, as if trying to toss the broom from its eyes. Talia didn't have time to get up or roll out of the way. The cane door stepped on her hand, and she screamed in pain as its claws sliced through her skin. The monster began to freak, its tail whipping over and over again, smacking against Talia's side. 
The pointed end sliced her cheek, and she screamed. Her cries of pain were unbearable, but I couldn't move with red-hot pain throbbing through my gut. I caught Grant's horrified features from across the room. I'd never seen him look so pale. I sucked air between my teeth when I tried to move, but I was in too much pain. The broom flew out of the cane door's eye, and the creature whirled around to the three of us. Blood oozed from its eye socket, but its good eye burned an even brighter red. I barely had a chance to take a breath before the cane door bared its sharp teeth and leapt in for the final kill. He could take us all three in one blow. I just knew it. No! Grant screamed. I saw a flash of movement out of the corner of my eye. Grant swooped downward on one of the brooms. He jumped off the broom mid-flight and threw himself between us and the cane door. Terror leapt in my chest because I knew the monster's teeth would clamp around his middle, and he'd be gone. I squeezed my eyes shut tightly. I couldn't watch. A thud sounded, and the cane door's growls vanished. A beat passed before I truly processed it. I peeled my eyes open, only to realize that the pain in my abdomen was gone. Grant lay in front of the three of us on his side, as if ready for the cane door's attack, fully prepared to die for the three of us. But the cane door was nowhere in sight. I glanced around the room and saw that the shelves were back in order, apart from a few shattered jars that we'd thrown. Anything the cane door had touched, the barrel, the table, and the shelves— looked like they hadn't been bothered at all. Lucas, Talia, and I slowly sat up. The confused looks on their faces matched mine. After a moment, Grant pushed himself up, too. Where'd the monster go? It must have been an illusion, I said. I quickly looked down to my abdomen and ran my hand over the area, but it was fine. I turned back to Lucas, but his pants were untouched. Talia was unharmed as well. She lifted her palm, and an orb formed inside of it. Our magic was back, too. Of course, Lucas said. The cauldron belongs to the Fae. Illusions are their thing. So it was a test, Grant realized. Magnus didn't put the monster here at all. Talia got to her feet, though her knees shook. It must have been. Did I pass? Grant asked breathlessly. I don't know, Lucas admitted. We all stood and hobbled over to the cauldron. My fear melted away when I saw something bobbing up and down inside the brew. The alchemy wand floated to the surface. It was identical to my grandfather's drawing. Grant threw his hand over his mouth. I... I did it! You sacrificed yourself for us, Lucas pointed out. You showed the cauldron that you would use its treasure for good, that you would die to save the coven. Talia's worried features transformed into a smile. Go on, Grant. The treasure is yours. Grant reached inside the cauldron, and his hand curled around the handle of the wand. When he lifted it, a breeze swept through the room, rustling his hair. The wand itself began to glow a bright green. Tendrils of magic swirled out the end of the wand and twisted up his arm. "'What does that mean?' I asked, glancing between my friends. Lucas's eyebrows shot up. I think it means the wand chose him. So Grant has control over all alchemy magic? Talia asked. I, I guess, Grant stammered, like he couldn't believe it. I'm going to end Nightshade. Right now. I'll take only Nightshade magic and leave the rest. Grant spun the wand, and the tip of it glowed white, intensifying so brightly that I had to cover my eyes. A beautiful note rang out from the wand, as if it was singing. Whoosh! Magic blasted through the room with such power that I had to grip the edge of the table to keep from being knocked over. 
It was beautiful, incredible magic that seemed so powerful, yet calming. Once the magic settled, Talia was the first to speak. Is Nightshade over then? Is my sister saved? I think so, Grant said. Let's call Amy to be sure. That won't be necessary, a voice came from the corner. My heart lurched, and I turned to see a woman step out of the shadows. She donned a black cloak, like the ones the priestesses wore. She reached up to pull her hood down, and my breath hitched when I saw who it was. Priesta Stella. My first instinct was relief. Stella was the only priestess I remotely trusted. But the hairs on the back of my arm stood, and I instinctively knew this wasn't right. You've done well, students. Stella held out her hand. Now give me the wand. I stepped in front of Grant. How did you find us? I saw you leaving the school, Stella said. I was worried about you, Nadine. I shot a wary glance at my friends. The illusion spell we'd taken earlier tonight had worn off by now, but she couldn't have recognized us when we left. She's lying, Lucas accused. Anger and betrayal twisted in my gut. What are you really doing here? I demanded. Trying to stop this, Stella insisted. Nightshade killed a man tonight. It's my duty to protect the coven and bring an end to this. I shook my head. It didn't make sense. Why wait until we had the wand to reveal herself? She must have snuck in while we were fighting the Kandor illusion. Every instinct in my gut told me I couldn't trust her. I don't believe you. Stella sighed. Fine, Nadine. You want to do this the hard way? Because I can play dirty. She yanked a wand from her cloak and pointed it at me, but my friends and I were just as quick. Lucas and I conjured our wands and aimed them back, and Talia and Grant formed battle orbs. I couldn't cast strong magic right now. Hell, conjuring my wand felt like casting battle magic. And Lucas wasn't exactly up for spells either, not with the weakening curse still inside of him. But Stella didn't know that. She stilled when we lifted our wands. It was you all along, Lucas fumed. You burnt my parents' house down. Rage flared in my bones. I had trusted Priesta Stella. You were working with Magnus and framed Professor Daniels because she was going to expose you, I sneered. She didn't acknowledge our accusations. Instead, she simply said, The alchemy wand belongs to the Imperium Council. The wand belongs to Grant, Lucas countered. It chose him, which means it trusts him. If the Council cares so much about these wands, they'd trust him with it too. A student? Stella sneered. That wand belongs in the hands of a priestess. I'm a priestess, I reminded her. But being a student makes me less, doesn't it? I thought you felt differently about me. I recalled the heart-to-heart -heart we'd had that night outside of Octavia Hall. Stella had told me how she always felt out of place on the council, because she didn't have as much experience as the others. I thought we had really connected. Now I saw she'd only been manipulating me. You used me, I accused. Please, Stella scoffed. It's not like I knew you were going to discover the crock of death. I already knew everything you brought to the council. None of it was useful. Though I didn't know the cauldron was cursed. Well done, Nadine. Stop it! I snapped. Don't compliment me like I did you a favor. You're admitting you knew about the cauldron before I told the council. You knew the alchemy wand was inside. Why didn't you tell the others? Because I was going to find it, she cried. 
I spent years being cast aside as the youngest and least experienced member of the council. I was never taken seriously. When I discovered that the cauldron went missing from the council, I set out to find it. I found out where your grandfather had hidden it, right under our noses in Octavia Hall. That drawing you showed the council wasn't the only clue to what the cauldron held. He left other drawings and notes behind in the Imperium records. When I found out what he'd done, I dedicated my life to acquiring that wand. When I turn the alchemy wand and the crock of death into the council, I will finally get the respect and appreciation I deserve. But you're not an alchemist, I said in a hollow tone. The pieces began to fall together in my mind. So you hired Magnus to help you? Yes, he also proved useful in distribution, she admitted. He was the businessman, but I formed the alliance with the Elementi to trade for unicorn hair. I sent Magnus away to protect him. So what's Nightshade, then? I asked harshly. She smirked. A happy accident. I needed some incentive to keep Magnus working for me, and money does quite the talking. But of course, Nightshade has its advantages, too. With the Elementi civil war mounting and the unrest in Malovia, it's only a matter of time before races, like the Elementals and the Fae, bring their fights to us. Nightshade could prove to be a very viable safeguard against war. It has quite the effect on the magic of our enemies. And the waning? I demanded. Did you manufacture that, too? What was it? A way to sell more Nightshade? or a way to draw out the Oaken Wands. I have nothing to do with the waning, Stella growled, like she was offended I'd even suggested it. But that's exactly why we need Nightshade and the Wands, to stop what's coming. And what exactly is coming? Lucas demanded. Terror filled Stella's eyes, and I knew this ran a hell of a lot deeper than profiting off Nightshade. You've foreseen something, I accused. Her tone became hollow. Death, destruction, so much fire and screams of terror. I sense people's futures, and I know that whatever is coming for the coven is going to tear us apart. We must stop this before it begins. It already has begun! Talia cried. A boy died tonight because of your nightshade. You hanged Professor Daniels. Layla Daniels was an unfortunate casualty, Stella screamed. I did what I had to, to protect the coven. My stomach twisted. You planted the evidence on her because she was asking questions about nightshade. She was on to you, wasn't she? Layla Daniels didn't know what she was getting herself into, Stella sneered. If she exposed me, she risked everything I have worked for to protect this coven. You don't care about the coven, I cried. If you did, you would have told the other priestesses about the cauldron a long time ago. All you care about is your honor and respect, and you've lost it. You're killing people in the name of preventing war, but in doing so, you've started one. I was so disgusted with her that it made me want to hurl. I was ashamed that I ever thought I could trust this woman. No, she shouted. I'm ending this before it begins. A few sacrifices are nothing compared to the carnage I have foreseen. Grant's nostrils flared. What exactly do you think is going to happen when the priestesses find out what you've done? Stella chuckled. Oh, they're not going to find out. I already know how this is going to end. One of you is going to die here tonight, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. You're threatening us? I snarled. I'm stating a simple fact, Stella said. I have foreseen it. 
and the three of you who do get out of here won't talk. You sound so certain, Lucas said through gritted teeth. You already know what lengths I'll go to, Stella replied, as if to demonstrate, she added. It really is too bad about what happened to your friend, how they found the nightshade in her room, how she was caught dealing nightshade to the boy who died. My entire form shook with horror. What did you do to Amy? I demanded. Like I said, sacrifices are required, Stella replied bluntly. I was done listening to her. She'd framed my friend, and she wasn't going to get away with it. I flicked my wrist, and a defensive spell flew from the end of my wand. But with the waning affecting me, I had almost no magic left to give. I'd used up all my reserves breaking the cauldron's curse. The spell was a dud. Stella reacted quickly. A battle orb flew from the end of her wand and slammed into my stomach. I grunted as the air left my lungs. I flew off my feet and landed hard on the ground. Suddenly, spells were flying everywhere. Grant and Talia threw orbs at Stella at the same time Lucas tossed up a shield. Stella's next spell slammed against his shield. He held it just long enough for her spell to fizzle out, but the shield collapsed a second later. The curse I'd cast on Lucas was getting worse. He couldn't hold his magic for long. Lucas rushed to my side, and I staggered as he helped me to my feet. Nearby, Talia and Grant threw spells at Stella, but she'd created a shield to protect herself. Each spell bounced off and ricocheted back in our direction. You evil witch! Talia screamed. We have to break through her shield and immobilize her! I cried to Lucas. I can hardly cast, he said. I grabbed a jar from the shelf. We'd have to do this the old-fashioned way, like we'd done with the cane door. I hurled a jar at Stella. It shattered against her shield, spraying a gooey black substance everywhere. It didn't hurt her, but it surprised her enough to cause her magic to falter. Grant's battle orb connected with her shield, and the shield shattered. Talia was so pissed that when she swiped her hand through the air, a cut opened on Stella's cheek. Stella gasped, and Talia's eyes widened, like she couldn't believe she'd managed the spell. It was banned in our classes, but anyone was capable of it if they were angry enough. Stella touched the wound, and her fingers came away from her face, coated in blood. She narrowed her eyes at Talia. You little bitch! Leave her alone! Grant cried. He threw another spell that buzzed with so much magic, I was sure it would stop Stella's heart. But she tossed her hand upward and created another shield. The spell slammed straight into her shield and exploded. Stella kept her sights on Talia. She flicked her wand, and Talia screamed. She dropped to her knees and cradled her face in her hands. Lucas and I hurled more glass jars at Stella. Her shield fell. One hit her square in the shoulder, and the other connected with her hip. Amateurs, Stella scoffed. She thrust her arm out, and a defensive spell hit us like a truck. The spell shot Lucas and me backward. My head slammed into the corner of a shelf, and pain shot through my skull. I heard Lucas grunt beside me. We both crumbled to the ground like rag dolls. Above us, the shelf contents teetered on the edge. I squeezed my eyes shut tightly as jars tumbled to the ground around me, breaking into pieces. I peeked my eyes open to see a large jar land on Lucas's head, knocking him out. No! I screamed. Lucas's chest rose and fell, but that didn't stop hot tears from beating in my eyes. Lucas and Talia were both down, and I had almost no magic left. We just weren't strong enough to go up against a priestess. She was one of the strongest witches in the coven, and we were barely halfway through our studies. 
I tried to get to my feet, but pain radiated through the back of my skull. You're wicked, Grant shouted, and he blasted another spell at her, but a quick swipe of her hand caused it to fizzle out. She scoffed. You're nothing impressive. I can't imagine why the alchemy wand chose you. Stella lifted her palm and spun her wand around at the same time. A spell I'd never seen before blasted from her hands. It touched both walls and spread through the room in the blink of an eye. The blast was so powerful that it sent me rolling across the floor, closer to Lucas. Grant and Talia were both blasted into the walls. Grant slumped against the wall on the other side of Lucas, who lay unconscious beside me. I clutched my wand tight in my hand, but my head pounded. I couldn't cast a spell, even if I wanted to. Stella's shoes clicked across the floor as she approached us. Grant groaned, but he winced when he tried to move. Stella leaned down and snatched the alchemy wand out of his hand. That's not yours, he yelled. Stella laughed. It is now. Talia sucked a deep breath from across the room. She pulled her hand away from her face, and I saw the damage for the first time. My stomach twisted at the sight of the large gash across her cheek. Blood poured freely down her face. You're not going to get away with this, Talia warned her. Stella clicked her tongue and stepped between Lucas and me. I foresaw a death, but I didn't think I'd be the one to choose who it would be. She sounded pleased, and it made me sick. You don't have to kill one of us, I said in a strained voice. You want to change the future? Start right now. I can't let you go, Stella said. Perhaps I'll kill all of you. What a tragedy that would be. A priestess and her friends, killed by a twisted vine on their search to end Nightshade. You want to make me a martyr, I sneered. You're right, she said. Perhaps it's better to make you the bad guy. I'm sure I'll come up with something to motivate the coven. You're evil. A strained voice came from beside me. I looked over to see that Lucas had come too, but the curse was taking over. All the color had drained from his face, and he could barely move. Stella threw her head back and cackled. She stopped abruptly, and her gaze snapped in my direction. She leaned down and growled. You and your friends are naive and weak. A priestess always does what has to be done for the coven. If you can't see that, you don't deserve the position you've been blessed with. Stella stepped on my chest, pressing down so hard that I couldn't catch a breath. I kicked out my legs, but it was no use. I grabbed her leg and tried to yank her off of me, but she wouldn't budge. My gaze darted toward Lucas. His eyelids drooped. I'd always been so good at puzzles, but I couldn't see my way out of this one. My hand curled tighter around my wand, even though there was no spell I could use with it. But as I clutched it in my grasp, I remembered something. No, I told Stella, my voice draining. I don't kill innocent people. You're the weak one. I curled one hand around her ankle and reached for Lucas with the other that held my wand. My fingers touched his, and I felt the magic in my wand surge. The rainbow moonstone crystal I'd infused with Cursebreaker magic earlier that week began to glow. Draining the magic inside and filling me with the power I'd lost. Magic ignited in my chest, as if my heart had begun beating for the first time in hours. I felt the dark magic I'd placed into Lucas, and I latched onto it, funneling it out of him and through me. Stella's eyes widened when she saw my crystal glowing. She lifted her foot off me, but I held on as tight as I could. She went to take a step back, but Lucas kicked his leg out, and Stella tripped over him. 
the alchemy wand clattered to the ground. Stella landed flat on her back, but I never let go of her. Magic swelled inside of me, rattling around like it wanted something to latch onto. Something powerful, like a witch. I let the dark magic explode out of me, blasting through Stella and permeating her every cell. Stella gasped as the magic took hold. What have you done? she demanded. Stella yanked away from me, but the damage had already been done. Stella had taken on the curse, and it made her weak. She grabbed the edge of the table and hobbled to her feet. She could barely stand. What have you done? she cried. I pushed myself upright. I'm taking you to the priestesses. The coven deserves answers. I'll be burned at the stake, Stella screamed. I'll fight to prevent that, I insisted. No one needs to be burned or hanged again. Stella's voice shook. That's exactly what's going to happen. It's what I've foreseen. Visions can be changed, I said, getting to my feet. My head pounded, but I managed to stay upright. No. Stella took a step backward, but her knees shook. I don't answer to you. She whirled around and grabbed one of the brooms near the doorway. You're not going anywhere, Lucas shouted. He'd regained his strength and leapt to his feet. I saw the fury in his eyes. Stella had wronged the coven too many times. She would rot in prison for her crimes. Stella mounted the broom, but Lucas shot a stunning spell across the room. She kicked off, and the spell hit the end of the broom, throwing her off balance. Stella screamed as she went flying forward. She flipped through the air, straight into the twisted vine. Her shrieks echoed through the room as the vines whipped around her legs and twisted across her middle. My stomach lurched, and I raced forward. I grabbed her hand, but the twisted vine was already pulling her down the hall. Help! I screamed to my friends. Talia scrambled to my side, and she yanked on Stella's other hand. Lucas and Grant followed behind. We all pulled on Stella, trying to free her from the twisted vine. By now, the vines had curled around her legs so tightly I could only see her from the waist up. Terror filled her eyes, and her screams pierced my heart. Don't let me die, Stella cried. We won't, I screamed. No one else has to die. Hold on, we've got... Stella's hand slipped from mine and my stomach dropped out of my abdomen. The twisted vine yanked so hard that she was dragged several feet away from us. She screamed out in agony, but a vine slapped across her mouth, silencing her cries. Within moments, the vines had grown over the top of her and pulled her into their thick roots. Stella had vanished. I clutched Lucas's shirt and curled into him, he went rigid, then shivered. She's dead, isn't she? I whispered in a hollow voice. Lucas swallowed audibly and held me tighter. He must have heard her last thought. She's gone. Talia and Grant shared a sorrowful look. Everything had happened so fast, and there was nothing we could do to stop it. Lucas couldn't tear his eyes from the twisted vine. His body trembled, and my heart broke into a million pieces for him. This was nothing like when I'd killed those witches. This was an accident, yet I knew Lucas would spend the rest of his days feeling remorse. It wasn't your fault, I assured him. You didn't mean to hurt anyone. No, but I did. Lucas's voice cracked. Apart from that, I couldn't read him. He was a statue, pushing his emotions so deep down that they didn't show. I didn't think he could face it right now, because Lucas got to his feet. His voice became strong as he announced, 
We need to get the wand and the crock out of here. I stared up at him, wondering how I was going to help. Lucas just killed somebody, and the weight you carried after something like that never went away. I would know. But we would have to deal with this later. We didn't have a choice. Lucas is right, I said. We have to move. Stella framed Amy for Shane's death, which means she's in danger right now. Amy had risked everything to help us find the cauldron, and because of that, her life was on the line. We needed to do whatever was in our power to stop this. Otherwise, her blood was on our hands. Chapter 23 Lucas The sound of Stella's cries echoed in my ears. I couldn't quite wrap my head around what I'd done. Stella had died because of me. The weird thing was, it didn't feel like I thought it would. Stella had destroyed my childhood home. She'd killed an innocent professor, and she was responsible for the death of one of my classmates. Damon was dead because of her, too. She had framed my friend, and only the goddess knew what danger Amy was in now. It was like death and destruction followed Stella everywhere she went. Stella was guilty of the most severe crimes against the coven. Perhaps her death was justified. Conflicting emotions swirled in my gut. It wasn't fair of me to judge Stella and carry out her sentence, but I'd be damned if I wasn't the slightest bit relieved that she was gone. I learned to accept Nadine for what she'd done to those witches at Pinewood Manor all those months ago, but I never truly understood it until now. The coven was safer now that they were gone. Stella had foreseen a death tonight in that basement. She thought it'd be one of us, but it had been her death. Stella's last thought played through my mind. The coven will suffer for this. The thing was, I didn't believe that we would suffer for her death. We would only suffer for the war she started when she was alive. I conjured a coat and wrapped it around Nadine's shoulders. I knew how her illness flared in the cold. It's going to be cold out there. Let's get going. Grant grabbed the alchemy wand and subconjured the crock of death. We mounted our brooms and sped down the long hallway. We flew through the door of mystery and straight up the trap door. I led the way through the broken window in the shop. I didn't even bother going back to the car because the brooms would be faster. It was a straight shot back to the school. We flew over the treetops and high above the buildings. The cold December air bit at my face, but I didn't care. If Stella was telling the truth about Amy, then we didn't have much time. What the hell is that? Nadine shouted over the sound of the wind. I narrowed my eyes toward the school. The peaks of Merriam Mansion were lit by an orange glow coming from somewhere on the ground. When I noticed the light flickering, my heart fucking stopped. Goddess, Grant cried. It's a fire, Talia screamed. Horror crept up my spine. We all realized it at the same time. Fuck, I growled. The lawn came into view. I suddenly felt like I'd flown into a brick wall. Below us, students and professors gathered around a huge fire. My heart fell out of my chest when I saw that four stakes had been placed in the center of the flames. The fire must have only just been lit, because it was quickly spreading through the stick bundles surrounding the four stakes. Screams echoed through the night. There was a mix of all types. Pain, terror, protest, and even support. They're burning people at the stake! Nadine screamed in a trembling tone that made my insides twist. We have to put out the fire, I yelled back. I didn't pay attention to what my friends were doing as I surged downward toward the flames. All I could focus on was the four people who were tied to the posts. My stomach lurched as four familiar faces came into view. I took in the scene in mere moments. Amy trembled from the first stake, 
and tears streamed down her face as she tried to hold her head out of the smoke. Next to her, Professor Ward had been tied up. She spat profanities at the crowd, as if she wanted them to know how much she hated them. Beside Professor Ward, two other girls sobbed, begging for their lives. Ashley and Christine. My whole form shook against my broom when I realized what was happening. Stella hadn't just framed Amy for Nightshade. Somehow she'd convinced the council to burn the others. I'd bet my magic it was because they'd been looking into the Oaken Wands. Three priestesses stood at the front of the crowd, looking on with proud smirks like they'd just caught a gang of serial killers. Police officers surrounded the fire like they were protecting it from the crowd. Each held a burning torch in their hands. Snow melted and sizzled around the fire. Several people I recognized stood at the front of the crowd. Miles held back Mandy, who was screaming and sobbing. She looked ready to go on a murder spree, but the police would kill her if she made a move. These witches have been charged with conspiring against the coven, Priestess Margaret announced. They've worked alongside Leela Daniels in producing and distributing a deadly potion called Nightshade. A man has died tonight because of them, and the punishment is death. Priestess, please, Headmistress Verla pleaded. There must be another way. Their sentence is justified, Lillian sneered. You will stand back and allow this to happen, or you will be charged with treason yourself. I reached the fire and swooped down beside Amy and hovered there. Heat swept over me, and I immediately began to sweat. I conjured my scythe and swung it toward the rope securing her to the post. A few strands broke, and I swung again. Hey! A deep voice boomed from behind me. Somebody stop him! Spells whizzed by my head, but the smoke was already becoming so thick that I could hardly see through it. I dodged the spells and circled back toward Amy. I threw up a shield that blocked the attack, but it couldn't protect us from the blazing heat. Lucas! Amy gasped through her tears. Get out of here! You'll be burned! You're innocent! I screamed back. You have to fight back! Use your magic! I can't! She cried. The cuffs are made of noxite! They've drained my magic! I noticed for the first time she had metal handcuffs securing her wrists together in front of her. I panicked. But if I cut the ropes free, she could still get away on two feet. But the fire was growing quickly, and there wasn't much time left. Commotion spread through the crowd. Police officers yelled, but I ignored them. I swung again, aiming the sharp tip of my scythe at the ropes. One of the ropes broke free, but it was immediately followed up by Amy's pain-filled cries. Horror seemed to swallow me whole when I saw that the fire had reached her feet. Ashley and Christine's shrieks echoed across the lawn, but Professor Ward continued her string of curses. You will all answer to the goddess, Ward shouted. May you burn in the abyss for your transgressions! Smoke filled my nose and clouded my vision. People shouted from afar, but I couldn't hear any of it over my hacking coughs. Leave me! Amy begged. I'm not leaving! I screamed but I could barely get the words out as smoke filled my lungs. Nearby, I heard Nadine's voice shouting over the crowd, Stop this! They're innocent! I can prove it! We can't stop what's already been done, Priestess Lillian sneered. You can't do this! Nadine screamed. I'm a priestess, and so is Stella! We weren't here to vote on this! The majority vote rules, Lillian spat. We needed only three priestesses to sentence them. Grant and Talia screamed protests nearby, but I couldn't hear what they said. I swung my scythe again, but the smoke was so thick that I could no longer see the ropes. The flames licked so high that they nearly touched my toes. It was so hot that I thought I might pass out. Stop! Mandy shouted. A break in the smoke gave me a clear view of her for a mere second. 
She shoved Miles off of her and sprinted past the police officers. She threw herself toward the burning sticks and plunged her hands straight into the flames. Sparks flew everywhere as she yanked on the burning sticks, like she was trying to dig Amy out of the fire. Her screams tore across the lawn, but a police officer grabbed her and yanked her backward. Two cats raced out of the crowd behind Mandy. Christine's cat yowled loudly as she watched her owner burn. Stormy jumped into the flames to get Amy. Her fur caught fire, and she fell into the snow, howling as the flames consumed her. Amy sobbed in agony as fire licked up her legs. I couldn't bear to look at the pained expression on her face. The priestesses had resorted to pure torture, and it was evil beyond anything I could imagine. Sweat dripped down my face, and my scythe slipped in my fingers as I swung it. I nearly lost it. Hang in there, Amy! I screamed over the roar of the fire. I'm getting you out of here! Just as I said it, a crackling sound came from behind me. I shot a glance over my shoulder to see that the bristles of my broom had lit a flame. My heart lurched. If I stayed here any longer, I would have no way out. I'd be burned alive, too. My time was up. The moment the horrifying realization hit me, a shield blasted out of nowhere and slammed into me. I went flying through the air so hard and fast that the air left my lungs. I soared over the top of the police officers and landed hard in the snow. I gasped for breath as I came to a rolling stop near the edge of the forest. My whole body ached from the impact, but all I could think of was Amy and the other innocent women being burned in front of my eyes. I pushed myself upright, groaning. Smoke wafted in front of me as the ends of the broom bristles turned to embers. I'd been blasted back so hard that the flames had been put out instantly. My scythe lay in the snow nearby. The police had turned their focus on Mandy. No one even looked in my direction. Get a shield up, Officer Baker barked. Within moments, the shimmering outline of a shield appeared around the blazing fire. Screams of agony went on forever, echoing through the bleak night as the flames licked up the bodies of the bound women. Then they just... stopped. The silence was the most horrifying sound I'd heard in all my life. Professor Ward's voice entered my mind. We didn't deserve this. I didn't make it, Ashley thought. I'll miss you, Mom, Christine whispered in my mind. Finally, Amy's voice came to me. I hope my death was worth it. My stomach lurched as if Twisted Vine had taken a hold of me and squeezed so tightly that I could no longer breathe. They were gone. I couldn't wrap my head around how fast it had happened. Cries tore through the air and I finally snapped back to attention. Four limp bodies sagged against the stakes, their silhouettes like omens against the flickering flames. Blackened flesh hung off their bones, and they were no longer recognizable. The stench of burning flesh filled the skies. I caught sight of police officers shoving Mandy toward the crowd. Grant and Talia caught her, and the terrified look in their eyes sent daggers through my heart. From out of the darkness, three cats came racing toward me. I recognized them immediately. Oliver, Isa, and Gus. They must have escaped the school while our rooms were being searched. Oliver ran straight up to me, looking relieved to see me safe. No! I shoved him off. You have to get somewhere safe! The cats either didn't care or didn't understand, because they didn't move. I scrambled to my feet and grabbed my scythe and broom from the ground. I quickly subconjured them. Priestess Margaret stepped in front of the crowd. The coven is safe now, she called, lying through her teeth. I saw straight through her. She was trying to control the crowd under the guise of protecting them. It made me ill. It's because of them that one of your classmates died tonight, Priestess Margaret said. 
These acts were necessary. Any student or professor caught brewing nightshade on school grounds shall suffer the same fate in order to protect you all. You're lying! Nadine screamed. These women were innocent, and you killed them! Fuck. Nadine was going to get herself killed. I had to do something. I raced toward her, the cats following. A police officer tried to grab me, but I shoved him off. The officers must have lost their concentration because their shield had fallen, and I made it past them. Nonsense! Priestess Lillian snarled. These were your friends. You're just trying to clear their name. I have proof! I shouted. I pulled my voice recorder from my pocket. It had been recording all night, and I had Priestess Stella's confession on tape. I held the voice recorder high above my head. Priestess Stella framed them, just like she framed Professor Daniels. My throat tightened in an instant, as if someone had curled their fingers around my neck, but no one was close enough to touch me. I gasped, and my vision blurred. An invisible force tore the voice recorder out of my hand, and it flew straight toward Priestess Lillian. That's when I realized what was happening. She was choking me with her magic. This bitch could silence me all she wanted, but the damage was already done. Whispers spread throughout the crowd. Priestess Stella? Framed? Professor Daniels was innocent? Horror spread across the priestesses' faces. They had no idea what Stella had done, and it terrified them to their very core. Because if the coven knew these people were innocent, the priestesses would have to answer for that in the worst way possible. Lillian lifted her chin. She stared me down as she spoke to the police officers. Arrest him immediately for attempting to incite a panic. My heart leapt as the police officers strode forward, but Nadine put up a hand. They stopped mid-stride. They didn't have to like her, but they had to listen to her. It was the way with the coven. I am a priestess, Nadine sneered. You won't be arresting anyone. The coven deserves the truth. Priestess Margaret's eyes narrowed. She glanced from the fire to the voice recorder, then to Nadine. Then she spoke one single word that chilled me to the bone. Overruled. Priestess Charlotte crossed her arms. The council has spoken. Arrest this man. An officer lunged for me, hands curled around my wrists, yanking my arms behind my back. Lillian released her hold on my throat, and I gasped a greedy breath of air. They know it's the truth, I cried. They're selling you a story, so you'll submit to compliance. Please, you have to listen, Nadine insisted. These people deserved a trial. Ask yourself why they didn't get one. I believe them, someone shouted from the crowd. The priestesses whirled toward the voice and glared, as if trying to find the source of the voice. They didn't see her, but I knew that voice. It was Samantha Stone, the necromancer who'd told me about the Reaper Moon a year ago. I spotted her in the crowd. She held on to two other girls from my classes, Felicia and Darcy. A matching look of terror filled each of their eyes. The officer holding me muttered a protection charm that would secure my hands behind my back like handcuffs. Magic began twisting around my wrists. Conti! He cut off mid-incantation. The burning sticks blasted in every direction, raining flames and embers down all around us. The officer jumped back and screamed as flames landed on his shoulder. The magical restraints forming around my wrists vanished. Burn in the abyss! Mandy screamed. She charged forward while the officers were distracted. The flames were smaller now, as the blast had spread the fire out, but she sprinted straight through them toward Amy's burnt corpse. The crowd erupted into a panic. Suddenly, people were moving in all directions, attempting to flee. Magic whizzed overhead, and people screamed as they were hit by rogue battle orbs and stunning spells. Stop them! Officer Baker shouted. Shields went up, but they came down almost as quickly. Nobody could concentrate among the chaos. 
I grabbed Nadine's hand and we ducked incoming spells as we raced over the snow. I'm sorry. Nadine's voice trembled as she shot a glance back at Amy. I had to save you. That was your shield that blasted me away from the pyre, I realized. She grimaced. I had no choice. You did the right thing, I assured her. I just regretted that we couldn't save Amy. Nadine slowed, and she shot a worried glance around the panicked crowd. Where is everyone? Here, Talia shouted. She sprinted toward us with Grant at her side. Miles clutched Kiki in his arms as he ran behind them. There was nothing we could do, Grant yelled. We can't change it, I said. All we can do is move. We have to get someplace safe. Oh, goddess, Nadine gasped. Where's Mandy? I glanced around, but there was so much chaos. I could hardly see anything through the scrambling bodies and the spells flying everywhere. I looked toward the stake, but Mandy was gone. Fuck, I growled. I created a shield and began pushing through the crowd to find her. Wait, Talia cried. I just saw her. She ran into the forest. That's where we need to be, Grant said. It's not safe here. I couldn't take my eyes off the burnt bodies. It didn't seem right to leave them there to continue smoldering. Amy deserved better. I was a reaper, and I needed to stay to help all these people cross over. But if we stayed, we'd die. I whirled back toward my friends. Let's go. We hurried toward the trees, our cats following closely behind. But we didn't get to the trees before a blazing inferno swept across the forest. It moved so fast that if I blinked, I would have missed it. It was like magic, except witches couldn't create fire. We stumbled backward before we ran straight into the wall of flame. It's Alchemist Accelerant, Grant cried. What, like gasoline? Nadine shouted. Grant's tone was hollow. Worse. The flames engulfed the lawn on all sides, surrounding the school. Snow started melting, creating a slippery slush. The only way out was the front gates. Students began to flock in that direction. Maniacal laughter met my ears, and I turned to see Ryan standing at the edge of the forest, holding one of the torches the police had earlier. He looked up at the burning trees like a kid who'd just set off a rocket. He was fucking pleased. My heart raced. Where the hell did Ryan get Alchemist's accelerant? Probably from Officer Baker himself, Miles quipped, but now wasn't the time for jokes. On second thought, maybe Miles wasn't joking. Talia conjured the broom she'd ridden here on. Let's ride our brooms out of here. I glanced toward Miles. We don't have enough for everyone. We'll have to hide out in the school until this is over, Miles said. No, Nadine protested. If the school catches fire, we'll be trapped. We are trapped, Miles gestured around at the burning forest. We have to get to the front gates before the police do, I said. Come on. We were on the move instantly, but it was like throwing ourselves into an active war zone. Battle orbs exploded around us, and we had to react quickly to avoid being hurt by them. Cats yowled and hissed, and people screamed so loudly that my ears rang. I threw a shield up around us, but I couldn't keep my concentration. Three battle orbs slammed into my shield at the same time, and it flickered out of existence. Everything happened all at once when my shield fell. Two girls ran straight into me, and the three of us slipped on the melting snow. I landed so hard on my back that the air knocked out of my lungs. Ice-cold water seeped through my shirt, chilling me. Talia screamed the second I landed. I sat up and whirled around to see she had fallen to the ground. Her hand trembled in the snow, and a massive bruise began forming over the back of it. Grant immediately knelt by her side. She was struck by magic. It has to be broken. Can you move? 
Nadine asked. I can walk, Talia said through ragged breaths. The girls who'd run into me both groaned as they got to their feet. They were accompanied by their own cats, but it wasn't until the girls stood that I saw who it was, Chloe and Onyx. Fuck, I got hit too. Chloe's shoulders were hunched as she stood, and I realized one of them was dislocated. Onyx pressed her hand to the back of her head. She winced as she said, You need to pop it back in. It'll feel better. Pop it back? Chloe gaped. Are you insane? I'm serious, Onyx said. Here, let me help. Magic continued whizzing overhead. I threw up another shield around us, but it was hard to hold it over everyone. My shield weakened with every spell that slammed into it. Make it quick, I insisted. I can't hold this shield forever. All around us the battle seemed to be mounting. Police shot high-powered spells into the crowd. They blasted out of their wands like bullets, and the sound echoed in my ears. Boom. My gaze snapped in the direction of a massive explosion on the other side of the lawn. The fire broke for a mere second, and a group of alchemists, led by Stacy and Valerie, fled through the trees. Avery Mitchell scampered behind them to safety. They must have used a fire retardant potion, but it didn't last long. Within moments, the fire was back, blazing around the perimeter of the schoolyard. Ready, Chloe? Onyx asked. On the count of three. Chloe whimpered as Onyx grabbed her arm. On three. One. Two. There was a grotesque snapping sound, and I winced. Gah! Chloe screamed. You said the count of three! Onyx stepped back, looking proud. How does that feel? Chloe rolled her shoulder. Better, actually. Tell me that's not the only trick you have up your sleeve. How are we getting out of here? You're on our side? Grant asked in shock. Well, I'm not going to stand around and wait to burn to death, Chloe cried. Who do you think distracted the police in the first place? That was you, Nadine realized. You blasted all those sticks back with your telekinesis. Chloe scoffed, looking offended by Nadine's surprise. I wasn't going to let them arrest you. Nadine furrowed her brow. But your grandmother is apparently a raging bitch, Chloe said. I want answers. Whatever is actually happening here, these burnings and hangings aren't the answer. This is wrong. Nadine hesitated a moment. It was odd for Chloe to be on our side. A year ago, I'd have bet anything Nadine and Chloe would be enemies for life. But things had changed. How many people can you lift with your magic? I asked Chloe. None, she replied bluntly. If I could do that, I'd be out of here. I glanced around, desperate for a way out. My gaze landed on the priestesses. They'd made it to the front gate with the police. Several people had fled, and a few officers pursued them. But most of the students and professors had hit an invisible barricade. A dozen officers held up their wands like they were trying to hold a shield. Everyone was trapped. I caught sight of one of the officers at the end of the line. His hands shook, and he hesitated. Then he did the unthinkable. The officer dropped his hands. He ripped his badge from his uniform and threw it down. Rage marred his features, and he shouted something at the other officers, but I couldn't hear it from this distance. Suddenly his entire form stiffened, my gaze darted to Priestess Lillian, who held her hands up in his direction. She was punishing him. Shock hit several officers' faces, but it melted away as quickly as it came. They put on masks of indifference, knowing that they must comply, or they too would be punished by the priestesses. My gaze darted around for other options. My eyes landed on Professor Warren across the lawn. He knelt beside a student who screamed out in pain. He looked to be administering first aid. I spotted Headmistress Verla. She stood at the edge of the school, gazing over the scene with terror in her eyes. 
Her hair was a mess, and soot was smeared across her face. She spun in a circle like she was trying to take it all in, but just couldn't. Verla was supposed to protect these students. She was their headmistress, the voice of the entire student population. And she had failed them tonight. I couldn't imagine what she might be feeling in the wake of this carnage. Worse than that, she'd seen this kind of thing before. This was the same council that had hung her sister. It was the same coven that couldn't save her stillborn child. We were the people who had failed her time and time again, and judging by the look on her face, I didn't know how much fight she had left in her. Verla had always seemed so strong, but right now she looked terrified. She lifted her hands like she was about to cast a spell, but I never saw what she conjured. A group of Mortana passed in front of me, led by Leroy Benson, the jerk from my protection magic class. They ran into a group of seers racing in the opposite direction. When Leroy saw the seers blocking his path, black tendrils of magic left his fingers. My stomach twisted as the seers dropped dead instantly, creating a path for the Mortana to flee. The castes had begun fighting one another, all in an attempt to escape. Behind them, another group of seers moved through the chaos. I spotted Kenna Farlane among them. Her eyes darted around and she trembled in fear. Every move the group made seemed deliberate. The girl in front held up her hand and everyone stopped. A battle orb exploded right in front of them. The moment it hit, she gestured her friends forward and they followed with complete faith. She yelled something and everyone ducked as another spell flew over their heads. She must have been able to see the spells coming with her psychic powers. Everything happened in mere seconds. I turned the entirety of my focus back toward my friends. We have to work together, I said. If we combine our magic, we can create a shield strong enough to lead us through the fire. Grab hands. Talia kept her injured hand out of the circle, but she placed her good hand on Grant's shoulder. How do we do this? Chloe asked. It's basics of intercast magic, I said, knowing most of them hadn't taken the class yet. We have to combine our magic and allow it to vibrate at the same frequency. An incantation works best. Repeat after me. Stronger together, our magic is charmed. Walk us through this fire unharmed. My friends repeated my words. I expected to feel their magic surge through me like I'd practiced in intercast magic, but nothing happened. Um, is it working? Onyx asked. My heart dropped. Something's wrong. Grant's eyes darted around our circle. I've still got magic. Chloe's features fell. I don't. Nadine gritted her teeth. The waning... I tried to create a protection spell around us, but nothing happened. My magic was just working! You never know when the waning will hit, Miles said. Everybody's out? Grant asked. He tried a quick spell, and an orb formed in his hand. Everyone else did the same, but Onyx was the only one who managed to conjure anything. I'm still good, she said. Two alchemists. Grant sighed. We'll never make a shield strong enough to hold back those flames. Chloe whirled toward Nadine and spoke quickly. Curse breakers can absorb magic, right? You could restore the power you lost from the waning. That might be enough to do the spell. Supposedly, but I haven't learned how yet, Nadine said. And even if I could, I'd need at least some magic to start with. I'm completely out. We'll have to... Nadine cut off as a spell shot between us. I jumped back, narrowly dodging the spell, but it whizzed by me and slammed straight into Onyx's chest. She stumbled back, and her cat hissed loudly. Onyx blinked a few times, then glanced around frantically. Her chest heaved, and her voice shook. I can't see! A curse, I growled. I... I don't know, Onyx stammered. Mentalist powers, maybe... Tricking my brain? Then it should wear off, Chloe said, grabbing Onyx's hand. In the meantime, I'll be your eyes. 
Grant, Onyx, Nadine said. Can you two create this spell the other alchemist used to get through the fire? Grant hesitated. Messing with the elements is tough. We need a lot more alchemists. Grant, Talia said like he was missing something. You have all the alchemy magic you need. Grant's eyes widened. Of course. Let's see what that wand is capable of, Talia said. Grant conjured the alchemy wand and curled his fingers around it tightly. He drew a deep breath and the end of the wand began to glow. Beams of magic connected with the wand, like it was coming from the surrounding area. I glanced around and I spotted headmistress Verla nearby. Her chest glowed and she stared down at it in horror. That's enough, I told Grant. You're siphoning magic from other alchemists. That should be enough anyway, he said. Come on. Chloe stared at the wand like she couldn't believe her eyes. Is that an oaken wand? Where did you get that? Miles asked. Story for another day, Talia replied. Grant ran toward the trees, and the rest of us followed. He dropped to his knees and conjured a pile of herbs. He scooped water into his hands from the melting snow and sprinkled the herbs on top. Isa and Oliver rushed up to him and nudged bags of herbs in his direction, trying to help. He moved frantically, pouring the entire contents of the last bag into his hand. He lifted the wand and spoke an incantation. Alchemy magic twirled out of the end of the wand, infusing the herbs. What's happening? Onyx asked. She couldn't see a thing. Grant's getting us out of here, Nadine said. Almost done, he cried. Chloe, a bit of help? On it, she said. Grant drew his arm back, then threw the herb bundle toward the trees. Chloe used her mentalist powers to propel it faster. The bundle tore apart midair and rained down over the flames. An explosion sounded, and the flames died in front of us, providing a narrow pathway. Come on, Grant yelled. It won't last long. Everyone rushed forward, but I paused at the edge of the trees. People rushed by so quickly, I couldn't make out their faces. Verla raced over to a group of terrified freshmen. She looked like she was trying to calm them down. Determination was written all over her face, like one way or another, she would get them out of there. Headmistress! I shouted. She didn't hear me. Headmistress Verla, this way! She still didn't look in my direction. A hand landed on the back of my shirt and yanked me back. Lucas, there's no time! Nadine cried. We'll find a way to get everyone out, but we have to get to safety first. It killed me to leave anyone behind but I couldn't help anyone if I burned to death. We had to get a move on. I whirled around and raced into the trees. Grant's spell wore off behind me, and the trees crackled. I'd have been burned alive if I stayed a second longer. We ran so far into the trees that the firewall was long behind us before we stopped to catch our breath. The flames burned so hot that I could feel them on my back, even as we escaped. What do we do? Miles asked. We have to get the others out, Nadine said through ragged breaths. How? Talia asked. Without the support of the police or the priestesses, there may not be anything we can do, Chloe pointed out. They're determined to hold people hostage back there. I have the alchemy wand, Grant said, holding it up. Where the hell did you find that? Chloe asked. It's a long story. Grant said. But I should be able to restore magic, right? Alchemy magic, at least. It could give some of them a chance. Grant lifted the wand, and the end began to glow again, but his eyebrows pinched together the longer he stared at it. Shit, I can attract the magic, but I can't redistribute it. We need all five wands, Nadine said, sounding certain. The priestess has mentioned it that the wands are stronger together. That's why it's so important to find them all, because the waning won't end until they're together. Right now, we need to get somewhere safe. We can go to my grandma's. We'll come up with something there. Let's get moving, I said. 
This fire is spreading fast. We can't stay in the forest for long. It didn't take long before we reached the edge of the trees and came into town. We snuck onto someone's lawn and around the side of their house. The sound of breaking glass and screams came from up ahead. When we stepped out onto the street, my stomach dropped. The students who had escaped the school grounds earlier had brought their panic into town. Adults and children raced out of their homes. Others threw spells into shop windows, shattering them and looting their contents. The burning has arrived, someone shouted. There's no turning back. A car sped along the street, and people screamed as they jumped out of the way. The orange glow of fire flickered from inside one of the buildings. Looters chased three girls outside. It looked like they ducked inside the building for safety. Their screams echoed down the street as they fled. I realized it was Lena, Gwen, and Camille. They tried to throw spells back at the guys looting the store, but none of their spells worked. The guys laughed loudly like they were having the time of their lives. As the fire burned brighter, I caught sight of the symbol on the back of their jackets. A spider. It was the tarantulas. All of them except Ryan. The four of them continued down the block after Lena and her friends. I was about to go after them when three guys ran in front of the tarantulas, blocking them from chasing the girls any further. I recognized Gregory, Alex, and Brayden. Gregory pulled a wand from his coat and pointed it at Nolan. Alex and Brayden held up their own wands at the others. Back the fuck up, Gregory shouted. He must have grown a spine since I'd threatened him near the vanishing stairwell, because he stared down the tarantulas with murderous intent in his eyes. What are you going to do? Nolan taunted. We'll fry your ass if we have to, Brayden threatened, though his voice wavered. You're not going anywhere near those girls, Alex added. The tarantulas laughed so loudly that it echoed down the street. Get em, boys, Nolan ordered. The tarantulas raised their hands in unison, but the other three reacted faster. Magic blasted from their wands and the tarantulas went flying backward, straight through a shop window. Glass shattered and rained down onto the street. The tarantulas let out strings of curse words. All around us the chaos continued. Tires squealed as families fled and people screamed as the castes fought one another. Everything happened so fast. Dear goddess, Onyx whispered. She trembled against Chloe, horrified by the sounds. How are we going to get across town to your grandma's? Miles asked. Change of plans, Nadine said. We need to help those people. Nadine started forward, but Chloe grabbed her wrist. Without magic? Nadine, these people are terrified. You could get yourself killed. It's not their fear I'm afraid of, Nadine snapped. It's the priestesses. They're killing people in the name of saving them because they're terrified of the waning. They're going to be the end of us all. And you have to stay alive long enough to fight back, Chloe insisted. You're a priestess. And it's gotten me nowhere so far, Nadine cried. I need to do something. Someone shouted from nearby, cutting her off. Your cast is to blame. I whirled toward them to see a dozen mentalists cornering three alchemists in front of a shop. I didn't realize until the guy took a step forward that it was James. You created Nightshade. We never touched Nightshade, a girl cried. It was Sadie, a girl who worked at the Witch's Brew restaurant on the lake. I swear. Your word means nothing as an alchemist, James snarled. Your cast is trying to kill us all. The unthinkable happened. Revulsion festered inside of me as James used his powers on her. The girl dropped to her knees and her back arched as she cried out in agony. I remembered what it felt when he'd done the same to me last summer. James's magic tricked you into thinking you were in pain, and it was a power he was good at. I started running, my heart pulsing in my ears. I heard footsteps behind me, but I didn't know which of the friends followed. Oliver sprinted ahead. The girls' cries were unbearable, but they were over in a second. 
I barely made it a few paces before her body dropped to the sidewalk. What have you done? One of her friends cried. James took a step back, looking horrified. She's faking it. I'd never... She has a heart condition! Another alchemist shouted. Oliver reached James first. He jumped at him, claws outstretched with murderous intent. Oliver scratched James's face, tearing through flesh so fast that blood sprang from his face immediately. James reared back and screamed. He yanked Oliver off of him and threw him against the side of the building. Motherfucker! I growled as soon as I reached him. I didn't think about how I was outnumbered. I barely thought at all. I slammed my fist straight into James's jaw, and he landed flat on the ground. Miles and Talia raced behind me, their cats following, but they came to an immediate halt when the mentalists began closing in on us. One of the alchemy students checked Sadie's pulse, but she was already long gone. The alchemists took off running before they were killed as well. So, that's the way it's going to be? One of the mentalists said, cracking his knuckles. I was preparing for a fight. The other mentalists laughed. Kiki, Oliver, and Gus poised for attack, and I was almost certain we were about to be pummeled by their magic. Then came the sound of sirens, blaring so loud that several people jumped back and covered their ears. My heart lurched as two police cruisers came to a screeching halt beside us. The mentalists fled in all directions as four officers jumped out of the vehicles. James scurried to his feet and ran. Officers, you have to help! Miles cried. They killed! Hands in the air where we can see them! An officer shouted. My hands shot into the air involuntarily. It was like magic had taken control of my body. One of the officers was a puppeteer. Damn mentalists. Cast a spell and you'll regret it, another officer threatened. My stomach dropped from my abdomen as a shield formed around me and my friends. It was barely big enough to contain us all. We were squashed together. Goddess, Talia cried. Fuck, Miles growled. I could see Nadine on the other side of the squad cars, the flashing lights illuminating her features. Her face had gone paper white. I shot a quick glance to the side of one of the shops, begging her to hide so they wouldn't take her too. Nadine got the message. She grabbed Grant's arm and said something, though I couldn't hear what. They fled, and Chloe and Onyx followed. Issa hesitated for a moment before racing behind Chloe's and Onyx's cats. The officers slapped metal cuffs onto our wrists. Immediately, my energy drained. These had to be the Noxite cuffs Amy had been wearing earlier, because they were definitely magical. If I hadn't already lost my magic to the waning, then it'd be gone as soon as they put the handcuffs on. Move! One of the officers barked. Beside me, Talia whimpered as her feet began moving under her without her consent. Gus yowled when she stepped on him. Sorry! She cried. The cats wove between our feet, looking terrified. They weren't affected by the magic, but they couldn't escape the shield either. Where are you taking us? Miles demanded. Back to the school, an officer sneered. He almost sounded amused. Where the priestesses can decide what to do with you criminals. What, like burning us at the stake? Talia snapped boldly. An officer laughed, definitely amused. They'll make an example out of you one way or another. My blood turned to ice in my veins. It was pretty clear what was happening. They were marching us to our slaughter. Chapter 24 Nadine I ducked around the corner of a wand shop, my heart racing. I barely had time to catch my breath. Grant, Chloe, and Onyx hid in the shadows next to me. Issa raced to my side, meowing loudly. Shh, I hissed at her. I couldn't tear my eyes off my friends. Lucas put on a brave face, but I was terrified for him and what the police might do. Hell, it wasn't even the police I was worried about. 
The priestesses would punish him for what he said in front of the coven, and for how he'd tried to save Amy. We had to get him out of there, but I was out of magic. I stood no chance against the police, and they wouldn't listen to me now, not after the council overruled me. Grant, is there anything you can brew to help them? I asked. He wore a calculated look. I don't know, honestly. With potions and herbs, you actually have to administer it. There's nothing we can do at a distance. Can we cast a curse, maybe? I wondered. I was out of options. That will get us killed, Chloe said. The priestesses would take it as an act of war. This has become a war, I insisted. We already know the coven will kill innocent people. What if our friends are next? We'll think of something, Onyx said. I hesitated. This wasn't safe for any of us, and I wouldn't put anyone in danger unless they were willing. Do you really want to go up against the priestesses? Onyx scoffed. Do I look like the kind of girl who follows the rules? She gestured to herself. Onyx took goth style to the max, with pitch-black hair dyed purple at the tips, knee-high boots, and a velvety black dress. Her features were pale, and her makeup was dark. I always loved her style, but I never took her to be a rebel, just a quiet girl with a cool sense of fashion. Though we'd spent a whole semester as lab partners, I realized I didn't know anything about Onyx at all. Any one of us could be hanged or burned at the stake, I said. Is everyone sure they're willing to risk that? Like you said, the priestesses already killed innocent people, Chloe stated. It seems that we're at risk no matter what side we're on. I'd rather die knowing I was on the side that tried to stop it. What about your grandmother? Grant asked. Screw my family, Chloe spat. I always thought family was the most important thing, but if this is what my family does, then I don't want to be an Olsen anymore. My knee-jerk reaction was to question her. I'd spent so much time fighting with Chloe that it was hard to trust her. We'd worked together to break our family curse, but we weren't exactly friends. But Chloe had always been against hangings and burnings. She'd told me that when we were tied up in Pinewood Manor together. It was one of the reasons she wanted to become a priestess. To stop it. I had to accept that Chloe was on my side. Then let's stop this. I gestured them forward, and we crept through the shadows. We followed behind the officers at a distance, and watched as they marched our friends through the front gates and back onto campus. I caught sight of the priestesses. They wore proud smirks that made me want to hurl. The iron gates shut, and two guards stood out front. I recognized one of them as Lincoln, the guy who guarded Octavia Hall. My eyes scanned the brick wall that extended outward from the iron gates. How far does this wall go? I asked. It can't surround the whole property. I'd been through the forest surrounding the school many times, and I'd never seen a wall anywhere but at the front of the school. It's just at the entrance, Chloe said. There used to be an iron gate surrounding the property to keep the fay out, but students kept vandalizing it. Now it's more for decoration than anything. Let's go this way. I cocked my head, and we headed deeper into the forest, where the guards wouldn't spot us. The scent of a burnt forest filled the air. Embers fluttered to the ground around us, but the raging fire had died. The alchemist's accelerant must have reached its limits, and the trees were so wet from the snow that they'd stopped burning. We crept to the edge of the wall that bordered the front of the property. I'll boost you up, Grant whispered. He interlaced his fingers, and I stepped into his hands. My fingers curled around the top of the wall, and I peeked over. My heart jumped when I saw the scene before me. Students had been rounded up in front of the school, and police paced back and forth in front of them. The officers twisted battle magic in their hands, threatening anyone who dared step out of line. I noticed Professor Wyckoff twisting her skirt around in her hands. She stood beside Professor Warbright, the short, stout music professor. They both shared the same worried look, like they wanted to stop this, but didn't know how. Not far from them, Professor Warren stood next to a group of students. 
He kept shooting them reassuring glances, like he was desperately trying to give them hope. Priestess Margaret looked Lucas up and down as he passed. People have died tonight because of you, she sneered. I just barely heard her over this distance, but her voice sent a shiver down my spine. At the stake, Lillian barked orders at professors. She forced them to drag the charred bodies of our friends down from the pyre. I witnessed Professor Richard's trembling hands as he helped remove Amy's body. I winced at the sight of her, and tears beaded in my eyes. I wanted to cry, to break down and scream, but I didn't have the luxury. The other professors didn't look frightened at all. In fact, they looked like they were hungry for a second burning. Priestess, please, Headmistress Verla begged Lillian. No more burnings tonight. At least give these students a trial. Lillian turned away from the headmistress. They will get what they deserve. The following silence was deafening. It seemed that all I could hear was the sound of my friend's footsteps on the lawn. The officers marched them into the school, and I jumped down from Grant's hands. It looks like the police are the only ones with magic, I said. Or anyone who still has it isn't willing to fight back. They've rounded everyone up. I think they're getting ready for a second burning. They've taken Lucas, Talia, and Miles into the school. Grant swallowed. What are we going to do? We need to create a distraction and set them free, Chloe said simply, like it'd be easy. We have to buy enough time that the council will reconsider and give them a trial. Emotions are so high right now, and people aren't thinking straight. They'll support a second burning if they have someone to blame. But if we make this last until morning, people will reconsider, and the priestesses will have to plan their next move carefully. I stared at her. You're like a chess pro, planning out every move. My grandmother has been training me my whole life to become a priestess one day, Chloe said. You have to know how people work, and you must plan out your moves, or you lose your support. The priestesses have the power because the coven gives it to them. If we break your friends out, it gives people time to rescind their support. They got away with this tonight because it was at the school. The priestesses will second-guess another public execution, especially after what happened to Professor Daniels. Okay, I agreed. How do we distract them? I might know something, Onyx said. Can you do it blind? Grant asked. How's your vision? The spell is wearing off, Onyx said. I can do it. I'll go with Onyx, Chloe offered. I nodded firmly. Grant and I will sneak around to the back of the school and get inside. Hold up, Grant said. How are we going to break them out? If the police still have magic, they have to be restraining them somehow. They'll be using more than just those handcuffs. You know how to break restraints, Onyx said, though there was something in her tone I couldn't read. Grant gaped. You're talking about... about saving your friends, Onyx interrupted Grant. You're the only one with enough magic. Can you do it? Chloe asked. Grant swallowed. I think so. We'll figure something out, I said quickly. We were running out of time. How will we know when you're ready? Oh, you'll know, Onyx said with a slight twinkle in her eye. I've been waiting to brew this spell forever. We split up. Chloe and Onyx's cats went with them, and Issa followed me. Grant and I snuck through the trees around the perimeter of the property. We moved as quickly as we could without being spotted. We came so close to the pyre that we had to move slowly, or they'd hear us. I stared at Amy's frail, broken body lying in the snow, and my stomach twisted as if I'd been impaled by a death curse. Grant choked up and whispered, She'll be greatly missed. We'll hold a proper funeral, but we can't do this right now, I said softly. There are others who still need our help. Issa nudged her head against my leg, turning her gaze away from Amy. It was like she couldn't bear it. Hell, I don't think any of us could. 
Grant and I snuck to the back of the school, then hurried across the lawn through the darkness. We slipped into the back of the school unnoticed. Where do you think they're holding them? Grant whispered. It's got to be somewhere without windows and no other exits, I said. So maybe the... I cut off when the sound of shouts came from down the hall. Don't say a word, someone yelled. Grant and I exchanged a glance. I think we found them, I said. We crept down the hall. I peeked around the corner, but no one was there. I gestured Grant forward, and we continued down the hall until we spotted the lounge. Two officers stood guard outside the door, and two others paced up and down the hall, as if surveying for threats. I could see the protection spell shimmering in the doorway, locking our friends inside the lounge. Behind the shield, Lucas paced back and forth. His hands were secured in front of him by handcuffs. Talia and Miles both sat on one of the couches, with their cats in their laps. They looked angry, like they were already plotting their next move. On the couch beside them sat three girls, each one looking more terrified than the last. They looked up at Lucas with hope in their eyes, like they expected him to save them. I recognized Darcy, Felicia, and Samantha. Each of the girls was hurt in some way. Darcy held her arm, and Felicia had a gash across her face. Samantha propped one leg up on the coffee table, like her ankle was bruised. The priestesses must have had them arrested for speaking up earlier when they said they believed us. I turned to Grant. What's the spell Onyx was talking about? How do we break the shield and get them out? Grant's gaze locked on the officers. He didn't even blink as he raised the alchemy wand and pointed it around the corner. He drew a deep breath, like the thought of casting the spell shook him to his very core. His voice came out as a whisper. There's only one way to break them. Restraints don't hold if the spellcaster is dead. My heart lurched, and I grabbed his wrist. Grant, you mean... They won't be able to trace the spell back to me he said quickly. But you'll have to live with this, I argued. When I killed those witches last semester? You saved us, he said firmly. Lucas killed Stella to save us, too. It's my turn to save someone. I shook his arm and forced him to look at me. Grant, are you sure about this? Nadine, you don't understand. It's them or our friends. Tears rose to Grant's eyes, like he couldn't stand the thought of losing anyone else. You heard what Chloe said. We have to buy them time if you want them to live. Otherwise, they'll be burned, just like Amy. We couldn't save her, but we can save the rest of them. I swallowed the lump rising in my throat. What if they find out? A huge explosion sounded from outside, so loud that it shook the walls of the school. I stumbled to the side and caught myself against the wall. Holy crap. When Onyx said she knew a spell, she knew a damn good one. My ears rang from the sound. What the fuck was that? One of the officers shouted. I peeked around the corner to see two of the officers grab their wands and race toward the main foyer. Two officers remained. They stood guard outside the lounge, glancing up and down the hallway. Grant lifted the alchemy wand, and my stomach twisted. The end of the wand began to glow. Wait, Grant, I said, but it was already too late. I know what I have to do, he said boldly, but I have to get closer. He straightened his shoulder and stepped out from his hiding spot. The officers noticed immediately. My heart leapt into my throat when they grabbed their wands and pointed them at Grant. Grant! I cried. Drop your weapon! One of the officers yelled. You drop yours first, Grant threatened. I'll give you one chance to drop your shield and walk away. I don't want to do this. It happened so fast. The officers waved their wands and lights blasted from the ends. Pop, pop, pop. A sound like gunshots filled the hall and my heart stopped. Grant turned to a statue, and I was certain he'd been hit. 
Time halted, and the whole school spun around me. Grant waved the alchemy wand, and the officer stumbled back. They began coughing in unison. They dropped their wands and doubled over. Blood sprayed from their mouths as they heaved, and they cried red tears as they collapsed to the ground. All I could do was stare. Issa meowed as the sound of their dying coughs filled the school. My friend stood in the doorway of the lounge, staring out into the hall at the horrifying scene before us. Then, all at once, it was over. The coughing stopped, and the hall filled with silence. The officers' bodies lay in pools of their own blood. The shimmering spell blocking the doorway dissolved, and my friends rushed out of the lounge. Grant! Lucas cried. Grant's face paled, and his eyes glossed over. Lucas caught him as he collapsed, but he couldn't hold him upright with his hands bound together. He lowered Grant to the ground. Oliver rushed to Grant's side, pressing his paws to his shoulder like he was trying to wake him. Goddess! Talia cried. Her broken hand trembled, and Gus meowed at her feet. Grant! Bro! Miles shouted as he dropped to his side. Grant groaned at the sound of his name. Samantha gasped, and Felicia took her hands. Both of them appeared sick, eyes stuck to the officers' corpses. My stomach clenched. Blood oozed from a hole in Grant's shoulder. It looked like a bullet wound, but it had been cast by magic. A sheen of sweat coated his forehead, and the color left his lips. Miles pressed his hand over the wound, but blood poured through his fingers. What did you do? I poisoned their blood, Grant admitted in a rough tone. Felicia's jaw dropped. That's impossible. Not with the alchemy wand, I said quickly. I scrambled toward one of the officers and yanked a set of keys from his belt. I quickly began freeing my friends from their handcuffs. As soon as I touched the metal, I started swaying on my feet. What are these? I asked. They were definitely magical. Noxite cuffs, Felicia said as I undid her cuffs. They're made with some sort of magical metal that drains your magic. Could Noxite be causing the waning? I asked as I moved on to Darcy. Felicia shook her head. No, it would need to be administered somehow, and if they were poisoning us with it, we'd be knocked out as soon as we lost our magic. I pulled Talia's cuffs off next. We have to get out of here, I stated firmly. There was no point to what Grant had done if we got caught. Where are we going to go? Darcy asked. Anywhere but here, I said. Hopefully we can get Grant some help. I glanced around the group. Almost everyone seemed to be injured. I quickly added, somewhere we can get everyone some help. Lucas looked up to me. The headmaster's abandoned mansion. We'll call Helena. Yes, I agreed. What about Tate? Talia asked. She's got to be in the infirmary. She's recovering, Lucas pointed out. We can't move her right now. She's not a threat to the priestesses. She'll be safe. I nodded in agreement. Tate was better off with the doctors than with a bunch of fugitives. Let's get moving. Miles and Lucas helped Grant stand. Grant sagged against his brother as we left out the back of the school. Grant clutched the alchemy wand tight in his hand, as if he was ready to use it again if need be. Talia held Gus to her chest with her good hand, and tears beaded in her eyes. Felicia and Darcy helped Samantha as she limped down the hall. Stop, I hissed holding up a hand. I peeked outside the door, and I spotted a pair of professors gathering sticks and taking them back to the pyre. As soon as they disappeared around the side of the school, I gestured forward. Everyone was gathered at the front of the school, so no one saw us as we snuck out the back. We hurried across the snow and into the forest, our cats following close behind. When we reached the trees, two shadows appeared. I gasped, but a voice quickly cut through the darkness. It's just us, Chloe said as she came out from behind a tree. You got them out, Onyx added in relief. Her sight had finally returned. Yes, I said. 
But we have to move. It won't be long until they come looking for us. Where are we going? Samantha asked, her tone a few pitches higher than normal. Somewhere safe, Lucas said. I held my breath the whole way to the hidden mansion, but we reached the clearing without being spotted. I burst through the front door. My whole body gave a jolt when I saw a figure in the hallway. Someone shot to their feet, and a battle orb formed in their hand. When I saw her face, relief flooded through me. Mandy! I cried. When she saw it was me, Mandy dropped her hand, and she burst into tears. Thank goddess it's you! I rushed over to her, and Mandy threw her arms around my neck. She sagged against me, sobbing into my shoulder. I rubbed her back. I'm so glad you're okay, I said. Mandy shook as she drew away from me. And everyone else? We're alive, Lucas said in relief. But not everyone was so lucky. Come on. Mandy ushered everyone through the door. There's room down the hall. We entered the living room. Lucas quickly got to work building a fire. I noticed there was a fresh pile of wood there. He must have restocked it since the last time we'd been here. I wasn't sure whether to start a fire, Mandy admitted. I thought someone would find me here. This place is enchanted, Lucas explained. If anyone seeks to harm this place, or us, they can't find it. Mandy's shoulders sagged. Thank the goddess. I need a phone, I announced. Is anyone's conjuring working? Grant winced as Miles helped him sit down, but he conjured his phone and handed it to me. I stepped into the hall as everyone got settled in around the fire. Issa looked up at me with sad eyes. Nadine? Grammy asked breathlessly when she heard my voice. What's going on down at the school? I've been trying to get in touch with you all night. I was so scared. I'm safe, Grammy, I told her. But my friends need help. We're hiding out at the old headmaster's mansion. Bring as many healing herbs as you can. I'm on my way, she said immediately. The atmosphere in the living room was melancholy when I returned, but I finally felt like I could breathe. Darcy, Samantha, and Felicia sat on one side of the room, inspecting each other's injuries. I was so scared, Darcy admitted, wincing as she moved her arm. Why would they arrest you? Chloe asked curiously. She sat next to Onyx, stroking the top of her cat's head. Samantha's gaze dropped. We were trying to stop the fires. As soon as everything broke out, we grouped up and tried to get a hose from the greenhouse, but everything got out of hand. Darcy shivered. I thought for sure I was going to die. The spell that hit me knocked me out for a while. Some asshole walked right up to me and did this. Felicia said, gesturing to the gash on her face. I tripped and got trampled, Samantha said. Chloe frowned. I'm sorry. I'll do everything I can to convince my grandmother to give you a trial. Darcy pushed her red curls out of her face and shot Chloe a smile. Thank you. I walked over to Lucas and collapsed onto the ground beside him. He draped an arm around my shoulder and pulled me close. I sagged against him, and fatigue finally had a chance to set in. All I wanted to do was close my eyes and sleep until this was all over. You okay, Nadine? Talia asked. Grant winced from beside her, but he already had a t-shirt pressed to his wound to slow the blood loss. There was nothing we could do except wait for Grammy to arrive. I'll be okay, I said. I'm more worried about you and your broken hand. Talia grimaced. It'll heal. Assuming I still receive my dialysis treatment after this, I'll be okay, I said. Silence settled over the room, and Grant was the first to break it. Where are we going to go? What do you mean? Chloe asked. You want to leave Octavia Falls? How will we fight back if we leave? Talia wore a worried expression. You might be able to stay, but the priestesses have already arrested us. I don't know if we stand a chance. What if they came after you? Onyx asked. Would they, though? I wondered. 
The priestesses only have jurisdiction inside Octavia Falls. They'd be better off making a political statement out of us leaving. I don't like the idea of them using us, but at least we'd be safe. Lucas reached out for me. But your treatments... I can find another dialysis center, I said, but my throat closed up around my words. I didn't want to leave. Chloe was right. We couldn't help the coven if we weren't here. If we left, it meant that we'd failed. We'd be leaving behind everyone who needed our help, people like Samantha, Darcy, and Felicia. We'd be abandoning all the people who couldn't help themselves, like the children and the elderly. I thought of Rose, the woman from the nursing home. Leaving meant putting her fate, and everyone else's, in the hands of the Imperium Council. I didn't want to go, but I also knew my friends and I could die if we stayed. What about your kidney transplant? Lucas pointed out. Chloe's jaw dropped from across the room. You need a new kidney? I pushed my hair behind my ear. I have one. Lucas and I are a match. Problem is, I don't have a doctor who will perform the surgery. If we left, I'd have to wait on the transplant list, and I may never get a kidney. Lucas could still give you his. Chloe sounded honestly concerned. You can find another doctor. I frowned. His therapist won't approve him, and he can't convince her. That's on his record now. The only way to sway the doctors is with the help of the Imperium Council. They said if I hand over an oaken wand, they'll help me get the transplant. Chloe looked speechless. I had no idea you were that sick. I shrugged. I haven't exactly made it public. Ow! Samantha winced as she tried to move. Chloe rushed over to help, and I turned back to my friends. Grant cleared his throat, and he held the alchemy wand out to me. Here, take it. I gaped at him. Grant, I can't. You need a kidney. Take it, he insisted. So the priestesses can control alchemy magic? I asked. No, we're not handing any of the wands over. It chose you. Right, and I get to choose what to do with it, he insisted. The wand is mine, which means the priestesses can't use it. Unless it changes loyalty, Lucas pointed out. That can happen, but I agree with Grant. You what? I asked. Lucas shifted. If we hand over the wand, you get your kidney. We can always get the wand back, but we can't get you back if you die. I gaped at him. Yeah, I want a new kidney, but I won't die without one. Unless the priestesses threaten your dialysis, Lucas said. That's a bigger deal, because this transplant is a one-time thing. They can use your dialysis to control you over and over again. We know they're powerful. What's to stop them from preventing your treatment, even if you're getting it somewhere else? They'll arrest us if we stay, I pointed out. Not if you hand over the wand, Grant said. Use the wand to pardon yourself and Lucas, so that you can get your transplant. The priestesses want the wand more than they want to hang either one of you. Plus, they still need you to find the other wands. You two have been chosen. You have to stay. Talia, Miles, and I will skip town as soon as we're strong enough to travel. We'll take Felicia, Samantha, and Darcy far away, and anyone else who wants to come. The thought of tearing our group apart seared me to the core. We'd already lost Amy. I couldn't imagine losing anyone else. Lucas and I were chosen, but only because we chose to stand up and fight. We could still change our minds. And yet, how could we abandon our own people? I choked up. This isn't fair. No, Lucas agreed. It isn't fair, and it isn't easy, but it has to be done. I swallowed the lump in my throat. I'll have to think about it. Take it, Grant begged. He pushed the wand toward me. Please, just take it. That's when I realized 
he wasn't asking me to take it for me. He was asking me to take it for him. He knew what it was like to take a life, even to save another. Grant couldn't bear to look at the wand right now, not after he killed those officers. My heart shattered for him. Gently, I took the wand from his hand. He sagged against the wall, like I'd just lifted a fifty-pound weight off his chest. A door burst open from down the hall, and I heard the sound of a cat meow. Isa and Oliver both bristled, then raced out into the hallway. Isa, I called. It's just me, Grammy's voice came back. I was so relieved. I didn't have the energy for anything else tonight. In here, Grammy. Grammy rushed into the room, and she stopped dead in the doorway when she saw us. Her gaze immediately went to Grant. The t-shirt Miles had given him was soaked in blood already. What kind of spell? she asked. I've never seen it before, Miles said. It was like a gunshot. Grammy winced. This will be a tricky one. But you can help him? Talia asked, hopefully. Grammy nodded, but her gaze darted toward Talia's broken hand. I can help. Then I'm helping you. Lucas, I need your help. Onyx stood. I'm an alchemist. My magic's still good. Perfect, dear, Grammy said. Come on over. Grammy gave Lucas orders, and Onyx helped crush herbs to brew a numbing potion. Anyone want to tell me what happened? Grammy asked as she worked on Grant's shoulder. It's kind of a long story, Talia said. Grammy shrugged. I have time. I'm dying to know, too. Chloe held her cat close to her chest and came to sit by me, like she was a kid listening to a bedtime story. Talia shot a glance around the room. It's okay, I said. We're all on the same side. She sighed. Ever hear of the Oaken Wands? The Oaken Wands are a myth, Felicia insisted, like she knew better. Are you sure about that? I asked, holding up the alchemy wand. Soon, everyone was gathered around the fireplace as Talia and Lucas took turns telling the story. I was too exhausted to chime in. Once Grammy stitched and bandaged Grant's wound, she moved on to Talia's hand, which she wrapped in leaves and ointment that would heal her broken bones in a week. Grammy continued administering first aid well into the early hours of the morning. Onyx looked thrilled to be brewing potions, and the other girls seemed so invested in our story that they seemed to forget their own injuries. Mandy sat in the corner, her eyes locked on a spot on the floor. She looked so frail and broken, and I felt awful for her. I miss Amy already, I said, once Talia reached the end of the story. I honestly can't believe she's gone. Talia frowned. I agree. She was a really good friend. I sniffled. The reality of everything that happened tonight only now just seemed to be hitting me. She was kind and passionate. She wanted to study supernatural history. She thought history could teach us something so that we'd never repeat the great supernatural war ever again. Miles stared off into the distance. For them to target her, such a kind, pure soul. It's sick, really. Grant swallowed. I can't help but think that it was my fault. No, Grant, Lucas said quickly. You can't blame yourself. But I left the nightshade in her room, he said. If we'd cleaned up earlier... You didn't. Talia cut in. It doesn't matter how much you go over it in your head. It won't change what happened. An uncomfortable silence settled over the room. Lucas cleared his throat. Amy bought me crystals for my depression. I don't know if I ever told anyone that. I still have them. She always asked about my therapy sessions. She made me a cream for my arthritis. Miles stated sadly. She came up with the recipe herself. 
my breath caught. She always brought me gifts on my birthday. Amy really was one of the kindest people I knew. She was just incredible. It hurt to talk about her in the past tense. Amy was kind to everyone, Lucas added as he helped Grammy with Samantha's ankle. I literally never saw her say a bad thing about anyone. Chloe hugged her knees to her chest. She was almost kind to a fault, to be honest. Shut the fuck up! Mandy cried from the corner of the room. It caught us all off guard. She shot to her feet and rounded on Chloe. Don't you talk about her like that! You didn't give a fuck about Amy! You conned her into helping you brew a potion to turn me into a frog! Which is how you two became friends! Chloe pointed out. I know you're hurting right now. I don't blame you for being mad at me. Maybe sometime we can talk about this, but I've changed. I regret what I did. Good, Mandy growled. You should. You don't get to treat her the way you did and then grieve over her with us. You're a bitch, and we all know it. Mandy. Miles rose to his feet and walked over to her. He wrapped his arms around her. Her bottom lip trembled, and I wasn't sure if she was about to cry or scream. I wouldn't blame her for either option. I loved her, Mandy cried, and I didn't get my time with her. She's the last person who deserved to die tonight. Fuck you, Chloe, and fuck your grandmother. I hope you and your whole family burn in the- Come on, Mandy, Miles said firmly. Let's take this to the next room. Mandy broke down into tears. She sobbed so loudly that she started hiccuping. I couldn't understand anything she was trying to say. I started to get to my feet, but Miles stopped me. I've got this, he said. Everyone else should rest. I knew Mandy, and Miles was right. She'd do better one-on-one. -on -one. I sat back down, knowing there was nothing I could possibly do to help Mandy right now. To help anyone, really. The silence in the room chilled me to the bone. I sat close to the fireplace and held Issa's warm body in my arms, and it still wasn't enough to ward off the cold. I'm almost done, Grammy said softly. She dabbed ointment over Felicia's face. But Miles is right. Everyone should get some sleep here tonight. We'll see what things are like in the morning and go from there. Okay? No one had the energy to argue. Lucas finished helping Grammy, then came over by me. Grammy went around the room, conjuring blankets and handing them out. Talia and Grant curled up together under one of them, and Lucas and I snuggled under another. The floor was uncomfortable, but as soon as I laid my head on his chest, I didn't care. Issa and Oliver curled up at our feet, purring. I'm so sorry about everything that happened tonight, I whispered. Lucas stroked my hand. You couldn't have known. I sniffled. No, but I wish things turned out differently. Lucas let out a wavered breath. The only thing we can do is fight this, to be sure things never turn out this way again. He was right. I only worried what else we might lose before the fighting ended. On every other night, it'd be next to impossible to keep my eyes open. I was so tired, but I couldn't sleep with the rage flaring through my bones. I waited until everyone had fallen asleep. Grant snored from nearby, but otherwise, the room had gone silent. Lucas's breathing had slowed. It was near torturous to peel myself away from him, but I slid out from underneath the blanket and snuck out of the mansion. My friends would never let me confront the priestesses on my own. It was too dangerous right now. But I knew this wasn't over. I couldn't explain how I knew. It must have been my intuition. The Imperium had said at my induction ceremony that my intuition would be stronger once I became a priestess. I had to convince them to pardon my friends before they made other plans and acted on them. 
I marched up the stairs to Octavia Hall. The cold bit at my fingers, but it didn't bother me. I was too enraged to care. I didn't bother knocking before storming into the Imperium headquarters. Our next move is to call off the nightshade deal with the Elementi for good, and we must bring the next seer priestess onto the council immediately. Priestess Margaret cut off when the door burst open. All eyes turned cruelly upon me. I believe I have a say in these plans, I said boldly. The three priestesses stood around their meeting table, looking agitated. Margaret's face fell when she saw me, but Priestess Lillian narrowed her eyes. Please, Nadine, Lillian sneered. Spare us the theatrics. You know as well as the rest of us that you are on this council only for appearances. You don't actually deserve to be here. Yet here I am, I replied. Council law dictates that I get a seat in these meetings. Lillian scoffed. Whatever your plan is, you'll be outvoted. But I still get a say, I said. You know, for appearances. That's why you haven't killed me yet, right? Because regardless of what the coven thinks of me, it would look awfully bad to hang the only curse-breaker in the coven. Lillian gaped, and Margaret rushed to say, We thought you'd be long gone by now. I scoffed. I'm not going anywhere, and if you think you can get rid of me, you're wrong. Lillian pursed her lips. What exactly is it that you want, Nadine? The same thing you want, I said. I want to bring an end to the waning. I want peace among the coven. I want to prevent a war. But that means we have to work together. Stop the burnings and the hangings. Give the people a fair trial. Margaret's features darkened as I spoke. You fail to understand the political pressure the coven is under right now. We are saving the people by taking extreme measures. It's the only way to prevent a war. A war that you started, I snarled. The coven must respect us, Priestess Charlotte snapped. Killing them isn't going to earn you respect, I growled. You're making people fear you so that they will bow down to you. That's not respect. We are doing what must be done, Margaret snapped. Controlling people is the only way. My nostrils flared. I couldn't believe that in their sick, twisted minds, they actually thought they were doing the right thing. You will get yourself killed before the coven recovers from this. Lillian narrowed her eyes. Is that a threat, Nadine? That's reality, I told her. No, Lillian snapped, slamming her fist onto the table. The reality is that you are going to do exactly as you're told, or you'll be hanged for treason. Hand over the alchemy wand, Nadine. I swallowed. Not without a deal. Lillian laughed, like my attempt at negotiation was comical. We know you have the wand, and we know your friend used it tonight to kill several officers. My heart lurched. Grant had assured me the spell couldn't be traced back to him. I don't know what you're talking about. Priestess Charlotte pursed her lips. Lying to the priestesses will earn you a charge of treason without a trial. We have the recording, Nadine, Priestess Margaret reminded me. Stella's confession isn't the only thing we have on tape. We know your friend Grant Bryant retrieved the alchemy wand. We know he used it against those officers. The magic was too great for a single alchemist. He will be burned for these murders. I didn't let my features falter for a moment. And how exactly is that different from the murders you sanctioned tonight? He had the best intentions, too. You'd have murdered my friends otherwise. And we still can, Charlotte threatened. Unless, of course... You hand over the wand, Margaret added. I crossed my arms. And how long does that earn them immunity? How can I trust that you won't turn your back on this deal and arrest them anyway? 
You have our word, Priestess Margaret said, like it meant something to me. We will offer your friends a trial in exchange for the wand and the crock. No, I objected. I want their charges wiped out completely. Every single one of them, including Darcy, Samantha, and Felicia. And I want the kidney transplant you promised me. Lillian burst into laughter. You overestimate your power in these negotiations, Nadine. You get one or the other. My entire world seemed to flatten. This was just too unreal. A kidney or my friends? Lillian tapped her foot, like she was getting impatient. If you find a second wand, then you can have your kidney. We're not giving you everything you want for a single wand. Fuck her. I want everyone pardoned completely, I said firmly. I wouldn't settle for anything less. Lillian eyed me. You do realize that should we wipe their charges, it provides them no protection in the future. The minute you turn your back on us, or once your friends step out of line, we will take action. I hesitated. I didn't know if it was enough. I couldn't stand back and watch the priestesses hurt more people. I had to fight back. We can agree to pardoning you and your friends for these crimes, Charlotte said. You will retain your seat on the Imperium Council. In return, you will hand over the alchemy wand and the crock of death. Lucas will destroy all records of the article he's been working on regarding Nightshade. He will not publish it. I gaped. Lucas had been working on his article all semester. He was almost finished. I didn't even know how they knew about it, until I realized that he'd submitted a proposal to Professor Daniels, and they'd seized all her records when they hanged her. When I didn't say anything, Priestess Margaret turned to using threats. It shouldn't be hard to rally the coven and drag Grant Bryant to the gallows. After all, he killed two respected officers of the force. I suggest you take the deal. The witches were pure evil, but I had no choice. Even if my friends left, the council would use their crimes to smear their names, ruin their reputation, and twist the story to gather supporters. The coven would crumble if I didn't do this. My stomach twisted as I forced the words through my teeth. I'll take the deal. Lillian wore a smirk. Oh, and one more thing, Margaret added, like I had no choice because I'd already agreed. You're going to make a public statement clearing Priestess Stella's name. You and Lucas will take back everything you said about her in front of the pyre. But she was behind the nightshade production, I argued. She went behind your back and lied to you for years. Aren't you pissed? It doesn't matter, Charlotte said coolly. The people need to trust us. If they believe Stella was evil, they'll believe that any of us can turn dark, including you. This is for your benefit, Nadine, Margaret said. If you want the coven to trust you, you cannot let them believe that a priestess can turn her back on the Imperium Council. So it's all about appearances again? I demanded. We have to play nice. Yes, Margaret said bluntly. Unless you want the coven to turn against us all. I didn't want to do it, but they left me no choice but to agree. Okay, I'll lie. But let me make one thing very clear. I pulled the alchemy wand from my coat and marched straight up to the council table. I slammed the wand onto the tabletop. I leaned toward the priestesses with death in my eyes. You can take this wand from me. But the second you touch me or my friends, I'll fight back. My friends will fight back. I'll make public everything you've done. And the coven will know exactly what's gone down this semester. You can hang us from the gallows, but the moment you put a noose around our necks, you put one around yours. I swore to the goddess the priestesses trembled. In that moment, one thing became very clear to every person in the room. 
I would burn the council to ashes for the people I loved. If they wanted to take us down, take me down, then so be it. They were going down with us. Chapter 25 Lucas I woke to the feeling of cold air brushing against my side. I'd fallen asleep with Nadine in my arms, but she wasn't there anymore. The sound of the front door clicked, and my heart lurched when I realized Nadine was leaving the mansion. I got to my feet and hurried outside behind her. I spotted Nadine disappearing into the trees. I called her name, but she didn't hear me over the sound of the wind. I wrapped my arms around myself and followed her, but I lost her in the trees. I began running, searching the forest and calling out her name, but Nadine didn't hear me. Fuck, where had she gone? I didn't know how long I'd been searching for her. It had to be fifteen minutes by now, at least. I was getting really cold, and I didn't know how much longer I could stay outside. I began to panic. I tried to put myself in Nadine's shoes. What would possibly possess her to leave the mansion tonight? It was our one safe place in the entire town. Nadine wasn't the stay-safe kind of girl, I realized. She was the kind of girl who ran into danger. She said that to me when we first met. Nadine was going to see the priestesses. The school grounds were quiet when I passed them. All the students were gone, probably escorted back to their dorms by police. The pyre remained empty, and a lingering burnt scent filled the air. I didn't have any magic, so I couldn't conjure my broom, nor car keys to drive into town. I shivered in the cold as I made my way into town on two feet. I rushed into Octavia Hall and took the stairs two at a time. Nadine's voice sounded down the stairwell. You can hang us from the gallows, but the moment you put a noose around our necks, you put one around yours. I caught the end of her speech, and my jaw dropped as I slowed outside the door. Nadine was a force to be reckoned with, and I was certain the priestesses feared her more than the waning itself. They couldn't touch her, because if they did... They fucked themselves over. Nadine stopped in her tracks when she burst out of the Imperium headquarters and saw me standing on the landing. Lucas? She breathed, looking shocked. I'm sorry, I said. I had to follow you. I had to make sure you were safe. She shot a glance back at the door. I made a deal, and we're safe for now. We can stay in Octavia Falls. We have to go tell everyone. Nadine started down the stairs. Nate, wait, I said as I followed her. Tell me you got your kidney. She stopped on the lower landing. I didn't have a choice. I could pardon everyone or I could get the transplant. Those were my options. This is bullshit, I growled. What part? The part where the priestesses started a war or the part where they forced me to hand over the alchemy wand? All of it is bullshit, I cried. They can't hold your kidney hostage like this. They can, and they are, Nadine pointed out. She shook her head like she didn't know what to make out of any of it. The prophecy about us is bigger than Nightshade and the Waning. We were careless, and that's why Amy died. We need to find the rest of the Oaken Wands before the Imperium does, or they'll make this worse. Nadine looked totally defeated. I wrapped her in my arms and she sagged against me. She was wiped and I lowered her to the ground. Nadine leaned her head back against the wall. We'll do everything we can, I told her firmly. There's no other option. We will fulfill this prophecy and bring an end to the witch trials. But first we have to get your kidney. Lucas. Nadine tried to stop me, but I already whirled around and started back up the stairs. I didn't think she had the energy to come after me. My hands curled into fists as I marched up the stairs. I had every intention of giving the priestesses a piece of my mind. They would convince the doctors to go through with this transplant. Nadine would get her kidney. 
but the second I reached the landing, my heart stopped. Angry conversation drifted through the door, which had been left open a crack. Nadine is out of control, I heard Priestess Margaret say. We must take drastic measures before she breaks this coven apart. We need help from the other side. It's our last resort. I crouched down and peeked through the crack. My heart hammered as I spied on the council. The three priestesses sat around the table, their hands joined in the center. Where do we find the next oaken wand? Lillian asked, but it didn't sound like she was asking the other priestesses. She spoke like she was asking someone I couldn't see. Their hands moved in unison over the tabletop, and it was only then that I saw the planchette beneath their fingers. My breath caught when I realized what was happening. A Ouija board. Priestess Charlotte read the words slowly as the planchette moved over the board. Let me show you. The moment she finished, the atmosphere shifted. Hair stood on my arm and my pulse quickened. Air whooshed through the council headquarters, sending papers flying and the priestess's hair billowing around their faces. An ominous red glow filled the room, and the entire area darkened. My blood turned to ice when I witnessed a portal appear. The black depths of the abyss shimmered through the spatial anomaly. I couldn't move, couldn't even breathe, as I witnessed a figure step through the portal. He had the body of a man, but the face of a ram with long, curved horns growing out of his head. Where his eyes should have been were nothing but empty sockets dripping with blood. Sharp claws grew from his fingertips. My entire form trembled as I took in his cruel, haunting figure. A terrifying, disembodied voice spoke. Let's make a deal. Air blasted across the room as the portal closed. The door slammed shut and I stumbled backward in horror. I didn't have time to process what I'd just seen. I had to get out of here before the priestesses found me sitting in the hallway, trembling. I scrambled to my feet and sprinted down the stairway. Nadine and I had to get the fuck out of here. The priestesses had gone further than I ever thought possible. They'd summoned a demon, and there was no going back now. If they were willing to resort to such deep, dark measures to find the Oaken Wands, then we were totally screwed. It wasn't just our lives on the line anymore. Nothing was safe. Not even our souls. This story will continue in The Demon Spell, College of Witchcraft, Book 4. A note from the author. This book contains characters with the following medical conditions. The information included is meant to educate readers on disabilities featured within the College of Witchcraft series. Rheumatoid arthritis, or RA, occurs when the immune system mistakenly attacks the body's own healthy tissue. RA commonly affects the joints, causing painful swelling, stiff joints, and fatigue, among other symptoms. RA can occur at any age. Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is a condition that causes chronic inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract. Symptoms may include fatigue, abdominal pain, severe diarrhea, and malnutrition. Symptom severity varies by patient. The College of Witchcraft series is part of the Hidden Legends universe a paranormal fantasy world created by authors Megan Linsky and Alicia Radiz. Included in this universe are the following series. The Academy of Magical Creatures series, the University of Sorcery series, and the Prison for Supernatural Offenders series, with more to come. Each Hidden Legends novel features magical romances with disabled characters fighting for a better world. You can find out more about the Hidden Legends universe by going to www.hiddenlegendsbooks.com. This has been The Cauldron's Curse. 
Hidden Legends, College of Witchcraft, Book 3 Written by Alicia Radiz Narrated by Logan Young and Jonathan M. Matthews Copyright 2021 by Alicia Radiz Production Copyright 2022 by Alicia Radiz